Good morning, everyone. My name is Jenna Harper, and I'm the manager of the Appalachia Culinary. I would like to welcome you to the 2022 Appalachia Culinary Research Symposium. Thank you for joining us today. We are very excited to have over 20 talks over the next day and a half, highlighting research in and around the Appalachia River Bay system. But first, I would like to say a big thank you to all of the staff that have organized and who are continuing to produce this event today. It's been a long time coming. <laughs> I also want to thank the presenters that we have from here at the reserve and the uh, folks that are hosting as well. I'd also like to say a big thank you to the speakers that you'll hear from over the next day and a half. And thank you all, the attendees, for joining us today and tomorrow. Since we have a packed agenda, let me go through a few housekeeping items uh, to keep us flowing smoothly. Kennedy, if you want to go to the next slide for me, please. We will be recording this symposium and afterwards it will be available on the ApalachiaColaReserve.com website. If you did not receive the agenda, it can be found over on the right side of your screen under the handouts panel. And let me go through if you have a question during um, our symposium. Um, after each presentation, we'll have five minutes for questions. Uh, there are two ways to ask a question. Either you can point um, to the raise hand function over on the right side of the screen, or under the questions panel, you can type in your question and we will do our best to get to it. If we do run out of time and we don't get to your question, you can also visit our Padlet. And the link to the Padlet is on the agenda, and I believe it's also under the handouts uh, panel. On the Padlet, you'll see there that we have blocks for each of the presentations, and you are welcome to add comments and questions, um, and feel free to connect to our speakers today. Uh, this is one of the most important outcomes of this sort of uh, activity, is connecting with other researchers. So with that, I will start us off. Our very first speaker will be Jason Garwood, our research coordinator here at the Research Reserve. And Jason will be speaking on the utility of nurse swamp data, leveraging long-term observational data to investigate changes in metabolism in Apalachicola Bay. So Jay, if you're ready, I'll let you take it away. I think I am. Jenna, can you hear me okay? I can. Thank you. And uh, yeah, I'd just like to extend um, gratitude to everybody for, for you know, visiting us today, the next couple of days. And again, a oh, big thanks to you know, our staff who have made this possible. Um, so <clears throat> I'm going to start off by talking about uh, some of our um, swamp data that we have that has some really cool results. Um, so one of the reserves resources um, that are in great demand is our system-wide monitoring program or our swamp data, um, which can provide innovative tools to make assessments of ecosystem health. Um, and our staff have been using these data to investigate net ecosystem metabolism, or what we call NEM, which uses dissolved oxygen time series data as a proxy for estimating CO2 concentration. And so for the purpose of this talk, we're gonna be presenting some results of a nearly two decade long analysis of estuarine metabolism in Methylechicola Bay. And then we're gonna discuss some background on how these tools have been developed, why we feel these assessments are important and relevant, and then um, we're going to conclude with some new work um, that we're conducting collaboratively with some visiting researchers that might help to fill gaps that our long-term data sets might not be able to provide.
and I'm not, it's not forwarding. Here it goes. I'm not seeing slides. There we go. Okay, I guess it's just really slow. All right, so we're going to start by building from past work. Um, so, you know, in 2002, um, Chan and Lewis uh, looked at primary production or primary and secondary production in the Bay, uh, you know, using stable isotopes. And one of the conclusions that they made was that secondary production in the Bay was dependent more upon uh, within estuary primary production than a secondary tidal food web that is supported by alluvial primary production. Um, they were the first to suggest this metabolic shift from benthic to water column product, um, trophic structure. Then in 2004, Caffey and others used NERS data to investigate the factors affecting metabolism at our sites. And she identified a wide variety of metabolisms uh, based upon both space and time with season and geographic region driving much of that variability. And in this study, temperature was found to be the most um, important factor driving metabolism at a site. And then in 2014, Caffrey and others focused on the golf nerves uh, for a deeper investigation of the effect of temperature on metabolism. And uh, like Chan and Lewis, they conduct, concluded that seasonal variability and metabolic rates were indicative of a switch in metabolism from benthic to water column phytoplankton production. And in 2016, um, Beck collaborated with the NERS to automate the mathematical computation um, of our swamp data sets using our programming, which um, produced this product called Swamp R, um, which brought together an adaptable tool to assess metabolism at our sites. And this allowed the NERS to um, be able to effectively calculate any end. And, uh, these, these aren't moving forward, but I'll just keep going. Um, in 2018, Bowman and Smith used Swamp data to quantify metabolically driven pH and oxygen fluctuations. Um, they concluded that all sites pH positively covaried with fluctuations in oxygen and that these fluctuations were a function of the variance in metabolic activity within these systems. And then finally, in 2018, um, Joshi and others estimated surface PCO2 to CO2 fluxes using ocean color data and pH data, and their study highlighted the need for obtaining accurate CO2 fluxes. And if I could get some help getting to the next slide, that would be great. Cool. So today we're going to present two research questions and one action that we're taking in response to those questions. So first of all is, what are the long-term metabolic trends in ecological obey? So using our system or system-wide monitoring data, we're going to develop an updated NEM model that's going to provide a graphical interpretation of the changes in NEM over the past 18 years, and then we'll relate the results of the model to other response variables, in this case, water quality. And then next one, please. And then secondly, we're going to um, look into what are the potential and future implications of these trends. So why we postulate that more work is needed and why we should care. And to address these questions, we're going to relate the implications of these trends to Apalachicola Bay biology. More specifically, how could this be relevant to organisms like an oyster? And then for the third question or actually response, we are going to look at current and future reserve work to address questions surrounding these trends. So this is where I'm going to introduce Project MAGIC, or Metabolism and Gas Exchange in Coastal Systems, um, which is a project that kicked off in fall of 2021 that's, that will attempt to evaluate and improve methods using dissolved oxygen time series data to quantify ecosystem metabolism. And then from there, we're going to take it a step further by investigating the carbonate system, air, water, carbon flux, and bay acidification. And then finally, we're going to conclude um, by touching on an upcoming um, oyster experiment that we plan to investigate the potential effects of acidification on bay oysters. The next slide, please. First, we're going to start by talking about the, just a basic description of what NEM is. Um, so we're adapting our method using what's called Odom's open water method. 
to calculate NEM, which is essentially just a mass balance equation that's defined by the difference between gross primi primary production and ecosystem respiration. So essentially what this means is if primary production is greater than respiration, you're autotrophic, you're accumulating organic matter, and CO2 is being dissolved in the water. Uh, on the other hand, if production is less than respiration, you're now heterotrophic, depleting organic matter, and CO2 is being released to the atmosphere. And just for reference, most systems tend to be net heterotrophic. Next slide, please. So this slide is to show the mathematical computation of calculating metabolism and which swamp variables that are used. These variables are entered into R code specific to a nurse site and then ran for a specific specified length of time. In this case, we ran code for dry bar um, from 2002 to 2020 and swamp R will output those in an NEM units of millimoles per meter squared per day. Next slide, please. So this slide shows our results using the R tool to calculate our NEM data at uh, dry bar. So the top left graph shows monthly NEM at dry bar over the 18 period and data indicate that Apalachicola, at least at this site, is in fact net heterotrophic with the exception of the winter months, um, January and December, when the system has a tendency to be net autotrophic. And what this suggests to us is that for most of the year, potentially CO2 is being exported from the water to the atmosphere. Then the top right graph shows change in NEM by year. And these results indicate that each year was net heterotrophic. However, there was a curvilinear increase in the level of heterotrophy over that time period. So over time, there was a tendency for more CO2 to be expelled to the atmosphere. We provided the bottom graphs to show, number one, first of all, that uh, the results in metabolism values that are calculated are driven by the variability in oxygen, and also that the dissolved oxygen at dry bar site has exhibited a curvilinear decrease from about 96% to below 92% over the 18-year period. And also that these results kind of lead us to question what could be the potential cause of this change in metabolic rate over time. Next slide, please. Hey, Jay, I've reset your keyboard and mouse controls. It's gonna work for you now. Okay. I'm, I'm, I can write in the go-to webinar window. I'm hitting the space bar, but it's not advancing. There it goes. Oh, cool. Okay, thanks, Kenan. Oh. Back in the All right. Thanks, Kennedy. Um, so we stated earlier that Caffrey and others identified temperature as an important seasonal and geographic driver of NEM at these sites. When we examine water temperature over the 18 period on the left, we see that there was a general cooling up to about 2008, after which then the water steadily warmed up through 2020 with an average change in temperature of about 0.6 degrees. In addition, when you look at the relationship between temperature and oxygen at dry bar on the top right, you get this curvilinear relationship, which shows that once you warm the water body up to about 22 and a half degrees, the oxygen concentration decreases with increasing temperature. And then on the bottom right graph, uh, recalling Bowman and Smith 2018, there is in fact a curvilinear increase in pH as you increase the oxygen concentration at the site. So the relationships that we've described lead us to investigate what's happened to pH. If you look at our mean yearly pH data from dry bar, um, it indicates a decrease in pH over the period. So we ask, you know, is this decrease a result of a decrease in oxygen relative to an increase in the partial pressure of CO2 over that time period? And furthermore, was it a result of an increase in temperature? Um, noting, we, we recognize that on the other hand, it could be fresh water that could cause this shift as well as pH can go down relative to oxygen and CO2 ratio if there's a net increase in calcification in the system. But this again leads us to, you know, why should we care? Um, you know, if this is occurring at the system level, there's potential implications to biology. Um, and probably the most obvious implication would be organisms who have calcium carbonate shells. So for example, the Eastern oyster, which has been the focus of issues surrounding the bay for some time. But to investigate this, we need to do measurements of CO2 dissolved in our inorganic carbon alkaline and pH. So 
So Inner staff have been working with uh, the co-authors on this work uh, on an NSF funded grant called Magic or Metabolism and Gas Exchange in Coastal Systems. This project aims to evaluate and improve methods using DO time series data quantify to quantify ecosystem metabolism. The effort entails direct measurement of metabolism values, so again, carbon dioxide, dissolved inorganic carbon, total alkalinity, and as well as air to water gas flux. And in fall of 2021, we deployed a month-long experiment at Dry Bar, deploying PCO2 sensors, pH sensors, YSIs, underwater power sensors, and a current velocity profiler. These were deployed in a large triangular format um, in which we were able to use to calculate air to water gas flux. And the results of these experiments will be forthcoming as we get the data analyzed. So synthesizing long-term rec um, rec records of NEM really only represents part of the story because NEM, NEM only includes the aerobic respiration that we estimate using our oxygen data. So one way to address potential systemic effects and changes of NEM is in, to include the carbonate system. And this enables us to understand the influence of ocean or bay acidification on an ecosystem. So in other words, we can calculate net ecosystem productivity and net ecosystem calcification. But first, I was going to do a review of what we've done thus far. So we started off by doing the 1D or slacking water method, which essentially takes measurements during a period when a system can be treated as plug flow. And we did that using the Swamp R package that we showed you just a little bit ago. Next to that are the control volume experiments, which brings us to Project Magic, which these data will help us improve the 1D model that we showed you earlier, and those results are forthcoming. Which leads us to our next steps, which is using alkalinity anomaly and oxygen methods to measure net ecosystem production and net ecosystem calcification. To do this, we're going to use the boundary layer gradient methods and couple that with some enclosure experiments that we'll use to do confined mass balance experiments using oysters and mesocosm. So just an example to show everyone, um, we took swamp data from dry bar during May 2018 and looked at daily hour alkalinity, pH, oxygen, and calcification or dissolution. The data suggests that each day by about 7 a.m., respiration had consumed up all the oxygen, releasing organic carbon. In the same time frame, the net change in pH was essentially zero. We ended up back to where we were. So, and this is the raw result of drawdown of oxygen, meaning that alkalinity the system would have had to increase. So an increase in alkalinity is a decrease in calcification, and a decrease in calcification is dissolution. So for each day in the month of May 2018, there was a net loss of calcium carbonate of about four grams per meter squared per day. So if in fact dissolution is occurring, uh, then how would it affect shell production? So one of the ways that we intend to do this is to use these enclosures shown here to estimate respiration and calcification rates using auto samplers to collect water for discrete dissolved inorganic carbon and alkalinity measurements. These will be conducted both here in Apalachicola Bay and as well as the Hudson River Estuary. And we'll be presenting those results once those experiments have been completed as well. So just to wrap it up, um, at present, the results we've shown provide just one more example of the great power and importance of our long-term monitoring data sets and the need for more investigation into NEM. And we've shown that at dry bar site is net heterotrophic and that has become increasingly more so over time. And in that same time frame, <clears throat> we have seen a net increase in temperature of about 0.6 degrees. And that increase in temperature and resultant increase in CO2 could have potentially led to an increased acidification at the site. And these results highlight the potential effects of climate change on bay biology, more specifically related to the effects of calcium carbonate dissolution. Moving forward, we will be conducting more of the control volume experiments, the boundary layer experiments, as well as enclosure experiments to investigate the effects on bay biology. And we'll also expand our investigation to take a more system-wide approach. And I just wanted to close um, on this and suggest, you know, that 
it, even myself, it's, I always have to remind myself that it's not always just about river flow. You know, we have to, it's important to remember there's potentially other threats to our system that we should probably give equal attention to. Um, and with that, I'm going to conclude and be happy to take any questions. Thanks. Thank you so much, Jay. And I, I do, I want to give you an extra thank you. Uh, Jay graciously swapped positions with another speaker uh, two days ago. So I appreciate you kicking off the symposium. And um, I think that your work is going to um, really dovetail nicely with some of the presentations later on. So hopefully people will stick around and, and, um, and see that story. Um, I see not a question, but uh, Kim Cressman, who is the research coordinator over at Grand Bay NER, um, said uh, just uh, cheering on Swamp and thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Kim. Let's see. Anita, do you see any questions for Jay? No questions, just another um, uh, allocating fascinating from Rick Carter. Thanks. All right. Well, if there are no other no other questions or comments for Jay, we'll we'll let him sneak away. But uh, We've please got one feel hand free. Raised. We've got one hand All right. Right out. I'll go ahead and unmute him. Hey, Josh. Unmute yourself and ask a question now. Okay, I am on mute now. Hey, Janet, Jay, that was that was fantastic. Um, a lot of really interesting things. I think we're gonna have a lot of conversations moving forward. Um, I guess, I mean, there, yeah, I'm trying to think about how to articulate a specific question, but I guess it, it the, the base takeaway I'm I'm getting is that it's becoming more heterotrophic over time. And what any any ideas what is driving increased heterotrophy? Like what kind of organisms are participating in that? In other words, we're looking at it from the question of the decrease of the oyster population, sort of at the base of all of that. So what what could be driving an increase in heterotrophy? You know, that's a good question, Josh. And you know, I think um, I, I I think there's I think we suggest that you know this this warming. You know, I think there's two things going on. There's potentially that river flow thing that we have going on where that, you know, and, and I think Jeff Chanton is going to do a talk later today about that, um, looking at, you know, the sources of those, those trophic structures. Um, but, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure, like, you know, is this just the fact that the bay is getting warmer and then, you know, that, you know, being that it's mass balance, that there's going to be more CO2, you know, being let off. No, I'm not, I think we need to kind of, this is the framework to really start looking into exactly what, what is doing this? Did that answer your question? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I'm with you. There's there's a lot of unknowns, and I'm I'm definitely looking forward to seeing the talks, including Jeff's later today. Um, yeah. And, and yeah, I'd I'd love to talk more about magic because I I think there's maybe some relevance to some of the potentially some of the marsh and, and well just the wetland uh, DIC exports as well. Yeah, yeah, and I do I do worry that you know if this warming trend is you know going to continue if, if it really is you know a warming trend that it's going to affect metabolism and it looks like it potentially could affect it by resulting in more co2 so thank you very much thank you all right any more questions i'm trying uh Not seeing any more. I'm seeing some comments. So great comments, you guys. Thanks for interacting with, with everybody. Uh, let's go ahead and move on to our next speaker, uh, Dr. Matthias Kondoff from the University of California, Berkeley. Thank you so much for getting up early to join us this morning. Very exciting. Today, he's going to be speaking about restoring lateral connectivity in the Apalachicola River floodplain an adaptive management approach. So Dr. Kondoff, if you're there and ready to go, I'll let you take it away. Yep, um, thanks Jennifer and uh, Jason, thanks for the great uh, presentation. Um, okay, so you guys have it up already. 
that's uh, that's you sharing, not me. Okay, good. Um, so our topic today is restoring lateral connectivity in the Apalachicola River floodplain. And we're talking specifically about restoring the connection between the extensive slough network and the main stem channel. And um, am I able to advance these slides? Yes, okay, that worked, good. So uh, um, I'd like to, uh, well, first acknowledge that this is a project of the Apalachicola Riverkeeper funded by National Fish and Wildlife Federation um, Foundation. And um, we have a, a strong team of collaborators from various institutions, a lot of work being done from University of Florida in Milton. And um, um, I'm with the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, we have uh, uh, participants coming from uh, uh, various corners to, uh, to focus on this amazing river system. Uh, here is the project team, um, which uh, includes uh, Michael Gangloff, who will be speaking after me about uh, mussels. So first, uh, recognizing that in many ways, the Apalachicola is a classic meandering floodplain river. We can see many of the features and the patterns that uh, we see in, in other uh, relatively undisturbed floodplain river systems. But when you look closely, you see that the Apalachicola has enlarged sandbars. Uh, these are sort of sandbars on steroids, relic from navigational dredging in the last half of the 20th century, in which, during which time the Army Corps of Engineers was dumping this dredged sand on the sandbars. Our concern is really with the riparian trees in the Apalachicola River floodplain, uh, especially the swamp trees, Tupelo and Cypress, that depend on moisture at the right times of the year to reproduce and, and, to, and to thrive. Um, and really, we're looking to reconnect some of these lower elevation parts of the floodplain at uh, relatively drier parts of the hydrograph which have been affected by reduced flows from upstream, and as I'll show in a moment, uh, by deposition of sand within these uh, within these sloughs. But really, just as a overall uh, perspective on the system, we have this uh, system of sloughs and 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 floodplain that naturally are closely connected hydrologically and ecologically with the main stem. Uh, there's a rich interchange between the sloughs and, and the main channel of the river. And this results in this exceptionally diverse, uh, ecologically rich system. And those high water levels, especially in spring and early summer, are, are important to the, uh, uh, to the functioning and the productivity of the system. We can look at this river connectivity in three dimensions, and we'll return to this sort of framework. Uh, there is longitudinal connectivity up and downstream, lateral connectivity between the channel and the floodplain and the floodplain water bodies, such as these sloughs, and high groundwater levels. And this um, relates both to lateral and vertical connectivity, and even some longitudinal, as, as I'll show you um, a little bit later. Now, people tend to think about <clears throat> rivers as just the river channel without uh, realizing that the floodplain is an integral part of the river system as well. And floodplain water bodies, such as sloughs, are extremely important in the physical and, and biological functioning of these systems. This is a map showing the floodplain of the main stem of the Apalachicola and the main stem river only, but look how different it is when we add in the sloughs. And in fact, the sloughs are much more extensive than the main channel itself. We have about 100 miles of main river from uh, Woodruff Dam down to the Gulf, 
but there are over 300 miles of connected sloughs through this floodplain. Looking in more detail at one reach of the river, you can see the uh, extensive network of sloughs and the floodplain forests are supported by surface water spreading across the floodplain during, during high flows and then also flowing through the sloughs to reach more distant parts of the floodplain. The Apalachicola River floodplain is characterized by what Pellin Light has called loop streams, which uh, flow away from the river and then connect with some other sloughs and eventually the flows return to the main river. Um, these, the functioning of these loop streams can be quite complicated, uh, especially at different water levels in the main stem, you may have uh, flow reversals. So the water is flowing up one slough and down another at one, at one water level, and then as the water level shifts, you may have a complete reversal of the process. It can be quite, quite complicated. But these sloughs themselves are highly productive habitats for juvenile fish and so on. And, and the, many of the locals have, have uh, successfully fished and crabbed and whatnot in these sloughs. They've been, they've been tremendously productive over the years. Um, now, a lot of this changed when we had the effects of a failed navigation project undertaken by the US Army Corps of Engineers, of course, at the, at the uh, behest of Congress. This was the uh, uh, navigation project to, to turn the Apalachicola River into a navigation channel with a nine foot deep channel. Now, um, this was <clears throat> cutting a nine foot deep channel in loose sand, which um, I think we could have hired my uh, eight year old to um, provide some expertise. If you try to dig a nine foot deep channel in loose sand, what's gonna happen? Uh, of course it collapsed and um, you had uh, extensive channel instability. And all this resulted in a lot of sand being uh, uh, disturbed and suspended in the water column. As the um, Corps was desperately dredging to try to maintain this unrealistic goal of the nine foot channel, uh, they had a lot of uh, disposal to do. And so they were initially disposing up on the floodplain, Later, that was shifted to the, the point bars and, and the, uh, the margins of the channel. But you can still see very clearly some of the relic deposits from this, uh, from this era. Now, another big impact to the slough system and its connection to the river has been the reduced flows in the river itself. Uh, that coupled with the changes in the channel that were uh, in, induced by all this disturbance from the dredging have resulted in reduced water levels in the main stem Apalachicola. And these in turn have resulted in a drying out of the floodplain and disconnecting of the sloughs in part simply because the level of the water in the river is lower for a given flow uh, so that the, the water is less likely to be high enough to reach up into the slough network. Uh, and we have less water coming down at some critical times of the year. Um, these have all led to a decrease in the number of swamp trees. But there is another important factor, and that is with all this sand that has been, that was put into circulation during this time, that was through this disturbance, you had sand in suspension elsewhere. So when you did get water flowing into the sloughs, the water was charged with sediment charged with sand and this sand was depositing in many of these slough channels and we can see now that these sand plugs are blocking the connection of the river with the sloughs at low flows in other words if the sand plug were not there we can see that the water from the river would be able to enter the slough but it's blocked by these sand plugs now and this is really what we're trying to target with, uh, with our project is to be able to improve this situation, to reconnect some of these sloughs at lower flows. Our project is looking at three sites, Douglas Slough and Spiders Cut, um, near where the uh, Chipola River rejoins the Apalachicola.
and also East River, which is down in the Delta. So East River is one of the principal distributaries of the lower Apalachicola River. And uh, the, that project uh, we anticipate will increase uh, the delivery of fresh water to East Bay, which uh, we have evidence that that should uh, have a beneficial effect on the productivity uh, there. I'm not gonna talk about the East River project today because it's quite a different beast from the other two. And uh, uh, anyway, we're, we have to focus on something. So that's, that's what we're gonna do. And looking more closely here, here's the main stem Apalachicola. And this is the Chipola River coming back in and rejoining the Apalachicola here. Douglas Slough connects the main stem Apalachicola with the Chipola here and Spider's Cut cuts off from the Chipola and flows down parallel to the main stem Apalachicola through this very, um, uh, very uh, uh, productive floodplain forest. It's a, it brings water to the Brothers River system. And again, the Brothers River is supporting this uh, Tupelo Cypress forest that we have and low bottom land forest through this uh, very important part of the of the river. So, um, of course, we have the the flow of the of the river in in this direction, the Chipola flowing like this, joining the Apalachicola. Uh, but these arrows are showing the kinds of circulations that are permitted and enabled by the slough system. So you have this connection from the Apalachicola through Douglas Slough to the Chipola, and very important, the, uh, the, there, there are actually several um, inlets to the spider's cut uh, off of the Chipola, which are all bringing water down into this floodplain. Now, one of the complications that we had is that Hurricane Michael caused extensive tree blowdown in the sloughs. And uh, so this has added a, a, a complicating element to what we can do. In the Douglas Slough system, uh, looking at what we're doing there in the upstream end, um, we will be this fall, we hope to uh, be removing some sand deposits that are the plugs. Um, and throughout the rest of the slough, we have been selectively removing some of the recently downed trees because they are blocking some of the circulation as well. And uh, here are some images from that work that has, uh, has already begun. And the spider's cut slough system, um, uh, more complicated. Uh, we'll look here. Um, here's the here's spider's cut leading to this extensive floodplain forest uh, downstream and then ultimately connecting with the Brothers River. So um, we'll look at a couple of sites. This is uh, the inlet to spider's cut here. And this is a point about a mile into the floodplain and spider's cut where we can look more closely. This is this plug at the uh, upstream end, the, the, the inlet to the spider's cut system. And again, this will be removed. Uh, all this topography here, this very detailed topography, you see we, we, we uh, surveyed in the field. And then this site that's about a mile in, you can get a sense here in this photo of the, the, the the degree of sedimentation that's occurred, and um, the it's it's an it's an and it's an impressive job <laughs> to do to remove this enough of the sand to restore circulation. Well, everyone immediately asks, where does the sand come from? We've connect, collected and analyzed 23 sediment cores uh, just from spiders, and all the cores were almost pure sand in contrast to the composition of the natural floodplain sediments, which are much finer grained. So this is a very distinctive um, uh, sedimentology that we're looking at. And it appears to be coming from the navigational dredging and the disturbance and the, and the suspension of sand during that period of time. So it's a very discrete event from the dredging. We will remove this sand with small suction dredges, and then uh, we need to move the sand to a disposal site by barging and trucking or a slurry pipeline. And uh, here we have um, spiders cut here. This is the area that we will be uh, uh, reopening. And then uh, either we will barge the sand 
um, by the river and then truck it over here. Uh, the destination is a old sand pit that Florida Wildlife Commission now has. Uh, so uh, it's available and it's uh, actually, it's a perfect disposal site. The other option that we're still exploring is a, uh, a, a floating pipeline that would cut through the <clears throat> cut through the forest and deliver the sand to this disposal site. We feel this is a, a good moment to uh, attempt this kind of restoration. It's been over 20 years since the end of the dredging. Bed elevations in the river have stabilized or recovered, and the channel has begun to narrow. Uh, we have uh, good evidence from work by John Mossa that the uh, area of open sandbar has decreased about 16% over this 10 year period of 2015. And we know there's less loose sand mobilized and transported in floods. So with less sand in suspension, we are less likely to have redeposition in these sloughs once we open them up. And prior research has demonstrated that as river stage drops and as sloughs become disconnected from the main stem, the dissolved oxygen goes down and other water quality parameters take a dive. So anticipating this, we're monitoring water levels and water quality as well as aquatic ecology. And uh, you'll get a bit more about this from Michael in uh, the subsequent talk. So really we have uh, a unique opportunity on the Apalachicola with the extraordinary extent of protected floodplain. Uh, over 80% of the floodplain is in conservation, either owned outright by uh, state, federal agencies or NGOs or in conservation easement. And this gives the Apalachicola a unique potential for ecological restoration. In other words, there are many river systems where we could uh, propose to open up a slough and it wouldn't really matter because you have, uh, you have uh, uh, urbanization that's taken over the floodplain or it's been converted to agri intensive agriculture or something like that. Here we have this really remarkable situation that the state has proactively set aside so much of the land and is the federal government as well through uh, uh, other sites. So really we, Ultimately, we need some um, hydrologic restoration as well, uh, further stabilization of the dredge spoil deposits probably, uh, but certainly opening up of the sloughs is something that we can um, initiate now and start on the restoration. We're looking at uh, other slough systems as potential candidates, applying whatever lessons we can learn from Spider's Cut and Douglas, uh, looking uh, at other sites, especially um, um, upstream and just downstream. We have a set of criteria, uh, initial criteria that we're using for this. And, and mostly it's where can we get the most bang for our buck when we do this? And also trying to be realistic about the volumes that need to be removed to reconnect some of these sloughs and some of the practicalities about uh, getting in there, doing the work and, and getting the sand out to a disposal site well, you, so there's landowner issues, uh, you know, all, all kinds of logistical questions that come up. Um, but certainly one of the, the places that we are looking at to try to improve the circulation is the Shepherd Slough and Kennedy Creek system. Um, this system brings water to the eastern side of the floodplain and, and, uh, and very important, it's bringing water to some, some of the Tupelo cypress forest, which is shown here in blue. So here you have the water coming off of the main stem into the Kennedy Creek system uh, and uh, uh, the well, Shepherd Slough and Kennedy Creek system and uh, rewatering this uh, cypress Tupelo forest. So this is uh, one of the areas that we have identified as very strong potential for uh, uh, applying these same techniques if, if they uh, proved to be successful in uh, in Douglas and Spiders. So in conclusion, um, stepping back, uh, first we can take some solace in that we have finally turned a corner in the Apalachicola, that we're now starting some restoration. Uh, for so long, uh, we were fighting the core and the dredging and the threat of re restore, re re uh, resuming the dredging. Uh, there have been, of course, many battles with the Apalachicola, but 
But now, thanks to the extent of the preserved floodplain, we have this unique opportunity to restore natural river process, connecting this extensive slough network back with its, uh, with its river. Our project seeks to reconnect these sloughs with the main stem at the lower end of the flow spectrum, where the disruption has been most obvious, and then to closely monitor the resulting effects so that we can uh, apply these same approaches elsewhere if, uh, if indicated by our results. Thanks for your attention. Thank you so much. Do we have any uh, questions for Dr. Kondoff? I'm not seeing any in the questions box. I'm looking for raised hands. As you were going along, I, I was curious about what's next. And so thank you so much for giving us highlights on, on um, you know, looking forward. You know, once, once we are able to show and understand um, how the restoration uh, will improve flow, um, you know, how do, we, how do we start to look ahead of what, what other areas could um, benefit from reconnectivity? Uh, looks like there's a question from Ethan. Yeah. Oh, we also have a question from Matt. Oh, Matt, you want to go ahead? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, yeah, so, my, so my question is, um, I guess, how much material are you actually uh, planning to remove to open up these channels and has has there been thought given to about reusing this material elsewhere? Uh, obviously, you have the sand pit um, for disposal for this particular, but in the future, that sand material could be very valuable uh, for other types of restoration projects closer to the coast. Yeah, I think uh, all those uh, possibilities are are open, and um, uh, in this case. Since we had this uh, old sand put owned by FWC it, uh, pretty close by, it was an obvious place to uh, to dispose of the sand um, and uh, and you'd be able to proceed with our project. Um, th there are a lot of issues that that come up with um, with where the sand would go and what it would be used for if it if it was to be reused. But uh, but I think those those are all. Uh, you know, wide open questions for future future projects. And certainly there will be future projects that will be closer, for example, to a landing that from which you could um, truck it and, and use it for, for other other purposes. And of course that, that the sand could be uh, reused here as well. Um, but that, that kind of adds another layer of complication. And uh, we're trying to trying to keep it Keep it simple, stupid, and just you know get this, <laughs> make some progress on, on 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 this project. And then Ethan has a question: Has there been any work uh, about reconnecting Double Point and Battle Bend? Yeah, um, we haven't uh, uh, delved into that. On, on this project, but uh, um, in a report I did for uh, uh, American Rivers, I don't know, 10, 10 15 years ago, uh, we did look into that more. And um, I think it, uh, uh, double point, I think is uh, probably a harder one to try to reconnect. Uh, Battle Bend would be uh, probably more in the feasible range, but but even there, the impacts of trying to go in and reconnect that uh, uh, old meander bend would be uh, just massive, and uh, probably it's probably a safer bet to uh, take the the sloughs that exist and and try to reconnect them. Also, the you know battle bend was it was the main stem river, of course, and um, so it's uh, kind of construction and uh, and and um, 
all the complications that would entail to to reconnect that meander bend at battle bend uh, would were much more intrusive than simply trying to um, remove sand deposits to to better reconnect existing sloughs. I, you know, the, the project we're doing, I think of as sort of as trying to undo some hardening of the arteries in the system and improve the circulation that way. Um, doing a battle bend project would be, you know, like a, you know, a bypass surgery, or whatever, as opposed to some less intrusive uh, uh, kind of approaches. But it's a, but it's a really good question um, how, uh, how we look at some of these meander cutoffs that were done uh, as part of the dredging project and uh, what, what, what potential there is to reconnect those. Well, thank you so much. Uh, we need we do need to transition to uh, Dr. Gangloff and and um, let him continue the story. So um, appreciate your time this morning, and um, we'll move on to uh, Dr. Gangloff, who is with the Appalach Appalachian State University. Uh, he's going to be talking about pre-restoration assessment of mussel and fish assemblages in five sloughs in the lower Apalachicola River Basin. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Excellent timing. He was just able to join us a moment ago. <laughs> I don't know if I'd call it excellent, but I apologize for uh, <laughs> any... Uh, um, um, heartburn there. You're right on time. I'm going to go ahead and give you a keyboard and you'll be able to control this presentation at your pace. Starting now. Okay. Great. So, um, yeah, so this um, this talk basically covering uh, what we've what we've learned so far about um, some of the um, floodplain systems that that Matt was um, presumably just talking about, um, and uh, kind of what we think we may uh, expect to see following uh, following restoration. So let's see. Um, All right, so um, so legacy sediments in uh, the Chipola Apalachicola ecosystem are, you know, one of the one of the more challenging um, issues to to manage, um, you know, the, as a result of historical dredging and dredge disposal patterns. We've got um, pretty extensive areas of of um, impact to the the main stem uh channel uh you know i've, I've dove a lot of the main stem apalachicola and chipola rivers and there's there's um, a lot of areas of, of just unstable sands that are basically a result of of legacy uh sediments and dredging and then and of course in the in the floodplains you know this this material tends to uh, be deposited there by by floods or other uh, processes, and so that you know it creates a challenge to uh, river restoration and systems like this, where you know we're looking at how do you how do you improve habitat conditions in in the main stem and floodplain. Um, it seems like one of the, the the primary ways to do that is to kind of get a handle on legacy sediments and and manage those. Um, all right, sorry, I think that's a glitch. And so what we see in, um, I guess there was supposed to be another picture there, but I apologize. Uh, what we see in some of these, uh, some of these channels, uh, this is Swift Slough photographed in August of 2020 are these large accumulations of, of sand, uh, sometimes near the mouth of the slough, but oftentimes pushed quite a considerable distance up into the slough and that really restricts Water flow, water flow through the systems, and has uh, uh, at least what we're we're seeing a pretty dramatic effect on the uh, biological communities in these systems. So, um, again, as I think Matt talked about, the primary goals of the project that that we are working on 
um, with uh, Riverkeeper and and um, Florida FWC and, and many many other partners is to try to um, see if it's possible to increase hydrologic connectivity with the floodplain by doing some restoration in these sloughs with the goals of, of uh, improving freshwater flows to uh, the eastern part of Apalachicola Bay. Um, perhaps some of these um, increased flows are capable of helping to offset at least temporarily sea level rise and saltwater intrusion issues. Uh, we're, we're hoping that this will improve uh, the um, structure of the um, forest community as well as uh, increase production and diversity of, of fish and, and invertebrates. And for invertebrates, we're primarily talking about freshwater mussels here, and that's, you know, they're, they're a major part of the uh, ecosystem, um, and that's where my area of expertise uh, comes in primarily. Um, and then there are some secondary goals, including, you know, helping to mitigate some of the hurricane impacts and uh, improve navigability of the sloughs uh, as they are uh, important waterways for, for um, many of the um, folks in the local communities. Um, so the study sites that we'll, I'll be talking about today include um, Swift Slough, which is our kind of our reference system. It's not going to be restored. It's located near Weewahitchka. Douglas Slough, which connects the Chipola and the Apalachicola. Uh, spider Slough and Little Spiders, which are uh, connected. We're mostly interested in um, Spider Slough, uh, but they do eventually connect and uh, flow through the floodplain into the um, upper reaches of the Brothers River. And then the East River, which I mentioned is uh, much uh, well is further downstream and uh, connects the lower Apalachicola River to East Bay. Um, so what we're we've decided to do is is conduct something of a pretty pretty standard um, design for um, for doing these sorts of restoration projects. It's a you know, standard backy design, so before after control impact. So we've got. Um, surveys prior to uh, the restoration work, and uh, we're planning to go back and, and resample these sites. Uh, following uh, restoration, we've got a, a control system, Swift Slough, that is not going to be uh, not going to be restored, and that I might add has a fair, fairly good uh, flow uh, and connectivity with the main stem Apalachicola, at least compared to the. The systems uh, that that we're talking about here today, um, and so we did some mussel and fish surveys in fall of 2020 and uh, spring of 21, and then again in fall of 21, and basically just trying to um, find a time when the river uh, will uh, levels were going to cooperate with what we wanted to do uh, with these surveys. So we've. Um, the fish survey was fish surveys involved uh, saning at low water conditions and in places where we had you know sustainable conditions as well as um, we were able to um, get the um, FWC to uh, send out an electrofishing boat during the high water periods and for sampling some of the deeper waters, which was which is super helpful. Um, there's a student at Auburn University who's uh, worked with uh, Dave Wernicke, who's a, um, our, our fish guy on this project, and he's going to be potentially doing some stable isotope, or he's planning to do some stable isotope analyses, I should say, for as part of his master's work to try and understand um, a little bit better from a from a, um, a chemical perspective the the origins of some of these fishes, and then. Um, the muscle surveys were were primarily completed in November of, of 2020, but we did uh, a few more spot surveys in fall of 2021, and these were primarily timed visual surveys. Again, with the with the assistance of of uh, Susie Gita and the FWC uh, muscle crews, um, and then we you know we did some scuba work. But is you know most of what we were doing was uh, fairly shallow water work during these time periods. Um, and uh, I'm not going to talk too much about the mussels, I mean the fishes today, because we don't have um, all of the fish data compiled 
uh, to the point where we really want to um, be um, making uh, uh, too much in the way of, of conclusions about what we're seeing. Uh, we still have, yeah, still a bit to go there. And I also um, <laughs> would like Dave to uh, weigh in on a lot of that as well. But um, basically what we were seeing with the, um, in the sloughs, Douglas spiders, little spiders was that we're finding mostly um, fish that would be typical in small tributary streams um, in the in the lower Apalachicola Basin. Um, very few species that we would consider to be large river species, and very few um, centrarchids or or game uh, game species. Which uh, you know this was. Um, well, certainly the case in fall of, of uh, 2020, uh, which makes sense following the, the relatively low water periods that we experienced during the summer of 2020. Uh, so it could, you know, could could reflect um, limited flow during the low water months and perhaps low uh, dissolved oxygen when we were there in August of 2020. You know, a lot of these a lot of these sloughs were were um, or at least Douglas and spiders were were uh, reduced to uh, fairly stagnant pools, so that that may uh, explain what we're seeing with regards to the fish communities. Um, for as far as mussels go, and I've got some uh, rather wordy slides that I'm going to move fairly quickly through here, so as not to um, not to go over time. But the East River is something of an anomaly as it's near the downstream limits for freshwater mussels in the Apalachicola system. As far as at least as far as we can tell, there are very few records of freshwater mussels from this reach of the river, and that's probably because we've um, have uh, tidal influence in the system. We were finding brackish water uh, mollusks mixed in with the freshwater mussel. Assemblage, and so the main species that we we're finding there is this relatively common species called the round pearl shell, which can tolerate salinities as high as I think 10 to 12 parts per thousand, which is as, as far as I know the highest salinity tolerance of a, of a freshwater mussel. And um, most of those mussels were found at the upper end of East River, kind of in that shallow, sandy, impacted section, and not. They seem to decrease in abundance as you move downstream. Um, spiders, little spider slough, um, found relatively low densities of mussels in this um, in this system. And we did quite a few surveys in spider slough, uh, 15 of them in fact, but only 83 mussels total detected. Our mussel catch rate was really low, around six per hour. Uh, we did get a few listed mussels. We found 10 FTR is fat three ridge, the um, Amblyma nieselari. Uh, in shallow areas, um, I mean in uh, deeper water pockets, but the shallow uh, sandy habitats were, were um, had very few mussels, uh, which is not surprising because they were dry in August when we were there. And this, this site that I'm, I have a picture of here was, you know, there was basically no water in that. Uh, section in August. Um, little spiders is a little bit different. There's more flow through there, and we were primarily sampling near the mouth, um, where you, you get a um, fair number of mussels that are presumably derived from that uh, uh, Chipola River, uh, which is basically paved with um, mussels. So um, uh, the connectivity issues weren't as as uh, noticeable in, in little spiders. Um, Douglas slough uh, was a little bit different. There seems to be a lot more flow connectivity in this system, and um, the main place we saw main places we saw sand accumulations were near the mouth of the confluence with the Apalachicola system. So um, our abundance levels were um, quite a bit higher, about 20 mussels per hour. Um, found a, a few more fat three ridge, but not you know not uh, very large populations in this system, but again, kind of moving up the uh, continuum of flow uh, connectivity. And then finally, um, in Swift Slough, we sampled two sites this last fall and um, found a community that was uh, quite different from what we were seeing in, in Douglas and Spider Slough, uh, much higher 
catch rates, you know, almost 100 muscles per hour. You basically get out of the canoe, put your hand down, and you're touching four or five muscles. Um, got 90 fat three ridge and um, one purple bank climber, uh, which is kind of cool to see those in there. Uh, typically a deep water species, and and this uh, suggests that you know, and obviously observation suggests that there's much more uh, connectivity through uh, this system. So, um, and here's just picture, the obligatory pictures of muscles. So fat three ridge in the top. Right, uh, purple bank climber, top left, and a diverse and somewhat sun washed out picture of our one of our total catches at a, at a site. So really, again, diverse diverse muscle uh, community and and quite a few listed species there. Um, this is just a comparison. If you look at the catch per unit effort and number of fat three ridge muscles in the different um, in the different sloughs, uh, you can see that there's a really um, that well, Swiss slough is significantly different from all the other sloughs, but there seems to be a you know something of a continuum of of uh, increasing muscle abundance as connectivity increases, with East River being something of a of an outlier. So what we're hoping is you know in short that these that um, after the restoration uh, occurs, we'll have increased flow connectivity and that this should um, increase the quality of habitat for freshwater mussels, um, at least in, in spiders and Douglas sloughs. Um, we, we're expecting the community to be more like what we see in, in uh, Swift Slough. Not sure what's gonna happen in East River. Again, it's something of an outlier. Um, so we'll just have to really wait and see there. Um, with regards to the fishes, again, still still um, crunching some of that data, but um, you know what we're we're hoping to see is is a shift from uh, small stream to large river species, and that's you know when we were sampling at super high water in spring 2021, you know when there was when there was a, you know full floodplain inundation, you know, we were seeing these large river species using these floodplain habitats but you know is that going to will that continue post restoration in these sloughs that uh, you know not not 100 percent sure about that but that's that's certainly what we're we're hoping for uh with this with this project so with that um i'll wrap it up um sorry i'm a little bit over time here uh but had have a lot of folks to thank uh including the riverkeeper and um fwc and a, a bunch of other uh, folks. So, um, uh, yeah, but got a few minutes for questions. I'm happy to take them. Yeah, we do have a couple minutes. Um, Anita or Kennedy, do you see any questions? I, I'm not seeing any hands raised. Now, any questions in the question box? Okay. But you're always free to type them in later. <laughs> and we also have our Padlet. You can connect with the speakers. Yeah. And I'm unfortunately I'm going to have to take off here and, and get on to my next um, aspect of my overbooked day. But um, I'm I'm happy to uh, answer any questions if folks want to email me or reach out in some other way later. Um, Sure thing. And thank you so much for joining us today. I really appreciate it. And sure. um, yes, we will um, we'll, we will go back to the Padlet. And if there's any comments or questions, we'll make sure that we connect back with you and, and make sure that you see those. OK. OK, thank great. You. Yeah, I might try and pop in tomorrow morning, too, if I've got some time. So. All right. Excellent. Excellent. OK, so we'll transition to our next speaker. That is Demarcus Turner with Florida A&M University. And this morning, Demarcus's talk is entitled Validating a Model of Microplastic Hotspots from the Apalachicola Watershed to Apalachicola Bay. So thank you so much for joining us this morning, Demarcus, and I'll let you take it away. All right, thank you so much for having me. Uh, I'm so sorry that I had missed uh, the tech-in, so I'm gonna try my best to 
uh, go to each slide the best way I can. I might need some navigating, um, at least for a few seconds doing that. So, hello everyone. My name is Demarcus Turner. I am a NOAA CCME scholar in Florida, Florida A&M University. Um, my focus area is coastal intelligence and um, um, like our wonderful host just said, I'm validating a model of microplastic hotspots from the Apalachicola watershed to the Apalachicola Bay. And so I just want to start off with just the history of uh, pollution generation, which starts off in the 19th century, um, where the world was introduced to, um, you know, the industrial and agricultural and medical advancements that uh, were focused on preserving human health and life. But it wasn't until the middle of the 20th century that we were also introduced to the ramifications of uh, such advancements, which was seen as the pollution, you know, water pollution and air pollution. Um, and then we have in the 1960s, where there was conservative efforts um, um, within the, the legislative system, where we were bringing forth awareness and um, basically bringing forth the emergence of environmental protection that we see now. And so in the 1970s, the most notable legislation that we had was the Clean Air Act of 1970 and the Clean Water Act of 1972. So the next slide, please. And so coastal marine pollution is largely connected to waste discharge from land masses and discharges from human activity to the sea and ocean. 80% of debris in marine environments originate from land-based sources. Of this debris, plastic material is the most prevalent macro pollutant. Plastics make up anywhere between 60 to 90% of marine debris study. And so plastic uh, was originally invented by Edward Simon in 1839, and then Leo Hendrick Baglin, uh, created the first commercially trademarked um, plastic. The inventions in uh, up until the 1940s led to the mass production of mi microplastics in the 1950s, which is about 1.5 billion tons at the time. And then in 2016, it had reached 30, 30, 335 million tons, and it's still growing. Excuse me. There's very little information about the microplastic concentration in Florida per se. Um, but what we do know is that they have industrialization, urbanization, and agricultural um, sources that can potentially put these microplastics into the environment. Plastics can circulate through stormwater runoff, wastewater treatment, plant effluent, tire wear, atmospheric deposition. Um, and a, a study done by McEckern and others estimated that Tampa Bay contains approximately 4 billion particles of microplastics. And this is uh, a study, I picked this study in particular to point out because it's very close to my study area. And I will of course be comparing um, both uh, fields of study and what I've seen because Tampa Bay is a very highly urbanized area. And um, the Apalachicola Bay, however, has, you know, um, it's very prote uh, well protected by the now federal government, it has the nature reserves, um, quite a few along that river, and it is um, joined by so many different uh, populations and uh, because it's such a vast river. Next slide, please. So this is the Apalachicola River Basin. It's part of the Apalachicola Chattahoochee Flint River system. This is um, Florida's largest river according to flow. It assists the profitable um, commercial and recreational fishing industry and is connected to three different states, Georgia, Alabama, and Florida. And so its increased urbanization has resulted with the increased population growth, uh, water resource demand, and point and uh, point source pollution. And this model um, right here is the model that I'm validating. Um, it's a GIS model that basically shows the microplastic emissions in kilograms per day. And um, in the where you see this top part where you see this green dot is one of the ACF dams. And before this dam is, is a high concentration 
of microplastics. And I'll go over the objectives and the purposes and what we uh, had discussed throughout this project and what we are predicting to happen. And so, um, so this is the model uh, that I will be validating. I'm just going in and doing the field work and um, fine proofing. And one of the pers the people, the person who worked on this GIS model um, is actually on my committee, Dr. Rebecca De Jesus. Very thankful for her um, and trusting me with uh, uh, her work and her research and her data. And so, and so, yes. So next slide, please. You should have full control again. Oh, thank you. You did tell me about the, the delay. Try clicking once somewhere on the slide, and then you can use your arrow keys if you need to. No luck? Uh, okay. No. I'll, I'll continue to change for you. Yeah, I appreciate it. All right, so microplastics are categorized um, in three different classes according to size. So you have microplastics, mesoplastics, and macroplastics. And the uh, size of microplastics is heavily debated. It's agreed right now that anything less than five millimeters is the standard for to be characterized as a, as a microplastic. And of course, microplastics have their own uh, subclasses as well, um, you know, going down to the pico and the nano scale. The size of microplastics make it consumable to marine, to marine fauna as small as plankton and its impact can influence food webs from the bottom up. Commercial and recreational wildlife like oysters and fish inhabiting the bay are sensitive to environmental changes, particularly microplastic generation and distribution. And on the right side in this figure, it's just some examples of uh, typical microplastics. Um, you have some jagged edge pieces, uh, some filament type pieces, some films, um, and also some styrofoams. So presently in the ACF basin, there is little known about microplastic abundance, accumulation, distribution, and variety. The purpose of the study is to validate a model that tracks the generation of microplastics reaching the Apalachicola Bay. The main objective here is to assess the presence or the absence of microplastics in sediment and water samples, determine the density of microplastics in the sediment and water samples as well. So um, the first sample starts before the Jimbo Joe Dam, and I'll show you a picture of where that is um, in a second. And so we have two sites before the, this dam and then uh, two sites um, immediately after it. And the rest of the sites are going from the dam all the way until the mouth of the river. And so the sediment is collected with a stainless steel pono grab, collected into glass jars, and all symbols that were collected in the field were stored at or below 20 degrees Celsius. For the water samples, uh, there were many different methods that we could have used, but we decided to pretty much, uh, you know, try it a different way because we felt like it would have been an easier measurement by just simply taking a plankton tone net, a 330 micron plankton tone net, and a metal bucket of, uh, of sample water that has been submerged within one meter of the surface because we're in the river and because we could and um, it was the metal bucket was 20 to 22 um, liters and we're able to calculate and dilute it to a sample of 250 milliliters in order to basically get a better um, better read on how many samples that we collect from that particular uh, that particular replicate. So we also um, about it would have been a good idea to also get the sediment grain size um, for each of the samples. These samples were wet sieved in a 63 micron mesh, oven dried at 50 degrees Celsius. And we also got the mud and sand fraction of each sample. Um, one of the reasons why was because we noticed a, uh, a big difference in the sediments um, that we collected. Um, as you see in the picture right here, um, you can even tell that a lot of uh, more, some sediments were more sandy um, and um, some were a little bit more muddy. We had a uh, very coarse sand, we had a mix of coarse and fine sand. And um, you know, I predicted or hypothesized or theorized that um, 
a lot of the muddy, muddier sediments would um, trap more microplastics as it flows to the bottom. And a lot of the muddier plastics were seen before and right after the ACF dam, which we also are predicting is a potential sink for microplastics. So we're testing for that as well. So we use a density separator um, to separate the microplastics from um, the sediment samples that were collected. Um, we see, saw this as a, a very well published and uh, feasible method. Um, you can go to the next slide. This was the density separator that the, the fine folks in Anner allowed me to use, and I'm very grateful to them for allowing me to use it. And so this is my setup outside um, there at um, on campus at Anner. And next slide, please. And so, and these are some of the um, examples that they had given me uh, in order to identify the different characterizations, uh, physical properties of microplastics. And the first image uh, on the top left uh, in A, you have an example of a filament. Then on the right, you have an example of what a fragment looks like. On C, that's an um, example of a film. And then on the right uh, of it, you have an example of a pellet. And you know, all of these are seen on filter paper, you know, pretty much the size of the smallest petri dish that you could possibly have. And you can imagine how uh, small the, the squares are. So these are, are very tiny. They're very uh, hard to pick out and very annoying to do so. Um, but you know, that's what science is for. Next slide, please. So in this study, um, you know, we expected if the GIS model is accurate, then there should be variability between sampling sites. Um, each sampling site was picked based on what we saw and didn't see from the GIS model. So, of course, right before the um, Jim Woodrow Dam, there was a high concentration of microplastics supposedly being admitted into the area, um, which is Seminole Lake in Georgia. And we noticed that it kind of kind of wanes off, it gets lighter as the river flows down into the apoplectical effect. And the next thing we expect to find is that if the ACF dam is a sink um, for microplastics, then the concentration of, did you go back to the other slide, please? If the ACF dam is a sink for microplastics, then the concentration of microplastics upstream will be more than downstream. And also, if sediment grain size is vary among samples, then the variation of microplastic size will vary as well. Size and um, even concentration. Next slide, please. So these are the observed microplastics that I, I have um, encountered so far as I'm in the, um, the data collection phase. And mostly out of the 55 samples that I've collected so far, a lot of them have had this characterization as a filament of different um, lengths and different colors. And um, the next stage uh, after all of the data is collected from, you know, whether it be counts and characterizations, um, the next step will be to run these samples through um, gas chromatography mass spec, which will give us the chemical composition. And the chemical compositions will tell us exactly what these microplastics made of came from or they're made of, you know, whether they be made of a PVC or whether they may of um, um, polyethylene or ethylate or something like that. Um, you know, basically we really wanna understand the chemical properties of these because microplastics have, um, as of recently, have become more of a complicated problem than we originally thought they were. They were. Next slide, please. And so this is the Jim Woodrow Dam. Um, um, we thought it was very interesting that we had this uh, type of obstacle um, in our field of study. And we thought that uh, it was very wise to incorporate it because originally we were just uh, bent on testing and validating the model. And we felt like that this was a great way of kind of like testing our theory and our hypothesis of what we expect. Next slide, please. We also made an effort to um, you know, take pictures of notable structures that are in the area. In the picture on the left, there is a 
old, I think a decommissioned like a refinery or something like that. And um, on the left, they were doing some construction or building another dock. And on the right, you we took notice of you know bridges that are going across the river because you know uh, plastics coming from tire wear or any trash that might be on them. Um, in this case, the bridge is like right after the the dam, so we made sure that we took notes of um, any obstructions to the to the river at all. And that's it. Where I am in my research, I want to. There are so many people I want to thank, especially the, the fine folks in Anna for their support and helping me finish this project. Um, I want to thank FAMU and CCME for their support and funding um, of this project. I want to thank the the two guys who are in the picture with me as well, um, Dr. Mori, who's a distinguished scientist for NOAA CCME, and um, my faculty advisor, Dr. Michael Martinez Colon who is also a professor at uh, Florida a and And thank you, and um, I would, if you have any questions, please ask them. All right, do we have any questions for DeMarcus? I'm yeah, I have to... my hand up, Jennifer. Oh. This is Steve Lightman. Uh, DeMarcus, hey, Steve. I, want, I wanted to ask you, did you, when you selected your sites, did you concentrate on the landings? Because that's an access point where my experience is you tend to find a lot of uh, plastics thrown into the environment there. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, we take the landings into consideration, especially when considering the model. Um, so when we, I picked sites based on the, what we were seeing on the model, the model's concentrations. And of course, uh, when we talk about the landings, it will be part of the discussion. We noticed that there was a high concentration of microplastics here. We also know that this, this line is here. So if, um, when we would say, of course, you know, if our data aligns with our predictions, that if we want to observe microplastic hotspots, we need to check landings in um, certain systems. So of course, yes, we're taking that into consideration. And um, I thank you even for reminding me because it, it, it in, there's another paper that I need to go get uh, regarding the landings and re regarding any of the um, other hydrologic and the geographic um, efficacies that could also impact microplastic generation. I hope that answered your question. Yes. Anybody else? I'm not seeing any raised hands or anything in the question box. I think I see something in the question um, from John Tracy. Great job. Is it possible to track likely dispersal distances from the river out to coastal areas? Out to coastal areas. Um, there is a way, um, and one of the ways is using GIS software. Uh, and Dr. Rebecca not only did this type of tracking for the Apalachicola watershed, she's done it for the entire country. She has, it's a, you know, it's a, um, based on an algorithmic scale that she has, and she's able to map out microplastic generation based on whether it be weathering, whether it be um, uh, population density, population size, and so, we're noticing that one of the best ways to track microplastic hotspots is through GIS software. Um, and, you know, of course, we can't stem away from the field methods that pretty much validate those things. And, you know, um, and yes, I hope that answered your question. And that, that's the best possible way I could explain that. There's a question from Georgia Ackerman. What is the frequency of sampling? The frequency of sampling? So the sampling happened within the, that three days, of course, uh, abiding by, uh, you know, COVID guidelines and COVID restrictions. So um, we had 12 different sites and pretty much we tried to, we wanted to do as uh, many sites as we could throughout the day, but it ended up being three to four sites per day. Um, that happened within a three week span.
All right, so it looks like we're at time. If anyone has any other questions for DeMarcus, um, I would encourage you to put them on the Padlet and we will ensure that uh, either he takes a look at it or that uh, those questions or comments get back to him. And, and thank you again, DeMarcus. I really appreciate you coming today and, and presenting. Thank we you so much for having me and nice seeing you again. You too. Uh, we are gonna take a quick break for 10 minutes and we'll be back right at 1040 to kick off with uh, Dr. Steve Morey. So we'll see you again shortly. Okay, hey, welcome back from the break. Our next session uh, is going to be Dr. Stephen Morey from Florida A&M University, uh, high resolution numeric modeling in, of Apalachicola Ab Bay hydrodynamics and response to alternative freshwater input scenarios. Welcome, Steve. Thank you very much. For, thank you for having me. Thank you for inviting me to speak in this wonderful symposium today. All right, so what I'm going to be talking about today is some high resolution numerical modeling work that I've been doing with my colleague, Dr. Xu Chen, uh, Florida A&M University. And this work has been funded largely by the Apalachicola Bay Systems Initiative. Um, and also some of my effort has been funded by the Center for Coastal Marine Ecosystems, which is sponsored by the NOAA Office of Education Educational Partnership Program. So over the next few talks, I think we're going to become very familiar with the watershed area and um, the discharge, the river flow variability. But I'm going to, you know, introduce some concepts that are important for the modeling work that I'll be talking about today. So we can see here a map on the left of your screen of the the um, the watershed that extends through the Apalachicola, Chattahoochee, and Flint systems up north of Atlanta. And precipitation over this region, largely, is what drives the, the river discharge variability, certainly um, at, at um, lower frequencies um, entering the bay. On the right, we see a climatology plot of the river flow. So the dark um, black thick lines between those blue bars and those yellow bars represent the median flow for each particular month over a large number of years. And then the different colored boxes represent uh, different quartiles um, with the, uh, the extrema represented by these, these lines. So what we can see is there's an annual cycle with um, typically strongest river, river discharge in the late winter, early spring months, speaking in May, um, lowest in the, the early fall months. Um, in March, uh, sorry, peaks in March. In March, what we can also see is the strongest variability. So if we look at the river flow variability over, over a long time period, what we can see is extended periods of very anomalously wet and anomalously dry years to the record, including some, some recently. Now, these very strong dry periods are not uh, new to the recent time periods. We can see some dating back into the you know, 1950s, very extended periods as well. Um, these Anomalies are also color-coded by the El Nino phase. So most of you are familiar with El Nino Southern Oscillation phenomenon in the Equatorial Pacific that modulates climate in the Southeast US. Typically, what we see is wetter than normal conditions during the El Nino phase and drier than normal conditions during the La Nina phase, although there are other climate modes that can break this relationship down as was seen during the 60s and 70s. 
couple of particular notable events were the 1997-98 El Nino, which was very wet, followed by an extended dry period in 1999-2000. And then we've had some recent periods similar to that. So looking at a plot like this, you know, it begs the question, how does the bay respond to this variability and how will future climate that may cause more frequent wet conditions or dry conditions and different water management policies impact the bay? To address this question, we are employing uh, the highest resolution ever run to date in this region, numerical model, <clears throat> for Apalachicola Bay and the surrounding waters. So this model is based on the finite volume coastal ocean model, which is an unstructured mesh model. And so this allows grid refinement toward interesting features. These green areas on the map are actually the areas of oyster habitat. And so the grid is tightly refined in these areas on the coastal areas. So you'll notice that this, uh, this mesh and land boundary is not really the land. Instead, the mesh extends up over land because this model allows for wetting of land during um, high tides or flooding events, storm surges, et cetera. And the mesh is also refined around interesting topographic and coastal features. The highest resolution in this mesh is about 30 meters. So we get estimates of water velocity, temperature, salinity, elevation, parameters like this every 30 meters. Um, with the coarsest resolution not exceeding a kilometer, 800 meters actually. It's multiple layers, so you can resolve vertical gradients, and it's forced by typical um, atmospheric reanalysis products and observed river, di uh, river discharge. At the boundaries, it's forced by an, a larger scale numerical ocean model run by the Navy called the HICOM, and this model um, incorporates tides. So we've run this model so far for four years, representing an anomalously wet year. So 1998, I pointed out earlier, and then recent years of 2011, 2012, which we know is the extended dry period. And 2019 was basically climatologically average. And you can see the river discharge um, time series in the plot on the right. So 1998 was anomalously wet, particularly in the spring, but uh, even in the fall was wetter than average. Um, 2011 and 2012 are those orange and yellow lines, and they remain near the bottom of the plot throughout, pretty much at the minimum river flow throughout much of the year. And then 2019 was in the middle. So when we develop a model, one of the first things you want to do is, is assess it with available observations for an historic time period to see if the model is representing the real world. So here we see a comparison of the model's sea level um, with the tide gauge station at the Apalachicola Basin. Um, the animation is, is running a, a little choppy over the, um, the internet here, but you can see you know, that the, the elevation goes up and down across the area with the tidal cycle. And you see that the uh, observed elevation at these high frequencies matches quite well with the model, and differences are likely due to some changes in large scale atmospheric uh, pressure or wind forcing. So we're quite happy with the, uh, the model's representation of the tides, which is a major controlling factor for high frequency um, salinity, variability, and uh, of course depth as well. So Apalachicola National Estuary and Research Reserve has been collecting uh, long-term observations at a few stations within the bay uh, as far as um, water parameters, temperature, and salinity. Um, these are continuous, nearly continuous time series dating back quite some time. And there are three stations that we use to assess the model, uh, two much more have a, a longer period of record than the Pilot Cove station. So at the west is Dry Bar, at the east is Cap Point near the causeway. And we can see comparisons between the modeled temperature and the observed temperature over uh, the whole year of 2019. And you can see that the model is replicating quite nicely the observed temperature variability um, over that time period. But probably the most important parameter that the model is simulating for the, um, the bay's ecology, particularly the oysters, is salinity. So on the upper left, you can see an animation of the modeled salinity. We can just look at this for a minute and, and look at some interesting features. You see a, a pretty strong east to west gradient at this time period in salinity. You know, it's um, lower salinity toward the, the mouth of the river, higher salinity to the east, but at low frequencies that, that moves around. And that's being driven largely by the large scale wind. So the wind forcing can move this pool of fresh water east and west, where it actually exits through the different passes in this multiple inlet estuary. So if we compare time series of salinity to observations, I will say salinity is one of the hardest things usually for models to get accurate in uh, these high resolution estuary models. 
we can see that the model is picking up this high frequency variability over the first few months of the 2019 record. You know, these, these, these peaks and dips are being controlled dominantly by the wind moving back and forth with cold front systems as it passes through the area. So we'll move forward and look at a comparison over the entire year and get uh, another picture of how it's behaving. And we can see some things about the model. So here we have uh, a red and a blue line represent two different model simulations where we are exploring the impacts of different types of wind forcing. But generally you can see that they, they follow fairly closely to the observed salinity, which is shown in black, particularly at the Pilot's Cove location shown at the bottom of the screen over the course of the entire year. There are um, departures for short time periods, but the overall seasonal or annual pattern looks quite close. Um, dry bar observations weren't available in the second half of the year, and so we can only compare the first half of the year. And there, there does seem to be a bit of a low bias in the model compared to observations. That's something we're working on addressing. We will say that the model has shown us that there is a very strong uh, salinity front that commonly occurs in the area, and perhaps just a displacement of that front by only a few hundred meters can really affect uh, the answer here. That's a new result that we have, and we'll be hopefully going out to, to ground truth this result shortly. So what are some things that we can do with the model to actually provide products that can, that can um, be used for, for assessing potential restoration efforts or understanding what could happen to the bay in the future? Well, here is one such derived product from the model. So what we have here are maps of salinity quantiles. So what you have is in the, the, the middle row, the middle row is the median salinity for a particular month of the wet period, uh, normal period, and a dry period. So this is March of 1998 on the left, 2019 in the center column, and 2012 on the rightmost column. So if we look just at the, um, the 50th percentile, which is the middle row here, I don't know if my cursor is showing on the screen or not. Oh, I think it was until I moved past it. Yeah, we can see that you would expect a median salinity. Let's look at the cat point area. You can, you can see it um, you know, just south of the, of the east point area in the model. You know, we would expect that the, the lowest 25th percentile salinity during a wet year to be quite low in, this, in, in the low single digits. Compared to a normal year where the salinity there is up closer to perhaps 10. And during the dry year, the median salinity there is, is much higher, perhaps around 18 to 20. And if you look at the, the bottom row, that's the 75th percentile. So these are the higher um, salinity values. You can still see that even during a wet year, even the highest salinities that you get during a month are still quite low at the, um, let's just say the cap point area, compared to one of these dry years where the salinity is now pushing 30 region. So this is one way we can get a mapped view of how different parts of the bay are expected to respond um, to different river discharge scenarios. Now we can start to narrow in on particular locations of interest and look more at the statistics there. And here's an example. So this is plotted for cap point where we have a long-term time series and there's been a lot of statistical analysis here. But this is an example of things that can be done at other places that have no previous observations. So this is um, a distribution, a cumulative distribution. And what this shows is the probability of salinity being less than a certain value. So on the x-axis is those values of salinity and the y-axis is the probability that the salinity will be less than that. The blue curve is for all the time periods where the river discharge is in the the lowest quintile, so the lowest 20% of the observed river discharge. And the red curve is when the river flow is in the highest 20% of that time period. So if we look at a salinity of 20, we can see there's just a little bit better than a 50% chance that salinity will be below that, which means a little less than a 50% chance that salinity will exceed that value when the river flows in its um, lowest 20% flow rate. But if you look at time periods when the river flows in a higher flow regime, that same 20, 
you see nearly a 95% chance that the salinity will be low, will be below 20 at that location, with only a 5% chance that it will exceed. Now, similar plots and similar statistics can be done through these conditional sampling uh, mechanisms to investigate uh, other features of the river flow. For example, what happens when the river flow remains low for an extended time period or in one month versus another month. So these are the types of statistics that we're now trying to produce um, to meet uh, needs of decision managers and stakeholders. So we'll talk a little bit about future plans for the model, you know, moving forward. So this model can also be used to look at future climate scenarios by forcing it instead of a reanalysis for an historic period, but rather a downscale uh, model from a, a future climate model. And that's one of the possibilities uh, for uses of the model. A thing that we're getting ready to do is to incorporate some individual-based modeling um, procedures to look at oyster larva dispersal and potential survivability uh, of the larva and recruitment of the larva under different river flows and uh, climate uh, regimes and flow scenarios, as well as other derived products. In particular, I'm a graduate student at Florida State University is working on habitat suitability maps using output from our model combined with real world observations. And also changes um, in the bay with different uh, management scenarios. And you know these are being conducted in collaboration with Steve Whiteman, who's gonna be talking a little bit later in this meeting. Um, finally, the model could potentially be turned into a forecast modeling system by coupling it with seasonal climate models or even long-term uh, weather models to get uh, shorter-term predictions of what may happen in the Bay in the future. So with that, I thank you and I'll be happy to take any questions if there's time. Okay, thank you, Stephen, a really great talk. Um, do we have any questions? I forgot to introduce myself. I'm Anita Grove. I work at the research reserve. <laughs> Didn't see any questions in the question box. Kennedy, do we have any hands raised? Not at the moment. I don't see any hands raised either at this time. There's one from Andy Gannon. Uh, yeah, I submitted a question uh, on the box, but I guess you didn't see that, so I raised my hand too. Okay. Uh, the question was that I, I love those CDF plots, and I believe you said they show surface salinity. I'm more interested in bottom salinity, where the critters I'm interested in spend most of their time. Does the model show bottom salinities, or will it? Absolutely. In fact, um, Dutch Chen and I have spent quite a bit of time looking at uh, differences in, in salinity variability at the different depths. Um, you know, the ANR observations are actually not collected right at the surface, and so we've been trying to interpolate our model to the depths of the observations uh, when we compare with the model. So you're actually seeing subsurface salinity there. Um, so yes, we, we can look at differences in, in top and bottom salinity, and we actually have some plots there, um, if you're familiar with the Hoffmuller style, style plot that shows salinity throughout the entire water column with time, so it becomes a colored map. So you can actually see time periods where you expect a difference in top to bottom salinity, and other time periods where it's a location is essentially vertically homogenized, and you get pretty much the same salinity top to bottom. So, yes. I don't see any other questions coming in from anyone. Thank you Anita. so much, um, Dr. Mori. Thank you. We really appreciate it. And everybody's email is also in the Padlet if you have any specific questions, if you think any, of anything after we're done. And we're going to move on to Kevin Engelbert with Florida State University. <clears throat> and he's going to tell us about changing benthic sediment within Apalachicola Bay. Uh, 
Okay, hello. Let's see if I can get control here. Okay. Hey Kevin, I think I'm having a little bit of bandwidth issues, so I'm going to slide back a few slides until you get uh, to the way you start. Yeah, I might be clicking too much. It's probably the problem. All right, give it a shot now. Uh, can we go back oh. one more? I don't want to. Yeah, we're at the beginning. Let me see if I've got something else going on with my computer, but you should be able to take it away from here. Okay. All right. Uh, hello, my name is Kevin Engelbert. I am a research technician at the Florida State University Coastal Marine Laboratory with the Apalachicola Bay System Initiative uh, and Dr. Josh Breithop's lab. I'm glad to be here and to be able to discuss our research amongst uh, all these other interesting projects. Uh, so this research investigates the sediment characteristics in Apalachicola Bay over a 60 year period. Um, I conducted this research in conjunction with Josh uh, Breihop and Havlin Steinmuller. So what sparked our interests in the sediment characteristics uh, uh, of the bay uh, changing over time was this paper published in 1963 by John Kofed and Don Gorsling. Uh, they sampled uh, across the bay. Uh, you can see their sampling locations in this upper left figure. And they created uh, contour maps of organic carbon, um, calcium carbonate, uh, mean grain size, and amongst other characteristics. Um, these maps were lower resolution and probably uh, hand-drawn and the publication also does not have the most well-described methods of how they collected and processed all this data and nor do we have spatially uh, correlated data besides what we can infer uh, from the contour maps so uh, comparing different time periods brought its own challenges but it's also uh, there's a lot you can get from these so uh, there have been uh, a lot of in environmental changes that have occurred in the region since 1963. Some of the major environmental changes are the sediment quantity input from the river, uh, detritus from the flood, flood, flood plain, and the elephant in the room is the oyster population decline and reduced filtering activity. Uh, while these are not exclusive to Apalachicola Bay, uh, you can see a few publications detailing that, such as increased rates of carbon burial and sedimentation uh, in publications by uh, Josh and uh, Rodriguez et al. Uh, we want to investigate how the sediment characteristics have changed as well, uh, either in reaction or in conjunction with these events. Uh, we also want to investigate the interrelationship between these sediment characteristics. Oh gosh, let's see. It keeps going forward. There we go. So we began this investigation by collecting samples across the bay with an Ekman grab. Uh, the sampling locations, uh, you can see the Ekman grab on the, on the left image. Uh, the sampling locations were chosen to reflect the sampling locations made in 1963 by COFED. Uh, they have a pretty high density throughout the bay and for the purposes of this study, we include St. Vincent Sound, Apalachicola Bay proper, and uh, St. George Sound, and the western portion of St. George Sound. Uh, the Ekman grab is, uh, we would send it down on a line, and it would kind of clamp the sediment into it, and you bring it up, and we would homogenize the sediment in the little bucket and bag and tag it for lab analysis. So we conducted an array of analyses on each sample. Not every analysis, I won't discuss every analysis that we did in this presentation, but for those interested, I will name all the analyses at the end. Um, so uh, each sample was uh, dried 
in the oven at 60 degrees Celsius and homogenized in a mixer or ball mill, as seen in this picture on the right. You can see all the different color variations from the sediment across the bay. It's always interesting. So we used the loss and ignition method to determine organic matter percentage and calcium carbonate percentage. Uh, the weight loss after a 550 degree Celsius burn would determine the organic matter percentage and the difference between that burn and then 990 degree burn would give us the calcium carbonate uh, percentage estimation. Uh, the picture on the left is kind of like the crucibles and what that sediment looks like after being burned ends up with this pink, pinkish hue. And then we also sent our samples to University of Florida for elemental analysis. Uh, so we were able to get uh, organic carbon percentage, uh, total organic carbon percentage, and uh, isotope analysis. And you can see that uh, instrument on the right. So after conducting our individual analyses on each sample, we performed a spatial analysis of all the data points. Uh, this was done by using interpolation to display predictions of the values between points for each characteristics. Uh, the interpolation takes the weighted average between points to determine a predicted value. Uh, so for instance, uh, the interpolation, uh, like the, uh, the points like those seen on the left, can create the image you see on the right, and each color variation has its own determined value. So you can kind of see here's kind of displaying the process of taking those hand-drawn figures from 1963 and turning them into something we can compare to modern day data. Uh, the images, uh, the figures exist in PDF format and a hard copy publication. Uh, I was actually able to gain a higher resolution by digitally scanning the figures and then geo-referencing them to, uh, in GIS and then overlaying uh, polygons to re represent that contour data as a raster data set. So for example, here's the 1963 organic carbon percentage uh, contour map, which uh, also includes this gulf area. Uh, we won't be really going into that much for our data. But here is that figure displayed as a heat map. Um, the 1963 contour map reported that the organic carbon values range from half a percentage of organic carbon to 1.5% OC. Uh, you can see in the middle of the bay is mainly 1.5% uh, organic carbon. Uh, we also overlaid the map with oyster reefs of the bay, uh, as we believe it kind of represents an important part of the story when you're looking at this data visually. Uh, the oyster reefs are represented uh, in the white shapes you see with the, the little black polka dots. Um, they'll be on most of the figures today. And it's uh, important to note that these reefs are not full structures, but they're rather uh, concentrated clusters of oysters. And here's the 2021 data for organic carbon percentage uh, displayed as a heat map. The values range from 0.27 organic carbon percent to 3.52 organic carbon percent. Um, I'd like to also highlight that the middle of the figure also re represent the higher range of organic carbon percentage for this, uh, for 2021. So how do we compare these two data sets and um, kind of understand it easier. Uh, we can compare these by using a function on JS to subtract the values found on these raster heat maps. And here is the output of that subtraction function. And we can see a range of values where there's up to a 3% organic carbon gain and up to a half a percent of organic carbon loss. The warmer colors represent organic carbon gain while the cooler colors represent organic carbon loss. Uh, most of the map here is organic carbon percentage gain up to 90% of the study area. Um, so most of the carbon loss has been in the eastern part of St. George, George Sound. And uh, I'd also like to know that the these funky shapes are an artifact of 
the lower resolution contour maps. Uh, however, it's still a telling story of the si significant sed sediment organic carbon accumulation in the bay. And this is the 1963 calcium carbonate uh, data displayed as a heat map. The contour map that we pulled this data from reported calcium carbonate percentages ranging from 10 to 50 percent. Uh, the warmer colors represent a higher amount of calcium carbonate in the sediment. You can see that concentrated uh, south of East Point and along the St. George Island. I feel like this is frozen. Oh, there we go. Uh, here's the 2021 map of calcium carbonate in the study area. Uh, we reported ranges of 1 to 37 calcium carbonate from our measured samples. Um, also, I'd like to point out that the calcium, this percentage represents calcium carbonate within the sediment. It's not just uh, like larger chunks of shell when you think calcium carbonate. We seem to be having some spikes in network bandwidth here. It's uh, causing some delays. Uh, I apologize for that. No worries. Okay, here we go. It'll fly it out soon. <laughs> so uh, again, we did a subtraction, and this is the difference between the 1963 and 2021 calcium carbonate percentage data. Um, the cooler color colors represent a calcium carbonate loss, while the warmer colors represent a calcium carbonate gain. Uh, a large part of the bay is displaying a calcium carbonate loss since 1963. Uh, who, who knows when exactly that loss occurred, whether it was incremental or whatnot, but um, we see a gain of up to 43, or a, a loss of up to 43% and a gain of up to 26%. Uh, here, this graph displays the organic carbon percentage to nitrogen percentage ratio of 1963 and 2021. Uh, the black dots represent the 1963 data, while the beige dots represent the 2021. Uh, this ratio is often used as like a crude check of whether the sediment source has changed. Um, our data shows that the source of the sediment in the bay is virtually identical and that there has not been a major change of sediment source in the bay since 1963. Uh, while there has not been a change in sediment source, you can see the amount of carbon and nitrogen has increased. Uh, you do not see any 1963 values nearly as high as uh, our 2021 reported values. So to reiterate, the bay is not seeing a sediment source change, but rather the input amount of organic carbon and nitrogen has increased. Uh, here is our carbon isotope data represented in a heat map. Uh, the deeper blue colors represent a more terrestrial carbon source, while the lighter blue colors represent a more marine source. Um, anyway, you look at this map, it kind of points to Apalachicola River as a source of sediment in the bay. Um, this is not uh, necessarily news, as Jeff Shanton has reported on this, and uh, we can get deeper into that. Um, and his graph is on the lower left. Uh, to conclude, 90% uh, of the bay is exhibiting a uh, increase in sediment organic percentage between 1963 and the present. Uh, the consistency is in the consist consistency in carbon and nitrogen ratios from 1963 and the present day suggests that this is not a not representative of a change in organic matter source. Uh, this suggests instead a change in the way the bay processes sus suspended organic matter. 
Uh, also to those interested, I'd like to note some of the other parameters collected and planned for the study are pH, conductivity, uh, nitrogen isotopes, organic matter percentages, grain size, total nitrogen, uh, lead 210 dating, and microbial respiration. Uh, since we have some extra time, uh, let's see. Be stuck again. Well, we also wanted to further investigate whether the decline of oyster activity has played a role in the increase of organic carbon in the bay, and we made some uh, extremely back-of-the-envelope calculations uh, in regard to oyster filtering. Uh, once we get to the infographic, I want to stress that uh, they're kind of brazen assumptions and uh, for this little examination. Uh, here, here we go. Um, oh gosh, sorry, skipping all over the place. There we go, thank you. Uh, we... Perfect. So uh, in the first row, we presume an increase of 2% soil organic carbon, and if we pre presume a 2% increase in soil organic carbon in a one kilometer squared area with a dry bulk density of 0.6 grams uh, per centimeter and multiply that by the study area, um, then we would come up with 500 million grams of organic carbon increase since 1963. Um, in the second row, we estimate how much carbon a single adult oyster can process using chlorophyll A, A ratios of carbon per liter and assuming that each oyster can filter up to 75 liters per day, then a single adult oyster can process five to eight grams of organic carbon per day. So now if we take that and, and increase uh, 500 million grams of organic carbon and divide it by the carbon each oyster can process, it would lead to an estimation of the loss of filtering by five to 8.6 million uh, oysters per year for 10 years. Um, so if you're interested more in some of those chicken scratch calculations and uh, assumptions, uh, largely Josh and played with this a lot. And uh, if you want to dive into this further, here's some more math. Uh, please let me know if you have any questions. And I'd like to acknowledge and thank Shannon Hartsfield for taking us out in the bay with his uh, extreme knowledge of the study area and our undergraduate students for coming out and um, outlasting some uh, fun boat trips. Okay, thank you, Kevin. Are we getting any questions? We have some from Blake Hamilton. Uh, I'll go ahead and unmute you, Blake, and feel free to unmute yourself to ask. As I'm so, oh, looks like I'm not muted. Can you all hear me? Yep. Yep. Yes. Awesome. Hey, Kevin. Thanks. Thanks for that talk. That was really interesting. Um, I'm curious, have you guys made those maps for the nitrogen isotopes yet? And if so, have you seen any trends uh, with the distance to river mouth, kind of like what you're seeing with that the, the carbon data? Uh, great question. Uh, we, we have made some of those maps. However, it's uh, there are no clear trends. From what we found, uh, we we a lot of this has been this this talk has been a great impetus to to dive further into this, and we we want to if, if we come up with anything, you know, uh, we plan to look into that further. But as of right now, just at a surface level glance, uh, there's no clear trends. Yeah, yeah, that's that's interesting, and uh, the reason I asked is because I ran a lot of the carbon, sulfur, and nitrogen on some of the fish and sharks in the bay that I'll be talking about later, but that's the nitrogen information really wasn't informative for running mixing models. And I think it, um, Chan talks about that in one of his earlier papers too, how there's not really any clear trends in nitrogen. So I was just curious if you were seeing anything now because I took my samples around the time when you guys were sampling as well. So cool, thanks for sharing, man. Right on. 
Okay, don't see any hands raised. Any other questions? Okay, well, Kevin, thank you so much. That's uh, fascinating, important data. Of course, thank you. And Steve, we'll be starting a, a minute early if you're ready. Um, I'm ready. All right. I'd like, I'd to, like to take the minute to first say that uh, Anita and Jenny, you've done a fabulous job in organizing this. I'm really appreciating the talks. Well, and the man behind the curtain is Kennedy Hansen. <laughs> oh, and Kennedy too. Um, I should include you in this. Yeah. Okay, we, so sorry I'm about our talk about basin-wide modeling for water management decision-making in the basin. And uh, I work with the Apalachicola Bay Science Initiative and uh, in hearing Steve Moray's talk, one of the Steve's of the project, uh, that it, we're real close, I think, now to a point where we can be working together using the riverine modeling and the estuarine modeling to be able to look at what we can do to improve situations. And I'll, this really ties to it because to talk about improvements, we need to define uh, metrics to say what, what makes things better. Okay, here I go doing as some of the previous ones did of darting away. Okay, so. Systems models can be used to evaluate means to provide adequate water. However, we must first define what is better. And uh, right now in the ACF basin, we have a highly flexible model in which we can alter climate, reservoir management practices and water consumption and say, how does that affect the estuary or the river? And the whole key to this is defining what is better. So this is our ACF basin and we have two watersheds and one of them, the Flint side, which is the green is unregulated. And on the purple side is the Chattahoochee, which we do have storage reservoirs, but the ratio of storage to flow in the Apalachicola portion of the river is highly limited. Two thirds of our storage is in the upper part of the basin and although if you go to Lake Seminole, it looks pretty big, Lake Seminole has a storage capacity which is roughly equal to one day of average flow in the river. So basically it's a run of the river facility, it's not a storage facility. So some key questions related to watershed modeling is, is does the capacity in the federal storage reservoirs exist to provide additional water or modify the timing of water releases that is more attuned to ecosystem needs? And can we in turn define scenarios that will improve the present day conditions? And what do we need to do to establish factors within the ecosystem that correlate directly to flow? So, before we can talk about how to change the existing water control manual to first enhance the ecosystems, we must first define what are the standards? What do we define being better? And simply saying we'd like more water is not good enough. It's how do we want that water? And so I'm gonna run through an example and uh, a lot of what right now I'm doing with Ken Jones is, is that we're essentially looking at, as part of their slough restoration project, is, is a system-wide approach to providing more connectivity as well as cleaning out the individual sloughs. So if one of our metrics was to enhance the flow flood regimen of the Tupelo swamps, then the metric should, we need to define the timing, extent, frequency of time that the swamps need to be flooded to enhance it. So in this following sheet, this is the percent of time that flow was below 14,000 CFS by day of year. Now, when you look at this chart, you can see that right around June 1st, there's this sudden jump 
it looks like there must be something wrong. And this is model results, incidentally. But what it is, is that if you look at the water control manual operations, there's a break in how operations are approached between March and May and June and November. And so when you follow the water control manual strictly, which is what you would do in a model, then what you can see is that uh, you would get this abrupt jump in what the releases would be. So a metric example would be is, is that the swamps have been see, perceived to be drying out over time. And if you look at this chart, this looks at the period of time with no swamp inundation in the spring and summer. But the thing about some of these data in some places that we need to be careful when we look at data with the river is, is that when you look at historical data from Jim Woodruff, which is probably our most reliable gauge data, if you look at that 23 to 2017 period, we have a time frame when there was no dams, a time frame when there was one dam, two dams, three dams, and four dams. And then once you had all the reservoirs constructed or all the dams constructed in the, uh, not by 1975, then we've had about five different ways that we've managed the watershed over time. And so, Consequently, that things are very different. And if you look at this one, this shows the maximum number of consecutive days using model data versus historic data. And this runs from 39 to 2012. And when we use the model data, what we do is essentially take the basin inflow that happened and run it every year with the current operations and the current consumption. And what you can see is, is that there's a lot of differences between using modeled and historic data. And because of all the changes that had occurred at Woodruff, I would recommend using the model data over the historic data. Now, another thing that we need to remember when we're looking at and we're making decisions in this basin is, is that since about one half of the basin is unregulated, one half has a storage capacity, and most of the storage is in the upper river, that what the water control manual tells us is not what the flow will be coming out of Jim Woodruff Dam. It tells us what is the level of support that you'll get from the reservoir system to meet a flow. But a lot of the time when you have the reservoir system providing a 5,000 CFS flow, you will get more water because of that nature of the basin. So in defining metrics, an important part is the capacity of the reservoir system to support releases to the river and floodplain to support these metrics. So, um, it's nice to get more water, but we need to be able to come up with ways to get more water that will work in the, for the entire system, not just for us. And uh, one of the things we have to realize too is, is that when the water control manual was developed, the ACF basin was divided into two parts, one of it being the river and one being the bay. And that's because the Gulf Intercoastal Waterway ran across the bay. So it was an artifact of a historical event. And I think when you're developing water control manuals and the like, we should consider the bay as part of the basin. It is part of the basin. And we have very limited storage capacity, so there's constraints on what we can do. And so the following slides show the storage capacity that you have in the basin. Now this, one way that they look at it is, is the composite storage, which is the combined storage of Lake Lanier, West Point Lake, and WF George. Seminole is not included. And these are, you can see the locations of the three. And 
Next you have is this Lake Lanier elevations. West Point and WF George. So the questions that we had earlier is the ones that I'd really like to focus on now is does the capacity exist to provide additional water or to modify the timing of water releases that is more attuned to the ecosystems? When you're looking at historical climate, I would have to say absolutely yes. If you go back and you look at the composite storage, which is how they manage the system. You're talking about that most of the time, that if you look at the minimum elevation that we've had in the data, if you run from 39 to 2012, that roughly half of the storage in the basin is never used. And it's a 90%, you know, you're running what, still over half. And so there's a lot of water that is not being used and that I would have to say the water control manual, the way it's set up is very storage biased and not a balance between storage and downstream needs. And incidentally, this line down here below is when you're in an emergency drought situation, which is defined by storage. And when you run the historical climate, you never even come close to getting into that situation. And you can see at Lake Lanier, which is the uh, water supply for Atlanta, which is an important issue still when you run the water control manual through the historical climate, there's a lot of water that's not touched at Lake Lanier, at West Point, or at George. And looking at George elevations is important because George is, the way they do releases for the reservoirs are, is, is that WF George provides the water that's needed under the water control manual. Then West Point is balances with George and supports George so that the two of them are roughly providing the same amount. And then Lanier balances with West Point. So I would say that we have ample water to revise releases to provide freshets, to provide better storage of or better flooding and inundation of the floodplain. And so if we look at George at the 90 and 95% exceeded elevations, you can see that we are not coming close to using the water at George, the water. And that basically what we're doing is supporting the uh, recreation and the usage of George in the basin through the water control manual. And this would be at a 90% exceeded elevation. That means one year, nine years in 10, the elevation was higher. At a 95, that means 19 years out of 20, the elevation is higher. So the second question is, can we in turn define water management scenarios to improve the present ecological conditions? And so in the modeling that we're doing under APSI and under other places, we have the ability to revise the reservoirs and to come up with specific ways to manage the system to do better. And so that we are in a position to tell the Corps of Engineers how we want the basin to be managed instead of reacting to what they provide us. And I think that being in a proactive stance is a great improvement. Now, one of the issues that we need to understand is that the water control manual was developed based on historic climate. They use the uh, unimpaired flows, which is a de derived from the historic flows. 
And for all, it's quite possible that in the future, we're gonna see more extreme droughts, more extreme floods than was experienced in the historic climate. And so when you look at the, the rules and such that they have for it, it's very tightly defined. It's all defined based on how well it would do in historic climate. And a separate project that I'm working on that is really not included in this talk though, that we're looking at a range of a hundred different alternative ways historic climate could have happened, which would have much more increased drought and flood events. And surprise, the water control manual does not work near as well under alternate climate scenarios. And so what do we need to do to establish factors within ecosystems that correlate directly to flow? So at present, we're detailed metrics to distinguish between acceptable really do not exist. There's some metrics, but they're not of enough of a detail to define specific management approaches. They're vague, and so they really cannot be used yet. But under ABSI and through a parallel effort by the Riverine Counties Stakeholders Coalition, we're working on trying to develop more specific metrics so that we can define more specific operations. And with the water control manual, it's approaching the core and hopefully to get it changed. And with that, I'll ask if there are any questions. We, we have one, I, I think you may have answered it. Um, this is from Lee Yokel. Why, why use model data over historic data? What's the rationale? Why what? Why use the model? Why use model data over historic? Question mark. Well, What's first of all, question? what I had said earlier, if you look at Jim Woodruff Dam outflow, if we look at going back to the, tw the 23 is the first you know data that we have that in that time period you have conditions at Jim Woodruff Dam where you had no resin no dam Jim Woodruff Dam was not built till 1955 you had periods when uh Buford Dam was being built when West Point Dam was being built when George was being built so you had quite variable conditions upstream. And then once the reservoirs were constructed, there was four or five different ways that they managed the reservoir as a system. So consequently, when you look at the uh, flows, it's quite variable. And my feeling is, is that we're trying to ask the question of how best to manage the system in the future, not the past. And when we look at the future, we need to look at having as few variables as possible. So if the flow at Woodruff is very confused because of the different, you know, existing of reservoirs and different management approaches, then it'll provide different results. Does that answer your question? I think we're, uh, Lee, did you have any other comments? If, if you do, you're welcome to come up and come off mute. Okay. Hearing none. Well, thank you, um, Steve. That was a very enlightening talk. And um, we do hope to be able to establish those metrics. Thank you. Thank you. Our, okay, our next speaker will be Adebayo Solanke with Florida's A&M University, the Apalachicola Bay Systems Initiative Update, the historic evolution of heavy metals from Apalachicola Bay. Yeah.
Good morning. Um, my name is um, Adebayo Sholanke. I'm a PhD candidate at the School of the Environment, Florida A&M University. And I'll be giving an update on APSI regarding the historical evolution of heavy metals from Apalachicola Bay. I'm working with Dr. Martinez. Um, can you go to the next slide, please? Um, the purpose of my research is to provide an adequate uh, on the levels of heavy metals and to establish historical reference condition less than 1,000 years. My objective is to determine the distribution and availability of heavy metals and the possible temporal and spatial distributions. So I collected 12 surface samples of sediment sample and one core sediment sample. Um, the surface sample were, samples were collected from the mouth of the river to the extent of the marine environment. And the core sediment was collected for me to use for the temporal distribution. These are my inner parameters of interest. Um, for my samples, for both sediments, um, cost surface sediment sample and the cost sediment samples. A, every better analysis was done using sequential extraction. Also, the um, grain cell analysis was done, total organic carbon was done, and um, CO carbonate two was also done. For my Called samples, dating was done for me to be able to get the date for each of the uh, for the uh, for the cost sample. The cost sample was section um of oh, section and it was taken for analysis for both all these parameters for all these parameters and for dating. So the because the, for the pollutant, these are the um every method that I determine for my analysis. Uh, for the oxygenation practice, these were implemented to assess if there's any aplastic or anostic changes in the Apalachicola Bay. So over the past 114 years, the Apalachicola Bay has not experienced any detrimental changes in terms of the oxygen levels. For the sediment core, this is me doing the collection of the sediment um, in one of my trip. Sediment core was collected. Um, the next thing here is a table showing the the levels after the heavy metal analysis was done. I was able to show the minimum and maximum average levels of these um, heavy metals. From a temporal perspective, several of the heavy metals did not exceed the divine ERL, ERLL values. In other words, for the past 114 years, the temporary changes in heavy metals concentration had no effect on the biota. For the cost sample that I did, um, the, the dating, this is the chart showing the total organic carbon and the core depth. And, and here is the date that was included. We can see the, the distribution of these total organic carbon. And here is the mod percentage that also did. Um, this also showing the trend of the mod percentage that was taken for the core sample. One thing to notice here is that there's a decline in the percentage of mod as year increases from 1906 to 2020. So there's a kind of decrease in the mod percentage. So after that, I decided to use pollution index to see um, level pollution in the Apalachicola Bay. And here is a chart showing the pollution index. 
the position index takes into account all the methods that are analyzed in my in the sediment. And from what on the screen you can see that for the past 114 years, the PLI suggests that there's a constant or progressive deterioration of the B, which is indicated as pollution that pollution exists. And uh, if the PLI is less than one, it means it's natural or, or baseline conditions. And if the PLI is greater than one, it indicates that pollution exists. So this is um, a chart showing the some, some of the um, metals that I uh, and analyze. This is also for call sample. Here it's showing the trend for zinc, and here it's showing the trend for lead, and here it's showing the trend for selenium. Looking at the data, one key important here is that there's a sharp decline in the level of lead and zinc, especially in 2012. And this also applies to uh, lead. You can see it's a kind of increase again, also for lead too. For selenium, there's no sharp decrease com compared to what we have in zinc and lead. Just have a little, a little changes here. So I decided to do the um, enrichment factor for these three um, elements. For zinc, it, from uh, what we have on the data on the screen, we have um, minor enrichment for zinc, as we can see, it's just within the borderline. Here means the, the darker green means no enrichment, lighter one means minor enrichment. Likewise, for leg, the enrichment factors were also done. You can also see the trend. Here, meaning there's a minor enrichment. Here also means um, no enrichment. For selenium, the same enrichment factor was also done. Um, based on that, we can see there's a severe kind of enrichment for selenium. Though there's two offshoots from ear and ear. Beyond that, we can also see that apart from these two offshoots, the other ones are more ear, talking about severe, very severe enrichment. So this is um, one of the methods, apart from the PLI that was done, the enrichment factor was also done to look at the um, some of the pollution level in the Appalachian Bay. Um, for my surface sample, um, I, as I said, I collected uh, 12 surface samples, but one of the sample uh, at a particular location, uh, there are more shells than sediment. So I didn't really analyze that. So for surface sample, I have more of 11. This is me uh, doing the collection of the surface sample with my professor, Dr. Martinez. Um, this is a table showing the total level for every metals uh, for all the sites that was analyzed. Like I said, there's no site for site 11. Like I said, in that particular location, there are more shells and no sediment. So I didn't bother to analyze that. For this table, from a spatial perspective, several of the methods did not exceed the defined ERL value except from Mercury in station six. And that can be seen in uh, this particular layer, that the value here. Um, that means that the biota in the area of station C may probably be experiencing some biotic effect due to Mercury. So I decided to do a uh, heat map to show the trend in terms of the levels of the total uh, total levels in respect to their various sites. So in this, I can I noted there's a particular trend for this for some of the metals. A very good example is the uh, the station five and six or site five and six, and also site twelve. From the heat map, you can see there's an high levels of 
of these for chromium, cobalt, copper, and nickel for station uh, site five and six and 12. Uh, a kind of similar event also happened for zinc, when for five, six, little for 12, and for iron too, for site five, six, and 12. Uh, another kind of trend that seems to happen is talking about cadmium. Cadmium is more prominent for site section one, two, and three. And, and four, that is probably more at the, at the riverside coming to the entrance of the bay. So another trend notice is for mercury. Like I said, pointed out previously in the previous slide, you um, can see mercury at station six. So this is kind of heat map to give me kind of distribution or image to see how the levels are in various locations uh, within the bay. So I decided to put that in the using ARC GIS. Um, this is what I have. Um, they see an ongoing work to generate heat maps from all the all other uh, metals to the analyze. So it's kind of similar to what I described earlier on, uh, showing the levels of cobalt and the level of chromium. The funny thing about it is that if you look from the entrance of the river, it seems to be low. Whereas from these stations here, they more high levels. It seems also applies to um, chromium. Uh, for my surface samples, I, I also determine the percentage for TOC, um, carbonate, and uh, mod percentage. And this shows the various levels of these uh, various sites. I decided to put this also into using the heat map to see a kind of visual of what is going on in terms of their levels. Um, looking at the total organic content for sample five, sample six, you can see there seems to be high level of total uh, TOC for station site five, six, and 12. Probably that's the reason why we have more of the uh, high level of some metals is at some particular site because of the total level of organic carbon. For carbonate content percentage, it is more prominent in site nine. While for mod, is more prominent in um, site six, relatively at site five and 12. So, so far, this is um, kind of part of my project for my PhD. And this is just an update for APSI. And this is just showing a kind of um, what I've done so far in terms of my sample and my analysis and my project. Um, basically, I'm working on uh, heavy metals, pesticides, and also using forums as my bioindicator. Apart from the fact I'm using um, other geochemical method for to indicate the pollution level in the Apalachicola Bay. I'm equally using um, forums as my bio indicator to determine the levels of some of these um, elements or pesticide in the Apalachicola Bay. So, so far I'm working currently on pesticide and uh, forums, I'm almost done with my PhD um, um, project or research. So that I've done so far. I will um, at this point want to acknowledge and to thank the following funding sources. I want to appreciate and thank APC. I actually want to ap uh, appreciate and thank that Prime U33. Also, uh, National Academy of Science Love Research Program and uh, Department of Marine Science, ACAT College for the for the radiochemistry. I actually want to thank um, Jason, Ethan, and Dr. George that help doing the field work and for sample collection. Um, thank you so much. Um, let me know if there's any question. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Do we see any questions? Josh, you have your hand up. You want to go ahead and unmute yourself? All right. Adebayo, that was awesome. Thank you. Uh, lots of interesting things there. 
Yeah. One question I had on the, the core where you showed the declining rates towards the present of your heavy metals. Do yeah. you also have the rates of overall mass sediment accumulation? In other words, I'm wondering, is that decrease due to decreasing amounts of sediment or is it due to just decreasing amounts of those metals? Uh, I think if I could get a question, you're saying there's a decrease in the level of metals, correct? Can you repeat your question, please? Yeah, my, my question, I guess, is just does does that decrease that you're seeing in metals, is it due uh -huh. to it like a decrease in concentration uh -huh. or is it a decrease in the overall mass sedimentation rates? Uh, from from what I've done so far, yeah, I think it's a decrease in, in, in the, let me go back to the charts so that I can better understand your question. Yeah, yeah, this is more of decrease in this um on in the levels in the concentration. Gotcha. Okay, thank you. This is yeah, this is really fascinating. There's a lot I'd like to look at. And I, I apologize that I haven't been able to get that other core dated yet, but I still have hopes of getting it done for you so you can fill this picture out a little more. That's right. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, it was great. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay, we also have a question from uh, Preken. Uh, yeah, so thank you so much for your fantastic, fantastic talk. My question is, I observe that you have like the high concentration of this trace metal at size five and size six, if I am not remember it's wrong. And they are, you also observe the high percentage of total organic carbon in these regions. So I'm wondering if the high concentration of metals at this size may be formed due to the selective absorption of these metal ions with total with organic carbon. Or do you think your variations, your spatial variation of the ion concentration is controlled by source between like the river versus ocean yeah um thank you that's a good question um first of all when um like i said when the level of those levels of those chemicals are say five six and twelve uh there's a kind of high level of of um what do you call it now um total organic carbon and that's the similar side too in addition um to really answer your question that will be depends on the uh sequential extraction that will show the uh, the mobility of, the, uh, of, of these um, trace metals that you may talk about. I did um, sequential extraction. It was able to show to me um, um, for the mobility or the state, the state of these uh, trace metals. Um, that for each, I didn't have the data here presented, but it, I was able to get answer your question or to get that through sequential extraction. I hope I answer your question. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. We also have a um, question from Dr. Uh, Martinez Colon. Okay. You did. Hello. So yeah. So um, it's just a comment to address um, um Joshua's question. So uh, for the mass accumulation rates, uh, it has been look at the data. It has been up. Uh, constantly increasing since the 1950s. Um, now, true, at 2012, you have a slight higher increase in sedimentation rate post-2012. Post um, so what Solanka said about that, uh, those changes in those metals is because of concentration. And uh, However, we need to remember that muddy sediments, they behave like sponges when it comes to metals. So I think that what we're seeing is is, is an effect of, of a slight change in mud input and a change in the actual input of uh, trace metals coming uh, down into the bay. So I just wanted to clarify that. Great, thank you. And I see one more question from um, John Tracy, I didn't know if that was just a 
I don't see your question, but I see a question mark. I think that's from before. Okay. All right. Well, it's lunchtime. We don't want to delay delay that anymore. So uh, have a great lunch. We plan to resume at 1245. If you like, we have the Padlet set up um, and you can go in there and read the abstracts and also the emails of all the speakers are there. So we'll see you back at 1245. Hey everybody, welcome back. I'm gonna get us rolling a few seconds early so we can get Josh going on time. Hope everybody had a nice break and is ready for an afternoon full of more informative talks. Our first speaker this afternoon is Dr. Josh Breithaupt from the Florida State University. Uh, Josh will be speaking on comparing mangrove and tidal marsh soil carbon density in Apalachicola Bay. So Josh, if you're ready, take it away. All right. Thanks, Jennifer. And uh, yeah, I just want to echo what a couple other people have said too, which is thanks to, to everybody at Anner for all the work that goes into putting this together and just the, I think the I don't know, the order of the talks has been fantastic. There's just so much context here. And so I am going to talk about sort of the lower end of the, the whole riverine estuarine continuum. I'm going to be out on the barrier islands. And so um, I, I want to start um, by acknowledging co-authors. Uh, and particularly, I want, to, uh, I want to acknowledge Dr. Havlin Steinmuller, who's a postdoc in my lab and who basically took the data that we handed her when she got here last August and turned this into a manuscript and got it submitted. And so this is now uh, a paper that is in review. So um, a great effort on her part getting this together. And then I uh, also wanted to thank other co-authors, including Kevin, who gave an awesome talk earlier today, and Prokin, who's going to talk right after me. So the, the overall objective of this story today is really to give you an insight into what's happening on the barrier islands in terms of carbon and the encroachment of mangroves into these marshes. And if you can see this cool drone photo that uh, Jen Bueno, who's a, an FSU student uh, in the ABSI program at FSU, uh, took for us, you can see mangroves kind of all over the place out here. This is at uh, Pilot's Cove on Little St. George Island. And you can see uh, Dark, the kind of the darker color marsh is the junk is the needle rush, and then scattered throughout when you see the really bright green marsh, that's Spartina. And then we have both red and black mangroves scattered here. And it's just, it's a spectacular system, and there's a lot going on that's really interesting. So I want to begin with a little bit of a backstory, which is that I'm I'm relatively new to FSU. I was interviewing here actually at the beginning of 2020 before COVID broke out. And while I was interviewing, and a couple of people on my committee were sharing with me that mangroves are present here in Apalachicola Bay. And this came as a, a total surprise to me. And I was really intrigued by it, partly because I was one of those people that sort of followed the received wisdom, which is that Cedar Key was kind of as far north as mangroves were found in the Gulf of Mexico and Florida. And so that was great. And then as I got here shortly thereafter, Kate Snyder at, at Aner and all these co-authors published this paper, which came out the beginning of last year, and just a delightful amount of, of information here that really is sort of helping me hit the ground running, building my research program, looking at the impacts of mangroves in this area. And so I'm, I'm not going to really talk much more about this paper, but I highly encourage you to read it if, if you have not already. There's a lot of delightful information about the presence of mangroves in the area, kind of how long they've been here the climate effects and lots of questions that we still have about them. So when I see this kind of transition, this kind of information being shared about mangrove encroachment and expansion, for me, I see almost everything through the lens of carbon cycling. And I want to kind of draw attention to, I've, I've highlighted just a few papers that have been published on this subject. And I would Note that if you look at the, the blue carbon literature, which is that, that literature that's really focused on 
understanding the carbon stored in coastal wetlands. There's kind of this growing body that's like a subset of that literature really focused on these, these interactions that are happening where mangroves are expanding their area and sort of displacing the marshes there. And on the left hand side of the slide, I've got a box model, earth system science perspective on how carbon cycles. And I don't want to belabor the, the details here, but what I want to highlight with this little box model is a reminder that, that CO2 is kind of at the start of all of this, but carbon is prevalent all throughout different aspects of the Earth system. And so whether we start with the atmosphere where we're thinking about CO2 in terms of greenhouse gases and, and uh, greenhouse gas warming um, or methane, um, we also need to remember that CO2 is actually kind of the base of, of life, right? We're, we're carbon-based life forms, whether it's with the plants or the, the herbivores or the different food chains that are there, kind of carbon's a part of all of that. And so you move through whether it's the, the plants in this case being either mangroves or marshes, fixing carbon from the atmosphere. And then as those things mature, senesce and die, it's going to the sediments, which is really a lot of what I focus on, how much is sort of stored in the sediments over long periods of time. But also remembering that a lot of that carbon goes out to the local atmosphere through the aquatic environment. So these are intertidal wetlands. And so whether it's freshwater or saline water, there's carbon in the terms of in, in the form of inorganic or organic carbon that's going out to support food webs or alternatively that's you know providing structure for things like oysters, you know, the calcium carbonate shells that support them, or CO2 in the marine system also drives pH changes too, right? So there's lots of different reasons to be interested in how wetlands are going to affect carbon cycling in the coastal environment. I'm really today focusing on soil um, and, and the blue carbon literature is, is pretty unanimous on this point, which is that if you've ever read a blue carbon paper, the conclusion generally boils down to there's more carbon in the soil than there is above ground. And this is a really nice graphic that, that shows that from Kaufman et al. just a couple of years ago. And a point that's interesting to make here is that great proportion of carbon that's in the soil doesn't necessarily depend on the depth of the soil pores. A lot of times it's actually standardized to one meter. And so the different soil carbon stocks that are there have a lot to do with just what kind of soil is present there. And these three cores that I've shown pictures of on the right kind of give you a good example of what that means because you can see some like that one on the left it's very dense it's very fine particulates like muds and clays whereas that one in the middle is very very peaty so from a percentage standpoint there's lots of carbon in that middle one but it's not as dense as the one on the left and so you end up with these interesting dynamics between how much carbon is actually stored in the soil as a function of the type of soil you have so I am gonna highlight the work that we've been doing on the barrier islands here in Apalachicola Bay, but I want to first start out with this panel, it's kind of the top, that middle uh, map. This is a, an indication of all the research sites that have been done in North America, looking at the encroachment of mangroves onto marshes and the effect on soil carbon specifically. And the thing I want to identify is that if you look at Apalachicola, we have both black and red mangroves present here. And the previous studies, particularly in the northern Gulf of Mexico, that has not been an option. And in the ones like, let's say, in Cedar Key or St. Augustine, those have both mangroves and sometimes they even have white mangroves present, but they don't actually have not historically made comparisons between those um, species level differences with mangroves. And so that was one of our goals here. And so that, that second panel, the lower panel of the map, shows where we chose to do our work. And Basically, these are the places where mangroves are really prevalent. And so we've got Dog Island out to the east. Um, there's a place called Unit 4, which is a, an Aner site that is kind of right near where the bridge comes over onto St. George. And then Pilot's Cove out on Little St. George. And one comment I want to make that's important to think about is that if you look at my picture on the right there at Dog Island, I'm in my happy place standing right in the middle between red mangroves and black mangroves. And you can see I'm towering over them. And that is pretty typical of what you see on Dog Island. They're, they're largely scrubby type of mangroves. Whereas if you look at Pilot's Cove where Kevin's standing over there with the core he's pulling back out of the, out of the mangroves, you can see these are much taller than he is. 
And it's not uncommon to see two and a half to three meter tall uh, mangroves situated out of Pilot's Cove. So there's definitely a landscape difference um, in terms of what's going on with the, the above ground structure. All right, so what we did is at, at each of those three sites then we went out and took cores in each of those dominant vegetation types. So red mangroves and black mangroves, as well as the juncus and the Spartina marshes. And one thing I wanna note is that with, with the mangroves, the black ones tend to be found in pretty thick uh, clusters. And, and with the red mangrove, that's not always the case. And so you can actually sort of see that in this lower left picture where we would we try to identify the places with the most red mangroves clustered together, but you can even see that there are still other marsh grasses sort of lingering and growing under the mangroves. So that, that has to be considered in our comparisons. But what we did is we took 50 centimeter soil cores at each of these places. And after we came back and started doing some analysis on it, we actually are gonna restrict our comparisons, at least for the purposes of the talk uh, today. We're restricting those comparisons just to 20 centimeter depths so that we can minimize the influence of the sand layer, which really alters the density, and the potential previous vegetation shifts. The idea is we wanna just sort of focus on the surface where hopefully the soil signal is most reflective of the dominant vegetation growing at the surface today. So each of those soil cores, we processed those, dried them, homogenized them, and then sent them to uh, Prokin, who's our co-author on this project. And, and he helped, he, and Tom Bianchi's lab basically processing these for analysis of organic carbon, total nitrogen, and then the stable isotopes. And today I'm just gonna talk about the organic carbon in the Del C13. And so here is where we get to the results. And, and the bottom line is um, there's, there's sort of some interesting things going on, but it seems like it's, it's more an environmental set of differences, um, site level differences than it is vegetation. So it's organized by Dog Island, Unit 4, and Pilots Cove, so the three sites. And then the y-axis is the, the mean organic carbon density. Well, they're, they're box plots for organic carbon density with the central line representing the median. And uh, vegetation then is represented by color. So the black box is the, the black mangrove, Abyssinia. The red box is the red mangrove. The blue box is the juncus. And the green one is the Spartina. And so at Dog Island, we do actually see a statistical difference between those taxa so that the red mangrove and the Spartina are not different from one another, but they are different from the Juncus and the Abyssinia. Whereas at the other sites, they're not. And Unit 4 is kind of interesting. Um, I didn't highlight this earlier, but there's, there's no black mangroves present at Unit 4. And so that's not included in that, that comparison, obviously. And then Pilot's Cove is interesting just because you see the huge range in values that we found for each, um, each plant type. So that's a little bit of a mixed picture, but when we take it at the whole regional level, so for instance, if we look at, at bulk density, just, just how much, this is reported in units of grams of sediment per cubic centimeter, so it's just how much, how much sediment fits in a given unit of volume. There's zero differences between these vegetation types. When you look at organic carbon percentage, so this is the grams of organic carbon per gram of sediment, again, no differences. And so when you combine those two to look at carbon density, your eye kind of wants to say that there's some differences, but statistically there's no difference in the amount of carbon that we see in the soil um, across different vegetation types. And what's interesting is that that really kind of supports what the literature is suggesting as well. So this is organized in terms of the results that have been done. This is all over the world where mangroves are encroaching on, on salt marsh. So this includes places in Australia and South Africa. And what I'll mention is that there are many other places like Brazil and China have this going on as well. There just haven't been papers published on the soil carbon impacts yet. Um, this table is kind of organized. So on the left, these are all the locations where the results showed that marsh carbon density was actually greater than mangrove. The middle shows where mangrove and marsh carbon densities were both the same. And then that one on the far right shows places where mangrove was greater than marsh. And you can see by far the, the, the minority says that mangrove is increasing the amount of carbon that's in these, these wetlands. 
and that most are saying they're the same or marshes even vary more. So what's kind of peculiar about that though, is this idea of the sort of the received wisdom or the prevalent expectations that sort of exist in our community. And I will admit that I'm one of those people that when Haviland was presenting the results to me, I was very surprised by them because I, there is just a general sense that mangroves are gonna increase the carbon density of the places that they're moving in on. And so I think what, we went and sort of pulled quotes from the literature to kind of look at like why there's this disconnect between what the data are actually showing from these paper papers and what our overall expectations tend to be in the science community. And I think really what it comes down to is that word time. And so when you go through the papers and look at them, there's sort of two aspects of this. The, the first being that mangroves just haven't been here long enough to really establish themselves with a, a signature, with a growing community, with really getting a lot of litter production, a lot of below ground root production to really start making a change. And so you could sort of argue this is sort of maybe like a, a tortoise and the hare situation where the mangroves have been here much less time than the marshes that have had a chance to really develop and, and get a strong signal in the soils. And mangroves are just gonna need more time to catch up and, and make a difference. The second aspect of time is that this sort of just general looking to the future and thinking about things like climate change and how temperatures and increased atmospheric CO2 are going to influence the productivity of mangroves. And they've been shown to be quite responsive, positively responsive to increasing temperatures and CO2. And so there's a couple of reasons to think that even though our data right now are not showing any real dramatic increases consistently across the board, there's still this expectation that this is going to be something we're gonna see in the future. And I wanna wrap up here with just some observations that are kind of interesting in terms of what the stable isotope signatures tell us. So this is uh, across the x-axis. Um, well, first of all, this is organized again by site. So Dog Island uh, on the left, unit four, and then Pilots Cove. We've got the organic carbon total nitrogen ratios across that x-axis. And then the y-axis is the plotting of del C13. What's nice about the way these vegetation types break out is that Spartina should have a very strong C4 signal. So if you look at that dashed uh, box at the top, that's where Spartina tissue shows up. So uh, above and below ground tissues, it's gonna show up very firmly in that top box. And then the bottom box is where the black needle rush, the red and the black mangroves both should really firmly show up. And so my first observation that I wanna draw your attention to, like let's say we look at Pilot's Cove. If you look at the red, black, or blue boxes, which represent those C3 dominant plants, they're showing up very clearly in the area where we would expect them to. They're all kind of clustered on top of each other in that C3 box. Um, you see kind of the same thing with the red, and the, and the, uh, the red mangroves and the juncus at unit four and then Dog Island gets a little bit messier. I think the key thing to look at is the Spartina actually, because the Spartina should be showing up way in the that top box, but we didn't see any examples of that. Um, in fact, of all of our observations, we only had three that really showed up where we would expect them to. So I wanna remind you what we're looking at. These are the, the values that are found in the soil under where the vegetation is growing in the present day. So this tells us that in the past, things looked a little bit different. And one way to think about this is that Spartina generally represents a low elevation uh, indicator marsh species, whereas the Juncus represents more of a high elevation marsh. And so what this is basically telling us, if you remember that first drone photo I showed you, you could see Spartina out off of the edges actually being basically flooded out. This really looks like a sea level rise signal where you're seeing places that used to be Juncus that are now dominated by Spartina. And as a result, you're seeing this mixing in the soils. And so this raises a couple points that we need to think about. One is, it's not just climate change that is causing vegetation types to move around on, on the barrier islands. Sea level rise also has an effect because the plants have different sweet spots where they like to be in the tidal frame. The other thing to keep in mind is, is more specific to our results, which is that because there's overlap here, it tells us that our statistics when we're trying to compare differences between these vegetation have some sort of um, other factors we need to think about because they're not totally indicative just of that vegetation type. There's, there's some antecedent vegetation that's present. And this is 
going to be a nice lead into uh, Prokin's talk coming after mine because he's got some really cool things that he can do with specific biomarkers. And uh, I guess if, if I have time, Jenna, just for the, the conclusion slide, um, what I want to make the big emphasis here is I, I mentioned earlier, this is me sort of building my research program. I want to emphasize that when you look at this from an ecosystem scale, we talk a lot about soil carbon, but if you look at this pie chart, burial represents a very small fraction of how much carbon is in the, the fate of carbon in wetlands. In fact, most of it, 75% of it or more, goes back out to the aqueous environment, DIC, POC, or DOC. And that to me is the question that's gonna get really interesting. Think back to Jay's talk starting the day, just thinking about the export of these carbon products, including pH and alkalinity, out to the bay environment and how that's gonna affect things. And so I'll, I'll wrap it up there. If I do have time for questions, I'll take them. If not, I apologize and I'll be happy to take emails. Thank you. No, thank you. And this is super interesting. I mean, we could just go on for like an hour. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Um, I, I think we have maybe time for one quick question or um, we can maybe encourage folks to, let's see, I see it. Quick, all right, Jay, go. You got quick, quick time. Just, just real quick, uh, Josh, do you have any idea of how long you might think it would take for the, these, um, the mangroves to start showing up within the forest, just like speculating? Well, we're hoping to get at that actually with, with Prokin's work. So we're, we're trying to date some of these cores and then with some biomarkers, hopefully get a better idea of sort of how long it takes for the dominant signal to start to show up. But I don't have a good answer yet. Okay, cool, thanks. Great, thank you so much, Josh. Really appreciate it. And we'll go ahead and, and transition to uh, Dr. Prokin, also of Panuvat, and um, he'll continue on with a presentation on mangrove invasion of salt marshes in Apalachicola Bay, and specifically the role of reactive iron complexation on organic carbon burial. And uh, Prokin, if you are ready to go, I'll let you take it away. Thank you. All right. Good afternoon. So let me try to control my presentation. OK, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today, I will talk about the mangrove invasion of salt marshes in the Apalachicola Korea Bay. The role of reactive iron complexations on organic carbon burials. So before I start, I would like to say sorry. I would like to express my gratitude on my source of funding from John and Mary Thompson in the share of geological size. And I really appreciate every help from Bright Tower Lab member during my field trip and sample preparation. So in general, coastal margin represents just a very small area in global area cover, but it is account for as high as 80 to 90% of marine carbon burials. And most of this carbon in this ecosystem are stored in sediment. So oh, we, it is a pool that we need to analyze for. And this ecosystem includes mangrove and salt marsh community, which both accounted for high amounts of carbon storage. And in general, mangrove may have a little bit higher carbon storage compared with salt marsh. So the reason why we need to care about mangrove and salt marsh is because nowadays the habitat range of this vegetation are now shifting. For example, because of warming temperature, mangrove habitat range in eastern coast of United States are now expanding northward, and they are encroaching into the former South Marsh community. And this phenomenon is called wetland tropicalization, and is what also observed in Apalachicola Bay. And this one is especially important in Apalachicola Bay because this is the highest latitude that we found both establishment of red and black mangroves together on the eastern coast of United States. And here is the reasons why we need to care about this vegetation shift. Basically, 
every vegetation type has unequal roles in controlling of the carbon storage in coastal wetland ecosystem. According to this figure, these four species are the dominant vegetation types that we could found in Apalachicola bio Island. And basically, the effect of this plant community in controlling organic carbon storage may depend on a lot of local conditions, such as the maturity of the forest. But in general, mangroves tend to have higher rates of carbon accumulation as due to the input of recalcitrant organic carbon relative to the South Marsh community. Moreover, mangrove, especially the black mangrove or the Abyssinia germinans, tend to develop larger oxidizing rhizosphere relative to the red mangrove and the South Marsh's taxa. This oxidizing rhizosphere may lead to more extensive decomposition of organic carbon because the oxygen that will leak out of this plant root could be utilized as terminal electron acceptor of organic carbon decomposition pathway. Moreover, this oxygen leakage could also lead to the formation of reactive ions, organic carbon association, as known as FERORC. So basically, Iron class two is the disulfate of iron that stay in the water as well as this dissolved organic carbon. However, when these compounds will react with oxygen, iron plus two would be oxidized to iron plus T and forming iron oxyhydroxide minerals. And this iron oxyhydroxide solid phase will binding with organic carbon into FER or C and increase the preservation potentials of organic carbon inside the oxic environment. In contrast, if this complexation was reduced, both reactive iron will be released to add iron plus two and organic carbon will be released back to the environment. So my major research question is because of wetland tropicalization that the previous South Marsh were replaced by the recent mangrove community. Will this mechanism affect organic carbon burials and preservation in Apalachicola wetland? So my major objective is to analyze Dow core change in this parameter to identify the source of organic carbon as well as evaluate the amounts of organic carbon storage as well as the fractions of organic carbon that was bound to reactive iron in Apalachicola Bay sediment. So in order to identify the source of organic carbon, I use Delta C13. So basically, red mangrove, black mangrove, and Janka South Marsh are CT vegetations, while Spartanar South Marsh is C4 vegetation, which tend to accumulate larger amount of C13 in their biomass. So when this vegetation die and deposit their biomass as a part of organic carbon in sediment, the sediment that's what made by Spartina tends to be more enriched in the C13 relative to the sediment from this vegetation. I also use lignin biomarker to differentiate woody mangrove from non-woody cell mass generated organic carbon. And then I quantify the amount of organic carbon storage in these sediments by measuring both total organic carbon and total nitrogen. I also analyze the amounts of FERC by taking up the bow sediment and using citrate dithionide bicarbonate extraction mechanism to break down the bond between reactive ions and organic carbon and release this thing out into the dissolved form. So I'm measuring the amount of dissolved iron in here and measuring the amount of residuals of organic carbon in this sediment and then determine the amount of organic carbon that was bound to reactive irons by subtract the carbon in here from the control experiment. This is the map that's explained showing my research area. So this is the map of distribution of reds and black mangrove 
and obtained from Snyder at uh, 2021. My study area is located on Pilot's Curve, and as you can see in this map, this is the distribution of black mangrove and the red mangrove, which is kind of patchy because of because these vegetation are recently established in this bay, and we took one sediment core from the man, black mangrove dominated regions and another sediment core and the need red mangrove dominated regions to analyze for biomarker. And here is my result. So this profile represents changing in the chemical composition of sediments with depth. The black line represents the sediment core that was obtained from black mangrove dominated regions and the red line represents the data from red mangrove dominated sediments. So first, let's take a look at the percent total organic carbon. As you can see, according to this figure, the total organic carbon decreased with depth in both red mangrove and black mangrove core. This may represent the gradual decomposition of organic carbon with time, or another possible cause is there may be higher input of recalcitrant organic carbon on the top of the core by the input of mangrove material. And if we take a look at the changing in the C13 with depth, you can see that in the deeper part of the core, as I highlight in the orange box over here, in both red and black mangrove core, the C13 is more enriched relative to the shallower part of the core. It could be implied that the major source of organic carbon in the deeper part of the core is the C4 spartina materials. And then after vegetation shift, the dominant source of organic carbon was shifted to mangrove derived CT materials in the shallower part of the core, reflected by the more depleted the C13. And then let's take a look at the liquid biomarker. Here are the data that I obtained from the black mangrove core. First, you can, you can see that the CV or the cinnamyl per vanillus lignin phenols decreased in the shallower part of the core, while SV ratio increased in the shallower part of the core. These two parameters indicate the strong input of woody mangrove material. So this one is another evidence to show the replacement of mangrove, but the replacings of mangrove into the former South Marsh communities. If we take a look at the acidic per aldehyde vanilla lignin ratio, you can see the higher acid per aldehyde ratio in the middle part of the core that might suggest stronger oxidation decompositions of organic carbon. The most interesting part of this slide is if we take a look at the summation of these three lignin oxidation products normalized by 100 mg of sediment, we can see that the total lignin co content is higher in the shallower part of the core. This may reflect that in recent days, this sediment has that got the higher input of lignin from lignin enriched development, lignin enriched organic carbon from recently developed mangrove community. So, as you can see in this figure, this is the this cartoon represent the situation that happened in red in black mangrove community. So this mangrove produce a lot of fresh detritus that are enriched in lignins and organic carbon. And when this detritus deposits on the sediment surface, it will increase organic carbon content as well as lignin content in the shallower part of the black mangrove core. In contrast, if we take a look at the data obtained from red mangrove core, the CV and SDV ratio did not change significantly with depth as well as the summation of lignin per milligram of sediment. In contrast, if I normalize the total contents of lignin by milligram of organic carbon, we observe that the total lignin normalized by milligram of organic carbon is lower in the shallower part of the core. This may reflect that during this 
apart during this accumulation period, organic carbon was diluted by another input of organic carbon, which one of the possible source is the degraded soil material as reflected by higher contents of dicarboxylic benzoic acid. So what's happened in red mangrove habitat is there was some outlarge turnout degraded soil organic carbon that was transported to these regions and maybe deposited in this prop root, uh, in this prop root deposition of size of raised mangrove core. So these soil particles are already degraded and contain less amounts of lignin relative to the one that's deposited underneath the black mangrove core. That is why we got lower lignin in the shallower part of raised mangrove core. And then this is the amount of organic carbon that was bound to reactive ions. We detect higher amounts of organic carbon that was bound to reactive ions in the shallower part of black mangrove core. This may reflect that in this black mangrove community, the fresh material that's deposited down into the sediment react with oxygen that was leaking out from the extensive oxidizing rhizosphere of black mangrove. So they form FEROC complexation in situ. And this data supports that like this reactive iron here could enhance the organic carbon preservation in this root zone. In contrast, if we take a look at the data obtained from the red mangrove core, the total amount of organic carbon that was bound to reactive iron is much lower than what we observe in the black mangrove core. However, the amount of reactive iron in here is much higher than the black mangrove core, which means that in the shallower part of the red mangrove core, there was the depositions of the reactive iron that are not bound to organic carbon. So one of the ex one of the possible explanation of this mechanism is there was the trapping of outlaw of soil particles that are made of reactive iron solid particles that do not contain organic carbon. This is why we have a lot of reactive iron in here, but we don't have as much organic carbon relative to the black mangrove core. So finally, I also analyzed the delta C13 in the organic carbon that was bound to reactive iron. So comparing with the bounce organic carbon, the organic carbon residuals from this extraction is more enriched in the C13 compared to the bounce organic carbon. It could be implied that the portion that was released out is more depleted in the C13 relative to the bounce organic carbon. It's leaked this could be related to the preferential retentions of terrestrial organic carbon by reactive iron. So this one supporting that the reactive iron's organic carbon compensation was formed in situ underneath both core. So here are my preliminary conclusion on my research. So first, we detect the inputs of we detect the changing in organic carbon source from South Marsh to mangrove by using the delta C13 and lignin biomarker. And then we also detect that soil is another important source of organic carbon in this resources in this bled mangrove habitat. And we also observe that the invasion of black mangrove may potentially increase organic carbon storage in this ecosystem by the input of recalcitrant lignose lignin materials and as well as the development of large oxidizing rhizosphere that could lead to the formation of reactive irons or carbon complexation. And this is my reference of my work today. So do you have any questions? Are there any questions for Prakin? Don't see any hands raised. I'm trying to get the question bar box. I don't see anything in the question box. Just 
checking, checking again. No, nope, I don't see any currently. Well, you might be off the hook, Brock. <laughs> Brock. Um, if anyone thinks of anything they'd like to ask him after, again, uh, please use the uh, Padlet and uh, we'll connect back to him. And um, unless Jeff has a question. Oh, I was just getting ready. I was. You were just I getting ready. <laughs> not blow it. <laughs> Okay, so, well, thank you very much, Proc, and we appreciate you presenting today. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for organizing this talk. Mm -hmm. All right, so next up we have Dr. Jeff, Jeff Chanton from the Florida State University, and he will be summarizing work that he's done over the last 25 years looking at Apalachicola Bay stable isotopes. Okay, so thank you. can you hear me okay? Yes, sir. Okay. Oh, and, and my mouse is showing up on the screen too. All right, so thank you all very much. And this is an isotope comparison over 30 years and uh, brought to you by myself, Samantha Bozeman, Barry Walton, Colin Morris, Adam Alfonso, and Sandra Brook. And the funding is from the ABSI program. And how do I advance the slide? Oh, there it goes. All right, so um, the objectives of this study are to compare I stable isotope composition indicators that were collected in 2020 to 2021 with similar data that was collected way back in 1992 to 94. And we want to test the hypothesis that the primary production that supports secondary production and organic carbon inputs to Apalachicola Bay has shifted towards a greater proportion of organic matter of marine origin as opposed to riverine terrestrial origin over 30 years because we think that the river flow has decreased and so the bay has gotten saltier and more marine and the organic carbon inputs would reflect that. That is the hypothesis we are testing. Okay, so stable isotopes. We are blessed by these uh, wonderful tracers that are out there in nature and all we have to do is, is collect samples and measure them and look at the sources. And each, uh, the elements of life are carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, and sulfur. And it's amazing that each one of these elements of life has a stable isotope pair. So in each case, one has a main atom that's like for carbon, carbon 12, 98% abundant, and carbon 13 is 1% abundant. For hydrogen, hydrogen one is 99.98% .98 abundant, and deuterium, that's hydrogen two, is a trace. Nitrogen has 14 and 15, oxygen has 16 and 18, and sulfur has 32 and 34. And always the lower weight of the isotope is the main abundance. And the higher, the heavier isotope is trace. That's the pattern that I'm referring to. And so today we're gonna to look at carbon and sulfur. Okay, so food web studies. You are what you eat, plus or minus one per mil. That works well for carbon 13 and sulfur 34. And so let's talk about what determines the carbon-13 content of a primary producer. It's the plant photosynthetic pathway and the CO2 source. For sulfur, it's just a sulfur source, okay? So these kind of things, there's a lot of variability out there and there's particularly good variability for terrestrial versus marine sources. Uh-oh. Um, okay, there, thank you. <laughs> so during photosynthesis, and this is showing you a leaf, plants preferentially incorporate the lighter isotope. So the atmospheric composition of CO2 is around minus seven, and plants fractionate it. They take up the lighter isotope, the carbon-12, faster, and so it becomes more negative. Minus 26 is the carbon isotope signature for terrestrial organic matter. And what that indicates is a depletion of C13. We always speak about enrichment or depletion of the heavy isotope. So terrestrial organic matter is depleted in 13C relative to atmospheric CO2 because of plant photosynthetic processes. Whoops. And uh, marine phytoplankton, oh, I should have said also that terrestrial organic matter has a sulfur isotopic composition of around zero. That's because of the source of the sulfur is terrestrial sulfur and that's around zero per mil. 
Marine phytoplankton, on the other hand, the main marine primary producer, has a C13 signature of around minus 20, so that's 13C enriched relative to terrestrial organic matter, and a sulfur isotopic composition of plus 20, that's very enriched relative to terrestrial organic matter. So we can distinguish these kind of things in nature. And let's see if this little cartoon works. So here's a fish and it's terrestrial in origin and we're hypothesizing that over time, it's gonna get more marine in origin because of the change in the river flow as depicted in this graphic. I hope you all saw that. I don't know if it will do it again. And so here we have another, some real, some data, and this goes from Apalachicola down to Florida Bay. And we have C13 on this axis, and we have sulfur on this axis. And the Apalachicola Bay is up here in the black squares, and you notice that it's very terrestrial relative to other samples along the coast of Florida. It's depleted in 13C, minus 25 up here. It's enriched in sulfur. Hmm. And as we go across down this gradient, the carbon-13 gets more and more enriched as, and the sulfur gets more enriched. That's because of uh, increasing benthic production. So we can use these isotopes to distinguish the sources of organic matter that fuel secondary production. And what we're looking for in Apalachicola Bay is a change over time. So we're going to measure C13, N15, and sulfur-34 on organic matter from sediments, oysters, fish, and plankton in 2020 to compare that with 1990. And I'm going to show you some preliminary results because uh, it's been a challenge to get everything run with COVID and some instrumental issues and so forth and so on. But what we have is a very similar uh, study resulting so far to the one that we saw at 11 o'clock by uh, Dr. Kevin Engelbert and um, Josh Reithup. So uh, in the 1990s, we measured the organic carbon composition of the sediments. This is on a carbonate-free basis. And there's Apalachicola. And you can see that they were around 2% organic matter, as high as 3% out here in the middle of the bay. And that is considerably higher than the uh, 19, I guess it was 1960 studies that um, Dr. Engelbert showed, if I'm saying that right, earlier in the uh, program today. So from 1960 to 1990, the organic carbon values went up. And then we made some more measurements in 2020, and they've gone up further as was shown in the earlier study. So these two studies are actually confirming each other. And so they must have some semblance of of um, reality about them. Here's the organic carbon content in 2020. And you can see that it's gone up. And then our next contour, come on. If it would just advance. Oh, too far. We skipped a bunch of stuff there. Okay, so this is the change in organic carbon content from 1990 to 2020. And as shown in the other study, this is a completely independent study using a different uh, historical study and a different modern study. We have kind of very similar results. And you can see that the organic carbon content has gone up in the middle of the bay by about one to one and a half percent. And interestingly enough, these contours are, are not accurate. They're based on very little data. But up here in East Bay, along the marsh, it was actually sandier in 2020 than it was in 1990. And I wonder if that isn't because of erosion of those marshes due to rising sea level, leaving behind sand and the uh, peat is getting washed out. So we have more sand up here and more organic rich muds down here in the central part of the bay. Next slide. And this just shows this in colorful graphics. And I want to thank Adam for um, doing all these graphics for us. Um, so here we see that the organic carbon content, if it's in green, it's increased. If it's in hot colors, it's decreased. And so mostly we see a lot of green squares indicating greater organic carbon content in the middle of the bay over 30 years. And now we're going to compare the 13C 
of the sedimentary organic matter. And remember that minus 26 is more terrestrial and minus 20 is more marine, in indicative of more marine organic matter. So here we have 1990, here we have 2020, and it is getting more negative. Okay, so this shows the contours of that. And basically, everywhere it looks like it's more negative. And that is indicative of greater inputs of terrestrial organic matter. And that's inconsistent with our hypothesis that we would observe greater inputs of marine organic matter. So it looks like, if anything, the um, carbon flux from the river might be increasing. And there is that in brilliant colors, and you can see that the colors are dominated by negative values, red values, indicating the increasing, consistent with the hypothesis of increasing terrestrialization of the bay rather than more marine inputs of carbon to the bay sediments. Okay, I have a few fish data to show you. Um, the 2020 croakers are in purple and the 1990 croakers are in blue. And this C13 is indicating that the 2020 croakers are more terrestrial because they are more negative, minus 21, as opposed to minus 18 values in 1990. But if you look at the error bars, you can see that this is not a significant difference. And here are the sulfur isotope values for some of those same croakers, or those exact same croakers, I should say. And the 2020 ones are more marine than the 1990 ones. This is the opposite trend. They're not significantly different anyway. And so there is no evidence in these croakers to show that there is increasing marine influence on the food web of Apalachicola Bay. And we'll look briefly at a few oysters. We have more coming in. But the oysters in 1990s were considerably more terrestrial than the oysters in 2020, as indicated by carbon-13. However, as indicated by sulfur, there's essentially no difference. But if there was a difference, it would suggest that the 2020 oysters are more marine, which is the opposite trend. So therefore, you have to conclude that there is scant evidence to support the hypothesis that the primary production supporting secondary production in Apalachicola Bay has shifted towards a greater proportion of organic matter of marine origin. And so the hypothesis is not supported so with the data so far. And it seems like, if anything, there's a greater input of terrestrial organic matter to the sediments of the bay. And that's all I have to say about that. And I'm sorry that I am so far ahead of time. No, that was great. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Uh, do we have any questions for Dr. Chanton? I do, Jen. I'm not seeing a hand, so I didn't raise it. <laughs> uh, Go ahead, Steve. Uh, uh, I was curious if the terrestrial contribution, I'm assuming, comes mostly from river flow, and would it be at the higher flows that you'd be getting most of the contribution? Oh, certainly. That's certainly the case. I would agree with that. And so I'm wondering is, is that if with climate change and expecting more extreme that we're going to be seeing a lot more high flows coming in and such, are we going to be seeing a continued trend towards increasing of the terrestrial source if we're getting more uh, erratic flows and more higher flood events in the Apalachicola? Well, yeah. I mean, if you have those, if you have exceptionally high floods and it sweeps the floodplain and brings it all down to the bay, then that would certainly um, be consistent with that hypothesis. Because I know since 2012, we've had fairly wet situation after having those extreme droughts with a lot of flood events. And I'm wondering if that isn't contributing to some of what you're seeing in your data. Yeah, certainly. I think it could. Would that then suggest that the uh, demise of the oyster population is not due to the uh, resource limitation of floodplain? Vegetation? Well, I would go to the oyster people to ask them. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're the only one that's talking to me, so I have to ask you. Okay. What would you say about that? Uh, 
I think that the floodplain has been getting inundated more, and we're getting the contribution. And it shows with your data, and it shows with other stuff. So it's the whole thing's a lot more complicated than people try to make it. So it would seem. Thank you, Steve. Okay. Uh, it looks like we had a question from Susan Farmer. I don't know if Susan, you still want to ask your question. You can take yourself off mute. Go ahead. Uh, am, can you hear me? Yeah. 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 So I am very new to the science. But, um, I guess it confused me that it looked like there was more coming organic matter coming from terrestrial origins since there has been so much concern about reduced water coming down the river. And so my my question I think maybe kind of segues into the the last question. So do you have a any further comments on that? Well we were just looking at this indicator to see if there is a decrease in terrestrial organic matter to the bay system. And it would seem that there's no evidence for that decrease. And yeah. so uh, Steve suggested that even though the, the river flow is lower, that it's more flashy. And so that if it's flashier, then you'd have these periods of high flow that would still sweep the floodplain and, and inundate the floodplain and bring the leaves and the organic matter down to the bay. And that would seem that it's almost happening more because both these sedimentary studies that contrasted different baselines have come to the same conclusion that there's more organic carbon in the sediments of the bay than there used to be. And um, it's, it's, it's pretty cool that we both got the same result. And, and, yeah, and the isotopes indicate that it's of terrestrial origin. And so, yeah, it, it just, you know, it, but there could still be less flow but if it's the flow is distributed in a more flashy, uh, uneven fashion, that that could explain it. So I was wondering, Steve, if there's time to, if there's no other questions, maybe you could say what evidence is there that the the flow is flashier and that it is still sweeping the floodplain. Well, first of all, I don't think there's that much evidence that there's less flow. We've had more extreme drought events, is what it is. Mm -hmm. and so it depends on how you consider less. If you look at the more like the 25 or the 10% exceeded flows or the 90% or whatever. And, and so I don't think there's necessarily been less flow is that there's been more drought events and there's a difference between the two. Yeah. And then it's also been, if you look at the data, it's been a lot more flashier. Yeah. So that we're having these long periods of dry and then we're having these sweeping events of high and so the flashiness is the is an issue mm -hmm. and, and one of my comments that i made in my presentation was is when they developed the water control manual they looked at the historic pattern and if we're going to get in it more flashy and all that the way they're managing the reservoirs is tuned to historic flow and if in the future we're going to have more flashy and different flows, it's not going to work. We need to change it. Jeff, I got uh, one more comment and then a couple of questions. Uh, Josh, you want to come off mute and ask her a question or make your comment? Uh, I'd love to. Uh, Jeff, that was delightful. And I, I agree with you. It's actually, I breathed a huge sigh of relief to see that your numbers were I'm doing the same things our words were. Well, I breathed a huge sigh of relief to see your numbers were doing the same thing. <laughs> um, one thing, we just poked at the stable isotopes, but when I, we looked at them the other day, it matches your 92 numbers uh, really well, but it does seem like there's each contour basically decreases by one part per mil moving seaward. Mm -hmm. um, so supporting that story too, we just haven't looked at it enough. And I guess one follow-up question is just, does that detrital signal have to come from the floodplain? Could it come from the distributary marshes? So you talked about like that sand signal potentially being more erosion uh, of the lower marshes. Could that just be increasing 
Oh, that's brilliant. Yeah, of course. That's a really good idea. If we're just eroding the marshes because of higher sea level, mm -hmm. you know, which I believe, like, I just caught the end of your talk because I had to teach my class and you were talking about how the marsh vegetation was shifting because of sea level rise. And I believe that I can see it every time I go down there. It yeah. seems like the sea level is higher. And so, yeah, erosion of the marshes, that's a really good idea. Yeah. It that's would look cool. that. It would look just like that. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. We should put right, those like, studies together into one thing. I think we should. Yeah, we should definitely follow up and talk. This was great. Yeah. Right. Okay, I got a couple more, Jeff. Hang tight. Sure, sure. Um, so, a question from John Tracy: Do you think that slough restoration efforts in the in the floodplain can have traceable inputs of organic matter to the bay through continued monitoring of the stable isotopes? Uh, well, you mean like so that would suggest that by restoring those sloughs that the organic matter composition would go further terrestrial and further increase if we were to restore the sloughs. I don't know if that would be detectable or not, but it might be. I mean, we definitely need further study of this of this bay. <laughs> Sounds good. And then um, one last question um, from Chad Hansen. You know that guy. <laughs> uh, Jeff, uh, he says, thanks for the great presentation. Can you discuss the ecological significance on the macro level, for example, fishes, on the continued terrestrial origin of secondary production versus a shift towards marine origin? So I, I, I think he's probably getting at that the marine organic matter is of higher nutritional value than the terrestrial organic matter. And so, um, is that what you're thinking, Chad? Chad, do you want to like, come off mute and clarify? Yeah, come on, Chad. Hi, the, yeah, I'm here. Hey, hey, yeah. Chad. Thanks, yeah, Chad. hi. Hey, good talk. Now, I was, I was actually just thinking like, so what's the significance? Like what put it in the context for the Bay? And is this a con this continue or this continuation of a of the terrestrial origin seem to be a good thing because it's maintaining the historical natural con mm -hmm. connectivities or would it have been, um, you know, if there's a more marine influence, would that provide more of an ecological benefit to to the Bay system with the, um, the shift in organics? So I was just thinking, you know, what's what's it mean for the bay productivity overall in the in the macro things like fishes? Mm -hmm. Well, I don't think that probably the you know it doesn't seem like the marine organic matter would necessarily lessen, but what we're getting is more terrestrial organic matter, and so I you know I think that what it seems to point at, and I'm wildly speculating here, is just more organic inputs to the bay overall. So that would tend to increase productivity, right? Right. Unless they aren't, you know, I, I presume they're selective feeders. Of course they're selective feeders. And they're gonna like go for the marine organic matter over the terrestrial organic matter. They have to spend more time picking through things perhaps. But you would know more about right. that than I. <laughs> yep. Yeah, so just if the shift was at the opposite of what you've seen, it would have been less productivity and, and uh, less, I guess, overall, if you want to put it in colloquial terms, healthy bay system. If, if what so, now? Say that again? I said if you were seeing the opposite day, um, results, if you're showing that there's a reduction in the terrestrial origin, and the, um, that would indicate that the, the health of the bay, because it's reduced productivity, might be decreasing, right. but this means it yeah. might actually be still maintaining. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Th thanks so much, Jeff. Appreciate it so much. We need to transition to our next talk. Yeah. Um, there was one more question. And so um, I'm going to ask if Ethan can maybe put that on the Padlet and um, maybe you guys could answer, you could answer that offline. Um, but I'd like to transition now to uh, Matt Davis, who is with the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. And he is going to give an update on the status of oysters within Apalachicola Bay. Take it away, Matt. 
Hi, Jen. Thanks for, for having me. You can hear me all right? Yep. All right. Good deal. Um, like Jenna said, my name is Matt Davis. I'm the lab manager for the Apalachicola Field Labs Molluscan Fisheries Research. Um, and yeah, I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit about the oysters um, in Apalachicola Bay. There we go. All right, so everyone's familiar um, with Apalachicola Bay oysters. They've been long um, touted um, as probably some of the greatest oysters in the country. Um, back in the 80s, 90s, and early 2000s, Apalachicola actually provided about 90% of Florida's oysters. But in 2012, the oyster fishery collapsed. And in the years following, oyster landings continued to decline until FWC commissioners took the step of closing the bay for a five-year period starting in 2020. So, in response to the 2012 collapse, a lot of money became available to begin monitoring Apalachicola Bay oysters. Up until 2015, the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services, or FDACs, oversaw providing population estimates to managers. Those responsibilities shifted to FWC, specifically my group in FWRI in 2015. And today I'm gonna to give you a big picture view of what's going on in the system. I'm gonna briefly talk about our oyster population surveys, as well as recent and future restoration efforts. So our monitoring occurs throughout the Bay on historic oyster reefs. We have 15 stations spread out across the Bay and the bay itself is divided into three sections with each having five stations. So a west, central, and east um, portion of the bay. There we go. And so at each of these stations, we carry out our oyster surveys twice a year in the spring and in the fall. Each station is subtitle, which means that all of our surveys are done by scuba diving. The image in the upper right is about what we can see on a clear day. A diver will take a quarter meter quadrat down and collect the surface material of whatever is in that quadrat, placing it in a catch bag like the one in the bottom left, and bringing it back to the boat um, where we process it and put all the material back when we're done. So what are we looking for in these quadrats? Well, we weigh each sample, measure the shell heights of the oysters we find, count all the live and recently dead oysters, as well as any oyster drills that we find. All right, so what do the average densities look like in the past seven years? Well, this graph shows the average oyster density for each section of the bay for each of the spring and fall surveys. And you can see that the densities tend to be higher in the central and east sections of the bay. Sometimes recent oyster settlement can actually make it difficult to see overall patterns in abundance. For instance, what looks like a giant population explosion there in 2017 is actually the result of a decent settlement of spat just before the survey took place. This pushed the total density up, but as most spat die in their first year, it didn't result in a sustained population increase. So when we look at just the legal size oysters, these are oysters that are of a shell height of three inches or greater, we can see the population decline more easily. When you compare 2015 and 2016's numbers to those in 2019 and 2020, the decline is pretty easy to see. In 2020, um, you'll note we have an asterisk there in the spring. Um, we didn't complete the Central Bay survey due to COVID, but the reason the West and East surveys don't show up is that we didn't find any legal oysters on those bars. Now we have seen an increase in densities in 2021, but it's important to consider these numbers in context. And to do that, uh, this is the same graph from the previous slide, but it is now scaled to what is sustainable numbers should be. So FDAC's guidelines before the fishery crash stated that an area needed 400 or more bags per acre to be a sustainable reef. That translates to about 22 legal oysters per square meter. The highest numbers that we saw were back in 2016 and our densities were less than three. That's about one seventh of what a sustainable reef needs. 
and even the small gains of last year don't get us anywhere close to a limited harvest limit. So things look pretty bad, right? Well, how has FWC been working to address the situation? Well, through the oil spill sediment funds granted through the National Fish and Wildlife Federation, or NIFWF, FWC has been working on the largest oyster restoration project in state history. Both of these are large projects and time is limited, so I don't have uh, enough time to explain them fully. So I'm just gonna give you guys the brief cliff notes. Essentially, phase one sought to find out how much culture we should put out and where we should put it. After four years of monitoring and analysis, we found that 300 cubic yards per acre provided the best balance of oyster density with cost. You can culch at higher densities, but you reach a plateau of diminishing returns as extra culch ends up being buried and not being available for oysters to recruit upon. Now through mapping, we found that the central and oyster bars were the best candidates for restoration as they had remnant populations nearby and still had shallow areas that had not been silted over. Now, using that knowledge, we carried out a restoration pilot project last year, which I'll touch on in a moment. But phase two, we'll build on what we've learned and done in phase one to work to restore up to 1,000 acres of oyster habitat. It's already completed the mapping of the existing oyster bars in the bay, and we'll begin working with stakeholders to develop a management framework for the bay. So for our restoration pilot project, three areas were chosen to receive culch material consisting of crushed limestone deployed via barge. These areas were identified as having relatively shallow firm bottom with existing remnant populations relatively close by to provide spat. This is an image of the material we put out, which is Kentucky blue limestone number four. Photo on the left, is material that's getting ready to go out um, and, number, and the photo to the right is material from the 2017 restore project and the material that was put out in 2017 is the ident is identical to what we put out last year and as you can see um, well the aquatic preserve has been monitoring those restore sites uh, for the past five years and as you guys can see there are our actually oysters um, on uh, that material. So it's um, shown that it you know, can support oyster settlement. It's adorable. This material was put down almost five years ago and it's still there. Uh, it's small enough to be tongueable and it's also available. I'm gonna give you guys an idea of what, a, what the barge uh, culching entails. The general process is um, that of barges moving culch material to the restoration site. So the quarry fills hopper barges. These are these large barges with about 1,700 cubic yards of material. Those barges make their day way down the Mississippi through the intercoastal and anchor near our restoration site. Excavators then move the culch from the large hopper barges to deck barges, which hold about 200 cubic yards. Those deck barges are then pushed by tugs to the pump barge at the restoration site. Pump barge attaches to that deck barge and positions, positions itself over the restoration site. And then using water cannons, the crew deploys the material on the reefs that we selected. And a skilled crew can empty the entire deck barge in about 20 minutes which means this is the most cost-effective method of deploying our culture material. Now, about a month after the material was deployed, FSU provided us with some post-deployment side scans of the area where we deployed material. We covered about 10 acres on each of the three bars, and you can see the light areas in this scan are those with hard returns coming back from that hard limestone surrounded by the areas in blue, which are much softer. So how has this material been performing? Well, we will be sampling the restoration sites on a quarterly basis and have already completed two of the post-restoration surveys. 
you can see a pretty clear difference between the May survey we did before deploying any cultch. There were practically no oysters and the sample weight was low because it was only comprised of broken up shell hash. After the culching, sample weights were much higher because there was well, actual substrate to sample and the rocks are quite heavy and dense. Oyster numbers were also high as the rock was fresh and we had a good spat set. Now, 99% of the spat will die, but as you can see in the photo to the right, I took just last week, we still have a good number of small oysters alive on the cultch. So, in conclusion, oyster populations do remain at historic lows, but the NIFWF Phase Two project, uh, which will be the largest oyster restoration project in Apalachicola Bay, is moving forward and using a recipe that for success that means using what we know, like culching at moderate densities, using the resilient, affordable substrate, and deploying where we know, know oysters already are and can survive. So with that, uh, if anyone has any questions, I would be happy to attempt to answer them. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. All right, do we have any questions for him? Not seeing anything currently in the box. And I'm not seeing any hands raised. Oh, wait, Emily White. Emily White has a question. Go ahead, Emily. Hello, hello. So I am a junior um, in high school in Georgia, and I am um, incredibly interested in oyster restoration um, projects. And I was wondering how you came to find that the Kentucky Blue Limestone was the most um, efficient substrate for restoration purposes. Well, um, the, the Kentucky Blue is, well, number one available. Um, you know, really the best thing that oysters love to grow on are other oysters and oyster shell that as many people might know is kind of hard to come by um, and even things like fossilized shell um, there really isn't any available um, so what it really came down to is that we needed something that was affordable um, and that lasted a long time and that harder limestone does just that um, so hopefully we're going to be getting multiple years of recruitment on that material rather than maybe one or two before it kind of falls apart like um, oyster shell can do. It's got about a half life of about five years um, after you deploy it, whereas this looks to be, you know, a little bit longer of a half life. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. So uh, we have another question. Uh, Ethan, you want to ask your question? What, what, what do you recommend? I mean, what? We might need to, need to mute somebody, Kennedy. Yep. Uh, thank you. Emily, I was going to say, great question. And I think uh, Dr. Andy Kane might touch on that in a couple presentations also. So uh, more there. Um, I see a question or, co or comment from Rick Harder. He said he would like to contact you later to chat about Kentucky Blue Limestone. And from John Tracy, in my experience, the other type of stone readily available is much more prone to dissolve and break down. So again, confirming Kentucky blue is, is it? <laughs> it's what you can get when the cheaper materials, it performs well. Any other questions? Let's see, Ethan has his hand raised, but um... Not getting a uh, reply back. There he is. Ethan, you should be unmuted now. Oh, okay. Uh, so I was going to ask if Davis knew why the restoration method of 
bring out spat on shell in areas such as dry bar where you haven't found oysters presently, but where historically they were to kind of jumpstart those reefs that don't have other populated reefs in a close vicinity. Yeah, that is one possibility. Um, and I know that was a method that they used in Chesapeake to help jumpstart um, areas there. The uh, limitation with that is money. Um, you know, that works, but it's not cheap. Um, and right now there is really a limited number of hatcheries that can actually provide the amount of spat on shell that we would need. But possibly something like you're mentioning where we put down some material, but then we also come back with um, some uh, focused spat on shell um, might be in some of those areas that are more difficult to get started that might be the way and i think fsu is doing um, something along those lines is looking specifically at that so um, their efforts should be very informative going forward thank you for that any other questions scan through real quick see if i see any Nope, that might be it. So thank you so much, Matt. I appreciate your time and, and um, um, having you here today to present the, the most recent data. It's, ex it, it's exciting. It's always good to see some improvement and some change and, and I look forward to everything that's coming. All right, thank so, you. Now we'll transition um, to our next speaker who is actually Emily White, who just said hello to us. You're a little bit dark there. <laughs> uh, maybe a little um, just. Is there a light switch? <laughs> so I'm actually um, in Apalachicola right now. So oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Emily is a is like she introduced before. She's a high school student from McIntosh High School, uh, Fayette County, Georgia. And uh, today she's going to be talking about sustainable habitats for Cress Austria Virginica. So. Emily, if you're ready, why don't you take it away? Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So um, as Ms. Harper introduced, I, my name is Emily White, and I am a junior at McIntosh High School in uh, Georgia. It's near Noonan, and some people from Noonan come down to Apalachicola to fish often. But um, I have become incredibly interested in the oyster populations in Apalachicola because um, I came down. I'm not certain if the slide is advancing. I think there's maybe an issue. We'll see. Um, anyway, I'll keep going. Um, I came down with my dad, who was a teacher, science teacher in the county where I go to school. Uh, I came down to Apachicola in 2018 for a uh, kind of teacher field trip. He was taking his teachers down here to um, get some phenomena that they could use in their classrooms to teach about, you know, real world issues. And um, I was, I don't know, in middle school, maybe. But I with the town and the environment and the people and so watching you know continuing to look back um at articles and what was posted new and watching um you know this population struggle because they because the uh oyster population increasing that was really sad because you know i knew a lot of people who enjoyed coming down here and i know a lot of business owners and it was really disappointing to watch that um you know decline so i wanted to do something to help. And so <laughs> I started this in middle school. Uh, Science Fair was the best outlet that I could um, come up with to kind of start a project developer. So I started in middle school and I was analyzing some uh, little data, but then I decided that I wanted to um, build some sort of artificial oyster reef because I've been looking at um, efforts, you know, similar to what Mr. Davis presented in the last um, presentation. But I wanted to um, do, so, the literature shows that oyster shell is the best substrate, but it often gets broken or tossed around, um, as Mr. Davis said. So I want to combine oyster shell with a 
readily available substrate or like a concrete mix of some sort. I ended up using quickrete, <laughs> but I wanted to combine the two to see if it could increase spat um, attract attraction rates. So I um, started by formulating six different ratios of concrete to oyster shell because I wanted to test if adding more oyster shell to the concrete would um, increase attraction rates or not. And so um, I think I'll talk about this later in other slides, the actual formulation of each one. But my real goal was, you know, me being a volunteer um, kind of in this effort, I wanted to create something that would be good for volunteer use. So, you know, quick to replicate, quick to work with, inexpensive. And so um, using supplies from my local uh, tractor supply worked really well for that. So, um, and I also, because my teachers are parents, I wanted to, or my parents are teachers, that's what I meant. Uh, to create something that could be used as an education resource because I fell in love with the area because I was able to get hands on and I was able to get my hands dirty in the uh, in the kind of fight, if you will. So uh, first year, uh, I decided to um, check water quality. I went, I built some testing blocks of my substrate to just kind of make sure that it wouldn't. Um, mess with water quality standards and it was actually really funny I had like six giant tubs going in the back of my chemistry teacher's classroom with bubblers and people would constantly ask me what I was doing because I'd come in there like every period to check um, to take some measurements so it was really fun but um, turned out that my substrate I expected it I didn't expect it to change water quality at all because it's used for other applications but um, just to make sure that I was on the right track. It didn't change water quality at all. So I decided to continue with my second year of research, which is what I'm going to be mainly talking about today. So um, I wanted to actually, after doing things in the lab, I wanted to take my um, substrates out into a field environment. So um, I, I, I'm a total stats noob. I don't really know anything about statistics. So I my statistics teacher at my high school a lot to try to figure out sample size and analysis and all that different kinds of things but we came upon the number that I needed to build 54 testing samples and my brain exploded because I'm a high school student I don't have a lot of resources I don't have a lot of money so I was like oh my god what am I gonna do but um, luckily that chemistry teacher that I mentioned earlier he is the head of the STEM program at my high school and he had a whole group of freshmen who are willing to get their hands dirty and help me build. So I worked with the freshmen at my school along with my grandpa uh, who helped kind of, he taught me how to mix concrete and how to work with wood so then he was able to come back and help the freshmen work and it was kind of an intergenerational learning experience which is really cool because it kind of the uh, generations of oystermen in Apalachicola. But yeah, so I worked with the freshman class to build all of the uh, samples that I needed. You can see us working right here. And then here is the uh, mold we built for the testing samples. It's uh, four by 16. So it had to be small because I don't live in Florida. So I had to transport them down to Apalachicola in some way, um, which was a truck. <laughs> but yes, and then the other the other issue was that I didn't really have a lot of money because I my expensive, inexpensive for, you know, a smaller, but once you sample size, but once you get up into, you know, the tens, it gets a little more expensive. And um, because I'm a high schooler, there's not really a lot of availability for large grants that I can apply for. So I actually turned to Yamaha Mo, the local, um, they're very local to Noonan. They have a um, huge plant that they do all sorts of stuff with, but their education outreach program is very interested in sponsoring um, student uh, research like mine. So I wrote a little mini grant <laughs> uh, application for them and they actually bought all my supplies they bought me about six hundred dollars of supplies to work with and I'm so so grateful for them because that's how I was able to build all of my uh, all of my different samples and then um, also wonderful people that I worked with I got in touch with um, Florida State and I was able to use their marine lab as um, the site for my um, deployment of these samples and you can see um, a little setup here of what it looked like we had nine replicates of a group of the six ratios. And so just to kind of categorize the data in a way that made it easier to analyze. But yes, let's see if it will advance, it did. Um, so working with wonderful people at FSU, um, Chris Matichik is really the main person who helped me with all of this. I could not be more grateful. He's wonderful. Um, we 
my whole family piled in the car and we drove down to Apachicola on and on September 25th and we unloaded all of my samples and I got to do my first field work which was so fun like to just wade into the water with a kayak and it it felt like I was a real scientist for the first time which as a student that's always something that I'm looking for so we uh set them out in the water and our nine replicates and then uh we we marked them with PVC pipe, as you can see, you can see it in this photo, but it was also in the one that I showed on the previous slide. So we made sure they were all labeled well, and we put them out in the tide, and then we came back. Um, it was after like 49 days, I think. I didn't really plan uh, how long they were going to be out, because being a student who doesn't live in Florida and who is scared of driving on the highway, uh, getting back to Florida was kind of a big issue for me, and I only have so many free weekends and breaks that I can use. So I came back in November, and we retrieved them all, and then we did a huge spat count, because my goal was to see um, if one ratio increased spat attraction rates. And so we counted all the spat, and I couldn't be more grateful for um, Alana Hutner. She's a grad student at FSU, and I swear she could find the littlest spat. I could never pick them up, but she could. So we counted them all. And then in order to kind of standardize our data, we collected from the tops of the blocks. We collect, we counted the spat on the tops of the blocks and the sides just to kind of speed thing up, things up and um, make two different data sets that we can analyze. But yeah, here you can see, this is uh, Chris Magic, Jenny Bueno and I loading my blocks into kayaks. And then here is um, us counting the spat. And it was such a great experience, especially as a uh, student to be able to actually work with researchers one-on-one -on -one and be equals together. That was awesome. So um, I also, the analysis was incredibly fun because like, like I said, I'm a uh, statistics newbie. I don't know anything. So I had to do a lot of research and I learned how to do R. And um, I, I knew from just doing some simple I was gonna do something similar to an ANOVA, but um, using Chris's help at FSU, we decided that I needed to do a critical walk instead because it's non-parametric and it kind of takes care of the fact that my data was incredibly skewed because of many reasons which I will discuss later um, but yeah so we ran some analysis and unfortunately um, it wasn't statistically significant but I'll discuss later why that's not there's more to it than just that it was really disappointing to get that p-value back and not it wasn't great but it's okay because you know to it than just the numbers but here you can just see some uh, average numbers, they're very close to zero because um, there are so many barnacles that attach themselves to the structures because there, at the time there was a huge barnacle boom across the bay that even um, ABSI was struggling with their reefs. So that was something that wasn't quite expected, but we, we overcame it, especially by using them instead because there was more spat that ended up landing on the sides of the uh, blocks just because there's a little more protection from predators and whatnot. Um, there's just some general data and then so here's a, a graph to kind of show you how that was incredibly skewed closer to the zero range which is why we had to use a non-parametric test instead um and then here is so the the sets of coral and teal that is one ratio of my mixtures and each ratio was a, a different level of um oyster shell to quickrete in terms of like the mixture and um, as you can see, there's not really, uh, there wasn't a statistical significance uh, in the difference between each ratio, which is what I was trying to test. But finding out that was kind of a learning experience as a student to get real results <laughs> that weren't necessarily what you wanted them to be. So it didn't turn out the way I thought it would, but it was actually um, kind of interesting to just observe the natural processes. And here you can see, this graph just kind of shows more of the um, stark differences between the, the numbers of spat on the sides of the blocks versus the top. And um, that was a big deal for me in terms of analyzing the data because the side data ended up being more useful than the top data. And next graph, this one is only showing the side data because that one was really more since there were less zeros in it. Um, but this was showing um, the um, spat counts pooled by replicate, which is really interesting to me that there is the statistical significance um, and the difference between these. Um, and that's something just, that was something that was cool to me as a student who hasn't really worked in the field before. That wasn't something that I was expecting. So that was honestly um, really interesting just to kind of witness these uh, environmental phenomena. And then when I was discussing about how there were some things that came up that were, they weren't expected and they 
rescued my dad in ways that I wasn't prepared for. Um, I discussed um, working with my grandfather earlier and my grandfather and I actually constructed some of the uh, blocks and the molds for my testing blocks before working with the freshmen. So that was kind of a um, variation in mixing and construction standard. It shouldn't have been too much of a big deal, but one of the blocks did actually break on the way down to uh, the um, Marine Lab, but we zip, that, we zip tied it back together, but it's just something to mention in terms of possible error. And then I did mention before the uh, barnacle boom, but that did cause a lot of um, kind of a fight for surface area in terms of um, the spat settling on these testing samples. Um, my The samples honestly kind of looked like fried chicken when they came out of the water because of how many barnacles there were. Uh, that was an interesting thing for me to look at. And I think the largest issue was that um, I actually miscalculated when the spat fall would be because according to historical data, it would have been um, in October or we assumed it would be, but it most earlier. So me um, coming in late September was also when I could just work it out in my schedule that I could come. So kind of a combination of logistics and environmental things. Uh, we kind of missed the spat fall, which made it a little bit harder to get um, useful data. But still, um, overall, it, it might have been statistically insignificant, the differences between the ratios, which is what I was looking for. But my original goal was to create something that was easy for volunteer use. And so if volunteers didn't have to um, mix up, you know, varied amounts of oyster shell and concrete, and they can just use concrete bases, then that's easier for them. And it's easier to mass produce because it's cheaper and all, you know, all the things that are important for volunteer construction. And also I've been looking into things in terms of design. I've been looking into uh, methods like printing um, with concrete, really interesting. But if you have a smoother substrate, like just a concrete mix, um, that's not as kind of chunky, like with the oyster shells in it, then there are more options for how you can mold and construct that, which I think is also very interesting. And then, like I said, I'm a student, um, a high school student at that. So this whole really was just incredible. Like I can't describe how it changed my outlook on what environmental science actually is because working with all these wonderful people, getting my hands dirty, you know, being able to talk to all of you incredible researchers as equal, as an equal, that was, insanely awesome. I can't describe how just life-changing it was. And I was able to use a program in my um, school district. It's called Work. So I was actually able to do this study as a part of my school day. So that was really great because I got to put a lot of effort into it and I got to spend, it wasn't just something that I kept a balance on top of my schoolwork. It was a part of my schoolwork. So it taught me um, all these things like self-motivation and how to effectively communicate with professors and um, cultivate mentorships and things like that so it was really awesome and I after completing this I know that this is what I want to do for a career like I am dedicated to this field I um love there's nuances constantly and there's always new things to study and you know new topics to dive in that I want to do this as a career and um in terms of continuing this specific study I would like to look at reef design because I think that um, there are lots of cool things you can do. Actually, in this photo, this is a uh, early prototype of what I thought a uh, reef design could be. But this is also my cat, Beaver. He decided to join in with the reef building. <laughs> but uh, I'm actually looking at um, doing things with fluid dynamic modeling to see if there's a um, shape that's most efficient for spat uh, attraction in terms of current flow and things like that. I'm trying to work with um, Georgia Tech to see if I can their modeling program labs a little bit to uh, kind of learn about those systems. And um, well, I mentioned earlier concrete 3D printing. I think that that's awesome. And I think that it can be super useful for this application. So I'm really trying, there were kind of phases to this project. I worked on water quality and then I worked on substrate and now I'm trying to work on design. So I think that that's just a wonderful growth pattern of this project. And um, my wonderful references here, Chris Magic at FSU, um, Jen Trivetti at University of Denver. Uh, she she didn't necessarily um, help me with the science aspect of it because she does more things with natural disasters, but being a complete newbie in the research, uh, figure out ethics and conferences and uh, writing papers and all that. So she was wonderful. Jeff Dutro at the um, DNR and all the grad students at FSU. So yeah, just, this project was incredible and it didn't come out the way I wanted to, but that's a learning experience in itself. So yeah, 
and I'd love to take any questions you have. Thank you so much, Emily. I love your enthusiasm. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and there was a, a comment. Excellent, excellent. There was a comment. Um, awesome job, Emily. You're going to have a great career in science for <laughs> one of our <laughs> participants. And Thank I have to you. say, um, what one of the amazing things is uh, you giving a talk in front of in front of this audience, even though you're you're just looking at a computer screen. Um, that's just um, so impressive at your age. Thank you. I'm so grateful to be here, you know, especially following um, the presentation from the FWC. That's like one of the places I want to work in the future if I could. So looking at their efforts, that's awesome. And just being in a group of people who are like minded. It's really cool. <laughs> Excellent. Let me see if there are any questions for you. My control box just went haywire, sorry. Um, it's okay, I wasn't sure if I was gonna be able to today. I'm not saying okay, so. anything, Anna, but um, you, you mentioned John's comment there, and I have to echo that. Emily, you did a, a tremendous job, and we look forward to working with you as a professional in the future. Thank you, thank you, I appreciate it. Excellent. All right. Well, you may be off the hook, um, but please <laughs> stick around. Um, like I said, uh, we have uh, Dr. Andy Kane in a couple talks, and um, I, I know he's probably bouncing around in his chair right now. He, he's going to go through his talk, but he's probably super excited about what he just heard from you. Um, so we might, we might get to circle back with you. And um, right now we're gonna we're gonna switch to a break. And um, oh, I saw Andy commented, yes, he is. <laughs> um, so we're gonna we're gonna take a break until about 2:40. Uh, so y'all grab some some coffee, tea. We got just a few more presentations to to end the day. And um, again, I appreciate everybody uh, stick, sticking around, and and we'll talk to you in just a few minutes. So thanks much. Okay, welcome back everybody. Our next speaker is gonna be Kelly Williams. She's with the Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission. And she's gonna tell us about FWC based scallop restoration and monitoring in St. George Sound. Take it away, Kelly. All right, let's see. Okay, so um, I guess we're going to be moving kind of off of the oyster reef and into seagrass for a little bit. So a um, little break from oysters and then we'll look at what the scallops are up to. So I was specifically going to focus on our work in St. George Sound originally, but um, since I haven't presented to you guys before, I'm just going to give you the overview of everything we do with scallops in the panhandle. And then if you want me back next year, um, I can specifically focus on the St. George Sound work. Okay, so if uh, you aren't familiar with these little buggers, they um, are a bi bivalve that live at most two years. Usually we see about a year, year and a half. So it's a really difficult species to manage because they're basically an annual crop. Um, they, you know, can move a little bit, but they're, you know, pretty much gonna stay um, in the same general area that they landed as spat. Um, so they are capable of those little short bursts of speed and you often find them or most often find them in seagrass. So they live in shallow near shore waters and they require high salinity. So we won't find these guys very often in Apalachicola Bay, but you will see it in the neighboring bays in Port St. Joe, so St. Joe Bay and um, St. George Sound. So I'm going to be focusing kind of on the areas around Apalachicola Bay today, not so much the bay itself. Um, historically, bay scallops were found all along the East Coast and into the Gulf of Mexico, um, basically Cape Cod all the way through. And we have seen significant fishery collapse pretty much everywhere. Um, so there's, uh, with them being an annual crop, they are extremely vulnerable to things like harmful algal blooms, 
um, habitat loss, you know, we're having a lot of seagrass loss and overfishing. So in Florida, um, since 1995, it's been a recreational season only. And the way that um, FWC manages uh, at least this fishery is a regional basis. So up here on the top right, you can see the different zones and they have different opening and closing dates. And that's just because, um, I mean, scallops just operate a little differently in the, in the different systems. All right. So uh, we got a 10-year grant. This was oil spill money. It's a natural resources damages assessment grant, NERDA grant. Um, so it was 10 years. Uh, started in 2016, so we're about halfway through now. Um, and the goal of it was to increase depleted scallop populations in some bays and kind of bring scallops back into other areas that seemed suitable. So we um, kind of highlighted five regions we were going to work in. <clears throat> And that ranged from Pensacola Bay on the west to St. George Sound on the east. And um, we've eliminated Choctahatchee Bay. Um, we just, we didn't see any spat settlement there and um, the salinity regime, it was just, it's, it's far too fresh. So we're really, we're focusing on four bays now. Um, and today I'm gonna try and just focus more so on our work in St. Joe Bay and St. George Sound since that's closer to Apalachicola Bay. And we're based, um, I should have said this in the beginning, uh, same as Matt Davis, we're based here at the um, Apalachicola River Field Lab for FWC and uh, work in the Luskin Fisheries Group. All right, so this uh, 10 year project kind of has five main components. And I'm gonna just gonna, like I said, it's kind of bird, bird's eye view of what we do. So I'm gonna go through each of these briefly, give you an idea of what we work on. And then um, hopefully you'll have some questions for me at the end, or you know, if not, that's cool too. <laughs> um, so population monitoring, we look at both adults and SPAT recruitment. So um, we'll be going into detail on our surveys. Harvest monitoring, this is our fisheries dependent monitoring work. Um, specifically, we focus on St. Joseph Bay because um, even though scallops are able to be collected in St. George Sound, there's just the population isn't there to really support people wanting to go out and scallop in St. George Sound. So um, yeah, it's, we pretty much just focus our efforts on St. Joseph Bay. Uh, population restoration, this is we work at all four bays, that's Pensacola, St. Andrews, St. Joseph and St. George Sound. And we use cages as well as other methods I'm gonna go over. Outreach, so we have started two volunteer programs, um, the Scallop Sitters and Scallop Rodeos. And uh, those have, we've had some pretty good success with those. Um, and then research, we have a number of research projects going on. All right, so for our adult populations, we do diver surveys. And um, what these are is we lay out a 100 meter transect. We have a diver on either side and each covers a uh, one meter width. So you get a 200 meter square transect covered. Um, and what you do is as you're going along, you're looking for any scallop you encounter, you're gonna record the habitat type that it was found in, and then you actually bag it and bring it back to the boat. Once they're on the boat, we measure shell height and we take a non-lethal genetic sample. It's just a swab. Um, and then we actually keep those scallops and we use them in various restoration projects. So depending on the bay, um, we can um, kind of dictate how many surveys we do, but it's usually somewhere between 30 and 70 surveys per bay. Um, and what we do is a, it's a randomized grid. So we have this grid of known like seagrass habitat based on, it's like a, um, I think it's a 2016 GIS layer of seagrass that the um, FWC seagrass team put together. And so we just do random selections of stations in here each year. Um, and that's how we come up with where we're gonna, you know, throw our surveys. And then for the bays that have open scallop season, which is St. George Sound and St. Joseph Bay, we do a pre-season as well as a post-season survey. And that's so that we can kind of ascertain the impact of um, the you know, recreational fishery. And like if, if they basically left anything to spawn, because that's the other thing that's a little tricky with scallops is they typically spawn at the first cold snap. Um, and like I said, they only live a year, maybe two years max. So often they're getting harvested before they've had a chance to spawn. 
Uh, so it's just another another fun thing when you're managing scale hooks. All right, so here is, oh, all right, skip too far forward. Okay, so this is the results of our scallop surveys that we've done since this project began in 2016. So in orange, you'll see that is St. Joseph Bay, and we are definitely trending in the right direction in St. Joseph, um, as well as the green, which is St. Andrews. Now, St. George Sound is blue, and there has been a very minimal population, um, and it really hasn't changed. And then the purple, uh, which is down there at the bottom, is Pensacola, and we have still not found an adult live scallop in Pensacola Bay. But we're hoping that'll change because um, this year was our first year putting cages and restoration work in Pensacola. So we're hoping to see an increase next year. And as you can see at the bottom, I've also got, um, I put in basically when we started doing cage-based restoration work in each of these bays. So, um, you know, if we're looking at it, there might be this two-year lag time uh, before we start seeing increases like we did in St. George and then in St. Andrews, or sorry, St. Joe and St. Andrews. So hopefully with us putting cages in St. George uh, in 2019, I would really love to see an, a good increase this summer. Um, we'll see, we'll see come June. And then same thing with Pensacola. All right, so for the uh, spat recruitment, the larval recruitment, what we do is we set out these spat traps and um, they're deployed basically for two months at a time. The idea is spat settle on them similarly as they would onto seagrass. And then um, we're able to pick those traps, keep all the spat and use them in our restoration projects. Now, historically, we've been doing spat trap sampling all up and down the Gulf Coast. This is going back to the 1990s. So we have a pretty tremendous data set um, in terms of spat trap sampling, but we have actually changed this in the last couple of years where we're focused exclusively on these restoration spat traps, which are the doubled up um, two traps on a block. And, that, and, and it's exclusively to collect spat that we then use um, for various restoration projects. So we're really not using it exclusively as a monitoring tool anymore, and it's more of a collection tool. All right, so now um, kind of this was that uh, part two of our five components um, in the project, and this is harvest monitoring. So this is our fisheries dependent monitoring work. Now, um, like I said, we originally had this um, for both St. Joseph Bay and St. George Sound, but there just, there aren't enough people scalloping in St. George Sound to warrant putting the effort in to try and survey them. So we've exclusively focused on St. Joseph Bay the last few years. Um, what we do is we, this has kind of three components to it where we're on our boat um, and we actually go out and count the number of vessels in known scalloping grounds. Uh, we count the number of trailers at boat ramps near known scalloping grounds and we interview people as they're coming off the water at the boat ramps. So we're there to count your scallops and talk to you about it and, you know, we're trying to get an idea of just how successful our recreational scallopers are, and then at the end of it, we can kind of compile a rough estimate of how many scallops are harvested on, um, you know, each season. All right, so now we're into kind of the meat of our project, which is the population restoration. So we use three main restoration methods, um, larval release. This is where we work with a commercial hatchery down near St. Pete. We actually take them wild collected scallops from up here. They manage to spawn them and then provide us either larvae or newly settled spat. So for the larval release, we get them one week um, after the spawn and then we, as quickly as we can, get them up, um, up to the, back up to the panhandle and into seagrass. So actually two members of our team um, just finished doing this in Pensacola a couple of days ago. So hopefully those Pensacola numbers are going to boost up um, come the summer. We'll see. Um, secondly, we do free planting. So this is very similar to the larval release. It's just you're actually waiting a little bit longer. You want them to be fully settled spat that you're releasing into seagrass. 
And then third is our cages. Now this has been our primary restoration method for the last few years. The idea is scallops are placed in cages, predators can't get them, people can't harvest them during open scallop season, and they're kept in like kind of this artificially high density. That way when they spawn, you should see a really successful like recruitment event afterwards. All right, so our cages. We um, kind of use two different types of cages. The primary one is this three foot by three foot coated metal mesh. And um, you can see that's pretty much all of these. And so what it is, is we put it on an aluminum frame that we hammer down into bare substrate. We want all of these placed near seagrass, but not on seagrass, since we do actually anchor things in. Um, and so the, you can put two cages on each of these frames. Each cage can hold 500 scallops, so you can have 1,000 scallops per frame. And in each bay, we aim to have 12 cages, so that's 6,000 scallops in each of the four bays annually. Um, so we'd basically be maintaining 24,000 scallops in, in cages. And we've been able to meet those target goal target numbers the last um, I guess last two years now we've been we've been consistent with making those numbers. And um, as you can see here, this is all diver work. Um, this was an incredibly clear day. Usually we don't have this great of visibility where our cages are, but um, yeah, it's it's a good time until it gets to be about this time of year, and then you're real cold working on a large metal cage. <laughs> but uh, we make it work. So like I said, we want it um, with preferably on bare substrate, but near seagrass. Um, don't want any freshwater inputs nearby because scallops are extremely sensitive to freshwater. They, I mean, they, just, they can't tolerate it for very long. And then, um, you know, we want to maintain at least like six feet of depth. And then this little guy here is our scallop sitter cage. This is one of our volunteer programs that I'm gonna go into later. And um, so he, he's just like the little baby cage that holds 50 scallops versus our big cage that holds the 500. All right, so a little bit more about our restoration field work. Um, as I mentioned, we do scallop collections. So these collections um, are for like moving scallops down to the hatchery where they're gonna get spawned out or collecting scallops to put in cages. And like I mentioned, those recruitment traps are used to collect fat. So we kind of collect uh, wild scallops from our bays for various purposes. Uh, spat grow out, what we do is we either get spat from the hatchery or from our traps and we raise them until they're 25 millimeters in shell height, at which point they can go into our very large cages without slipping through the gaps. Um, and so during this grow out, we have them in mesh bags, as you can see here. And what we do is a biweekly cleaning, size sorting to monitor basically growth. Um, because we work everywhere from St. George Sound to Pensacola, we've got basically um, we've got a lot of wear and tear and travel involved. So what we've figured out is a really good scallop transport method. Uh, we use this, um, we've got a custom built trailer and we throw a couple haul boxes on there. So we're able to transport um, a large supply of scallops or spat in, um, you know, in, a, in seemingly pretty good manner. Um, and we, we basically have like an oxygen system that goes in with that as well. Um, so for our cages, this is all diver maintained. So divers install the cages, you do monthly checks where you're recording like scallop mortality, you're cleaning and repairing cages, and then you swap them out once they get too foul, we just bring them back and pressure wash because it's, it's not really worth it to try and scrape them clean every time. And um, we also do some genetic sampling. So this helps us figure out if our restoration work is actually effective. So if we're seeing inputs of um, the scallops that we had in cages the year before, if those genetics are showing up in our wild caught scallops the next year, at least that's what we hope for. Um, so we have a couple of different genetics um, projects in the works right now that are uh, hopefully gonna give us good results soon. Okay, so um, this is the same graph as I showed earlier. So, you know, have we had restoration success? It is a little too early to call, but I would like to say that, you know, we are certainly seeing good success in Andrews and St. Joseph. Um, we have another five years to go and, you know, lots can change between now and then with, you know, them being an annual crop kind of vulnerable, but um, I think we are trending in the right direction. So pretty happy with that.
All right, so now I'm going to just briefly overview our two volunteer programs. So these started in 2018. Um, the first one is Scallop Sitters, and this is where um, volunteers can adopt a cage of scallops. We give them a small cage and we ask them to kind of maintain them for six months. It's usually somewhere between June and January, and um, we give them a hydrometer so they can kind of get some salinity measurements and they tell us you know um, how many scallops they have alive each month so um, as you can see here we've had pretty good numbers of, of you know pretty good turnout um, we did have a noticeable hit in 2019 compared to 2018 and that was mainly i mean hurricane michael um, especially for the saint andrews bay folks a lot of people lost you know docks and boats and everything else so it was um, understandable that we took kind of a hit there and then in 2020 we actually postponed the program just due to covid so um we're going to be gearing back up to have it again this year and hopefully we'll have some really enthused volunteers this was actually the first year that we had it in st george sound so we had 13 uh, volunteers 13 cages in st george sound and we had some extremely enthusiastic people so it's uh it's definitely it's it's a good time um and people are really they're pretty happy to do it for us so it's great and then the next one is our scallop rodeos and this is great for people who are maybe out of town or can't commit to a monthly going out and checking a cage of scallops this is just a one-day event before the scallop season opens where we have volunteers collect up to 200 scallops a person got to bring them back to us alive can't keep them can't eat them but then we put those scallops into our restoration programs. Um, and so this is just another great way to kind of introduce people to um, our work and get you know, engaged with the, just the locals. Um, so as you can see, we've had some great success with just the number of scallops that have been brought in in our rodeos and we're really thankful to all of our volunteers. And they're extremely competitive too, which is great because uh, these ladies have actually been our, um, they have been the scallop queens the last, I guess it's been three years in a row. They always bring in the most scallops. All right. And then lastly, um, this is just a little bit about, I mean, we've done a lot of research projects. Um, here's just kind of a list of some of them that are ongoing or recently completed. And um, so you can look for those publications. Hopefully soon, there'll be a few more coming out. Um, but yeah, I won't, I won't bother with going into those today. But like I said, if you uh, want me back next year, we can go into more detail on some of these projects and specifically um, St. George Sound, since that's a little more relevant to Apalachicola Bay. All right, and that does it. Thank you, Kelly. Um, do we have any questions for Kelly? You can come off mute if you like. I'll ask a question. The scallop numbers that you had, like the St. Joe Bay one, the orange ones was really bouncing around a lot. Do you think that that's, I mean, if you, how many cages did you do? And like, could you put error bars on there and so that we would be able to see if that was like a, you know, always the same or was that really different? So yeah, they did um, vary, and I certainly could add that in. I think mainly that huge spike that we had in 2019, let me uh, go back a few slides here. Um, it was that, yeah, follow basically following Hurricane Michael, we saw the most scallops that we've seen in St. George, or in St. Joe since, I mean, I don't even know that we had actually ever seen that many before in St. Joe. So we knew that there was certainly an impact from the hurricane um, that, that caused this, this huge peak in 2019. And then you saw the subsequent, you know, crash maybe in 2020. And but then we're back up. It's um so our, our cage numbers haven't changed dramatically. They have been slight, like we we had more scallops actually in the bay between 2019 and 2020 than we did between 2018 and 2019. But um, yeah, I think that it was really the hurricane that kind of created that that huge peak um, in 2019. And we've actually seen that before um, down in like Pine Island Sound following, can't remember which of the hurricanes it was, but we saw year after it was like the scallop numbers were just off the charts again. So it's something, um, you know, hurricanes can can definitely affect them. Um, and yeah, again, with it being an annual crop, it's it's really hard to tease out individual 
you know, pinpoint what's what the trigger is this year. Um, because a lot of it can be rainfall too. Like if we have a really wet winter when these spat are trying to settle, um, that can affect things, or you know, it's there's a lot of different um different triggers, I guess, for scallops. Yeah. I would just encourage you to put air bars on there and like and then we would, you know, just tell us more about what it all means. Sure. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you so much, Kelly. We appreciate you presenting. Next up, we have Dr. Andy Kane from the University of Florida, and he's going to tell us about oyster health and monitoring observations in Apalachicola Bay. Welcome, Andy. Hey, Ada, thank you so very much. And what a great opportunity to share in this venue that brings together so many different people from throughout the region working on so many issues that um, either directly or indirectly provide some really important support for the resources that we care about. So what I'd like to do right now is to share a little bit about what we do from um, the perspective of the Aquatic Pathobiology Laboratory here at University of Florida and um, sort of introduce what we do with regard to um, oyster health and oyster habitat monitoring through a variety of programs. Um, First, I'd like to start off by mentioning that everything that I do works as a collaborative. A lot of my research is community-based, and um, I, I need to mention just to start off that um, Ross Brooks is my program manager and is an amazing data manager and uh, data visualizer. Shannon Hartfield has been a community partner and has really done a tremendous amount to educate me and my program and work with us to produce some good science. And then I'm really happy to tell you that I've got some great grad students over time, Shelby Thomas, Rebecca Rash, and Lauren Hintonlang, that have all contributed to parts of our monitoring protocols. And of course, our partners um, at FWC and FDAX and um, at the NIR have been really instrumental in terms of trying to make sure that we're anchored in reality. And so in anchor in reality, I will tell you that we're really anchoring mostly in Apalachicola Bay in all of the monitoring and habitat monitoring that I'm going to be talking about. And um, indeed, there's a lag here. And I'm just going to assume that um, it will eventually produce some slides. If the lag is too much, if uh, somebody else would like to advance the slides for me, if, if this doesn't work, we can do that in the future. Um, so Apalachicola Bay, as you know, has a lot of management areas and harvest areas illustrated in orange. And a lot of the drivers for the studies that we have engaged with, while it may have related to um, community health, it may have related to the oil spill, it may be related to um, other issues, but nevertheless, one of the major drivers are the um, current status of oyster populations. Um, can somebody at your end advance a slide for me? Because the delay is um, sufficiently remarkable that I'll never get done in 15 minutes. Hey Andy, go ahead and click into the GoToWebinar window once, and then you should be able to use your keyboard to control it. That would do it, right? All right, let me see if maybe I was on the wrong screen. So the, the number of harvestable bags of oysters in the bay really is a driver for the concern, both in the communities and for state agencies that are responsible for managing oyster habitat in Apalachicola Bay. And, you know, after 2010, um, you know, there was, uh, there was a decline which stayed really low. But we all know that you can make a graph look a lot like anything you wanted to. If we were to have expanded this graph to the left and go earlier than 1990, you would, you would see, and you probably know, that the peak that we see around 1995 isn't as big as some of the previous ones. Harvest had been larger than that peak. And so depending upon the time frame that we look at, um, you can get different perspectives. But since 2010, there's been a decline. It hasn't gotten any better. It's only really gotten worse and eventually led to bay closure. So what are, the, what are the drivers here? And so I'm going to be talking about climate change as one of the primary drivers and different ways of looking at that and how some of these um, water quality variables, for, for example, can be driving some of the biological variables that we monitor. So for example, long-term trends on the x-axis for salinity and pH on both of these graphs, it goes from 2001 through 2014. And what you can see is there's a red regression line in both of them. And there's an overall trend in salinity that is increasing over time in those years. 
We can also see, if you look carefully enough, that there are certain cyclical patterns of salinity that can be seen. Sometimes you can see them annually, and sometimes it doesn't show up that way. But what you can see looking at salinity is there are periods of time where it can be really low. I mean, if this is sort of the mean or the average over time, and then you compare some of these other values at certain times of the year, um, there's some extremes that we see. So I would say an extreme of less than five parts per thousand in Apalachicola Bay for more than a, a tidal cycle is, is a challenging environment for um, healthy oysters. And we can see that extremes exist at the low end of salinity in m multiple time points and at the high end. So these are verified data and there are times that the salinity is greater than 35 parts per thousand and it can last. On the lower graph for pH, we can see there's a general decline in pH over time. This is ocean acidification. It exists in Apalachicola Bay as well. Um, and there are extremes that happen. They get really low when there's a lot of freshwater input, and they can get really high when there's not a lot of freshwater input, but there's an overall trend of lowered pH. It's a global trend, and we see it in Apalachicola Bay. So we can also see extremes Right? It's not just changes in, in weather. These are climate changes as extremes. So many of you have seen this hydrograph from USGS Water Watch. And the colorful bands that go across the graph represent sort of the middle, this green is sort of the middle flow rate um, at the um, Chatt Chattahoochee um, um, gauge. So the green is sort of the average over a 92-year period. And then the color above green, the light blue over here, is um, sort of the next percentile up. It's between the 75th and the 90th. And then the purple is the 90th percentile. And down here in this darker brown, that's the fifth, sorry, the 10th percentile. So those are the extremes. And each, each of those bands of data is repeated for every year on this x-axis. So the black line on this hydrograph are the actual flow rates for the years as, as shown on the x-axis in relation to the 92-year running average. And what we can see is in 2010, and then specifically in 2011 and 2012, we not only had low flow, but historically low flow. And it stayed for a long time. This is variability. These are the extremes. And then we also saw that again um, at the latter part of 2016. And we had a fresh ed at the beginning of 2016 that was remarkable and dropped the salinity down near zero. So these extremes um, are interesting to look at when we think about oyster health. And so what we've done in order to be able to monitor oyster health um, is try to come up with ways to standardize these metrics and to be able to share these metrics consistently. So what I'll share with you today are what some of these observations look like and how we do it. Uh, we do a standard condition index, which is based on the inside cavity volume of the oysters. Um, when you shuck them and you basically understand, uh, you subtract the volume of the cavity from the whole weight of the shell, assuming a density of one for the meat, which is close. And then you dry the meat to, to dryness in a drying oven. And that weight um, in that shell volume times a multiplier tells you basically how much non-water materials are in there in terms of metabolic machinery for that oyster. And it can vary quite a bit by season. Um, we also do an empirical meat index, which is visual. You look at it, and um, we have a ranking scale from, zero to five, from one to five that we use. And I'm going to be showing off that scale with regard to every other index that we have, but not the empirical meat index. And then finally, we're going to be talking about um, the prevalence of um, Perkinsus marinum dermo disease um, in the meat. And then finally, external and gross observations, we're going to be looking at the shells for different shell parasites. So let me introduce the players to you. And if you've looked at oyster shells out of Apalachicola Bay or out of almost any growing environment, and that includes off-bottom oysters in, in aquaculture, um, it's not uncommon to find at least two of these parasites in those oyster shells or sometimes in the oyster um, cavity. And these include uh, polydora worms. These are annelids that enter the shell from the margin and create these U-shaped burrows. They can get inside the shell and get close to the live animal. 
It can irritate the animal greatly. The animal tries to wall it off very quickly by laying down an aqueous layer of shell material over it, walling it off to create these mud blisters. So these are polydora worms. Then we have clams. So we have a bivalve that parasitizes a bivalve shell. And these clams utilize this really safe habitat inside of an oyster shell matrix to um, dig in there mechanically with their foot and their shell. And they dig a hole and they continue digging and uh, turning themselves around to keep the hole as big as they need to as they grow um, to be able to uh, maintain um, their habitat. And then finally, we have sponge. These boring sponge use a, a chemical acidic secretion to excavate into the shell. And they create a lattice three-dimensional network throughout the shell matrix. So these are the three different boring organisms that we have, and we visualize them or rank them based on a scale of uh, one to five. So I'm going to show you as an example how we would rank it for Polydora, the mudworm. And so here's a scale of one to five. And what you can see is that as you go from one to five, there's a lot more black stuff, right? A lot more of those U-shaped burrows. Some of those U-shaped burrows don't look very fresh at all. They're historical, right? And if you look at examples in one and two, uh, those ranks, uh, those left shells shown, um, those, those do not look very fresh, whereas the right shell in two looks really fresh. Um, but the bottom line is, to, to get the highest rank, you only have to have 50% of the shell on the inside from observations. And that's because for Polydora, you're not going to have a lot of Polydora that will be visible in the interior because of their nature and where and how they excavate. So we come up with a ranking system, and it goes up by half ranks. So you can have a one, one and a half, two, two and a half, and so on. So there's one decimal point for all of the ranking that we produce from zero to five. So we know that we can see things visually, but we've used x-ray, used radiography, to be able to get a gold standard of what's really there. And we now know that what you see from the outside of a shell, whether it's the outside or the interior surface of the shell, um, neither is really um, that accurate. And a radiograph, you know, you can see right through it. And so this radiograph, you can, you can make out these clams, these teardrop-shaped um, uh, areas of, elect of, um, uh, of um, electron uh, lucidity. And um, the polydora worms are all of these burrows right around the margin here. There are hundreds of them. And then here you can make out at the hinge and moving upward um, are Cleona tracks um, going through. And uh, some of this is Cleona, some of this is old Polydora in the middle. But um, you know, we can see pretty much everything that's there um, using radiography. And with that, we wanted to get a better handle on how, how extensive shell parasites are excavating and reducing shell density. So we're looking at basic epidemiological constructs of prevalence and severity for starters. And by size class, um, we find that all of these parasites are present by the time they're over 50 millimeters in height. And that for the most part, by the time they're 51 millimeters, Polydora um, has 100% prevalence. Now, this was from samples that were in a certain time period. And while, and while a sample that we take today might not have 100% prevalence, um, in other words, every sample has some polydora, regardless of how minimal. Um, it may vary over time, but these are pretty accurate relative to the trends. And that by the time they're over 51 millimeters, you can find these parasites very commonly. They're very common to find. Um, and so whether you make the observations from the inside of the shell or the outside of the shell, you'll get better data. So polydora, we said that we can see them better on the inside of the shell than the outside. So the next three slides I'll share have data and groupings of the inside of the shell observations, the outside of the shell, and then the radiograph, the gold standard. And so, and you know, by size class. And no matter how you look at this, we are seeing more polydora visibly inside the shell than on the outside. So the inside's more sensitive to showing us more data. And if we look at the other parasites, we see that with Diplothyra, the clam, we can see them better on the outside than we can on the inside. The asterisk indicates that there's a significant difference between the bar with an asterisk and the bar to its left. Finally, with sponge, 
we see that the outside of the shell for all size classes provides better data than the inside of the shell in all cases. And with this information coupled with the radiology, um, we did some modeling and were able to come up with a model that, um, and I'll, I'll share this idea with you for just the, the mudworm Polydora, that by taking the right valve and looking at the inside visual rank, right, those are half ranks from um, zero to five, we're able to um, use this, this linear type of model with the height of the oyster and actually really make some remarkable approximations to what's actually there without having to have an x-ray machine. So here's just one example for Polydora. The same trends hold for Cleona and Diplothyra. So the rightmost bar is the gold standard, is the radiograph. The leftmost bar in each size group represents the actual inside visual rank that we gave it. And the middle bar represents the predicted value after running it through that equation. And what we're seeing is that statistically, and this is true for all three parasites, that the predicted value that we get from these data is statistically indistinguishable from the gold standard. Um, so that's great news. So now we get this feel for really what's going on in terms of the degree of parasite um, burden that oysters have. And here's the take home thoughts. They're in all collections that we have. And this goes back from 2012 to the present. Um, in general, regardless of anything else, parasite, shell parasite severity increases as oysters get bigger. And the ability for an oyster to wall off and defend itself from shell parasites as they enter sort of the shell cavity, um, it will start diverting uh, energy away from growth to um, laying down new nacreous. Um, our visual observations of shell parasites, just looking at them, really underestimates what's actually there based on radiographic gold standard. Um, we have an equation that allows us to approximate that really well. Extended high salinity conditions tend to favor higher prevalence and severity of these shell parasites, particularly Cleona and Polydora. Boring shell parasites reduce shell density. And um, we're going to talk about that in a minute. But let's jump from hard tissue to soft tissue. And now we're going to talk about um, dermo disease, Akinsis. This is a very small microscopic parasite that has been present in oysters globally um, forever. Um, they have evolved with oysters and other mollusks as hosts. Um, they're present from out in all of our collections in Apalachicola Bay. Um, they also, um, the severity, the prevalence and the severity of this disease increases as oysters grow. So even without any changes in environmental drivers or other stressors, there's a tendency for prevalence and severity to increase when the oysters grow. It tends to support the notion that you're not expelling dermohypnospores and relieving yourself. There's really no evidence from our data that, that says that you can get rid of it. Um, chronic high salinity will exacerbate dermo prevalence and salinity. Uh, increased dermo prevalence and severity is associated with a reduced condition index, growth, and mortality. We're at time now, if you uh, want to so wrap we're it up. Time, what I'm <laughs> going to do is I'm going to wrap up here, um, and I'm going to try to, um, to jump to um, see if this works. Close. I'm going to toggle. These aren't even my slides. So if you can get rid of the slides, I'm going to just, I'm going to summarize here without my slides if we can. And what I'd like to say is that our goals for monitoring oyster health and habitat um, are to, relate, is to examine relationships between oyster populations, their density, their size classes dynamic, and their size class dynamics, water quality, substrate volume, and substrate quality. So we are all doing um, measurements to validate a tonguing method of depletion sampling to supplant or supplement um, the gold standard of, of diving with quadrats um, because it's cheaper, it's safer, um, and gives you data that looks just as good. And all of that is helping us to understand, you know, areas that need to be restored because we can not only measure oysters, but the substrate as well. 
So I thank you for your time and I look forward to feedback. Thank you so much. And um, we can put our questions in the uh, question and answer box and maybe get back to them later. And those of you who don't know, uh, Andy has an exhibit here at the Research Reserve that's very interesting. A lot of, uh, shows a, a lot of um, damage to the shells. It's, it's a great little exhibit. So come by and see it. Next up, we have Blake Hamilton from FSU, and he's going to tell us about community structure of fishes in fluvial dominated estuary. Okay. Blake, whenever you're ready, come on camera and Okay, can y'all hear and see me? We can hear and see you. Wonderful. Sounds great. Great, thank you. Awesome, well thank you for that introduction. Um, my name is Blake Hamilton. I'm a graduate student at the FSU Coastal Marine Lab as part of the Grubbs Lab. And today I'll be sharing with you guys some little snippets of a couple of my chapters of research uh, titled Species Habitat Relationships and Multi-Source Feeding and Apological Bay Fishes and Their Implications for Natural Resource Management. So Thomas Huxley infamously stated in the uh, late 19th century that probably all great sea fisheries are inexhaustible. As we now know, this is clearly not the case, uh, but to Huxley's credit, he surely never anticipated the sorts of developments in um, fishing technology like sonar and at sea freezers that allow it, allowed us to fish, find fish more easily, fish farther from land and stay at sea longer. He partly made the statement in reference to uh, the Atlantic cod that you're seeing on the sh your screen here. And Atlantic cod were a dominant fishery species in the North Atlantic um, for essentially as long as fishermen had been uh, fishing in those waters until its collapse in the 1990s when the levels, their population levels fell to about 100, uh, 1% of historic stock levels. Now the drivers of this collapse were really hotly debated among fishermen and scientists, different stakeholders. Um, some blaming really intense fishing pressure, while others were blaming um, the potential of, of environmental factors in driving this, this demise of the fishery. So traditional fisheries management, the kind of fisheries management that was used for cod prior to the 1990s, focused just on that target species. So we neglected factors like uh, species interactions, so what are the prey or predators of Atlantic cod doing, but also those environmental influences. So nowadays, uh, organizations like NOAA and National Marine Fisheries Service uses something called ecosystem-based fisheries management. And this aims to incorporate knowledge of both intra and interspecific species interactions, and also those physical environmental uh, factors or environmental influences. So my research in the Apalachical Bay system has been focused on collecting these types of data to better understand species distributions and abundances, and also their trophic ecology and how that might be impacted by the changes that we're seeing in the system today. So my first chapter focuses on these species habitat relationships in the system along gradient of river influence. And the main question here was, do large fish communities vary spatially in the system? And if so, what abiotic factors may be responsible for this variation? The way that we went about trying to test this question um, was by using paired longline and gillnet sets. Um, we fished for four summers, so from May to August, and, and just about almost got 100 total sets. That would be 100 longline and 100 gillnet sets. And with this survey, we're specifically targeting sharks. So our lab mostly focuses on, on sharks, but we incidentally catch a lot of bony fish, a lot of teleosts as well. So I'll be showing you some of the uh, information I have from, from those guys. With each set, we also collect environmental data. So we're, we're collecting salinity, dissolved oxygen, temperature, um, minimum and maximum depth for each set, and the bottom type. And I'll just show you real quick. Let's see. It's taking its time, it looks like. Trying to change the slide now, but it might be. There we go. Oh, well, uh, for some reason, the the dots that show our fishing locations hasn't shown up on this figure for you guys. But essentially, we fished all the way from the, the western portions of St. Vincent Sound all the way up to about 
the end of Dog Island and, and Lanark Reef in the wet or in the, the east, and then up in East Bay as well throughout Apalachicola Bay proper and the St. George Sound region. And the other thing that I just really wanted to point out is that for the sake of my research, I've kind of delineated the system into two regions. So one being the Apalachicola Bay region that includes St. Vincent Sound, Apalachicola Bay proper and East Bay. And we're generally thinking about that as the, the higher river influence part of the system with lower salinity, lower clarity, muddier substrate for the most part. Uh, whereas the St. George Sound region is getting a bit more of that marine influence. So we see higher salinity, higher clarities, and um, more of that sandy substrate or seagrass. And really quick, I'll just run you through a summary of the, the fish that we captured over these four years of sampling. So nearly 50 total species. Um, I will note that these, these methods that we're using target larger species. So we're not getting the sort of like small gobies and bunnies and things you might be finding that are living inside of that you know, oyster reef substrate. But um, of the 49 total fish species, 17 of those were elasmobranchs, so that's sharks and rays. Uh, 5,800 total fishes, and the catch was relatively evenly split in terms of number between the gillnet and the longline. However, the gillnet, because of the selectivity differences of these two types of fishing methods, captured a lot more species, and that's generally driven by catching a lot more teleosts. So a lot more bony fishes rather than targeting those predatory, larger elasmobranchs, sharks and rays that tend to bite on that long line more frequently. So nearly 1,400 elasmobranchs, uh, about 1,300 sharks in total. Uh, but something that's that's really apparent in our data set here is that the two arid catfishes, so that Bagray marinus is the gaff top sail catfish in the center up here, and then Ariopsis felis, the um, Hardhead catfish, as well as the black tip shark, Herpernus lumbatus, and the Atlantic shark nose shark, uh, constitute 82% of the catch. And this table down at the bottom left hand corner shows you what percent catch each of these species was for these top eight species, um, which really speaks to the dominance of Bagray marinus in this system, um, you know, just all over the place, an incredible density when compared to these other fish species that we encountered. And I'll touch on the sharks and rays in particular. Uh, we captured 17 total shark and ray species throughout our time fishing in the system. But something that's really cool about this is that we actually saw um, 14 of these species in the young of year life stage. And what this means is um, an individual that's within a year of pupping or within a year of birth and catching that many species in this life stage in this system indicates that the Apalachicola Bay based system is a really important habitat for um, neonate and young juvenile sharks. Come on now. There we go. So the, the first thing that we wanted to do is figure out, are these communities, or do these communities vary spatially in the system? And I ran this Permanova, um, which basically just partitions the, the differences, partitions community data matrices along sources of variation. Those sources of variation we're interested in were regions of so the Apalachicola Bay region or the St. George Sound region, and then also a couple of temporal scales. So within our sampling season from May to August, as well as between years from 2018 to 2021. And what we saw is that there was a difference um, in large fish communities, both spatially between Apalachicola Bay and St. George Sound regions, but also temporally from May to August. And it makes sense that we see that temporal variation because we see a lot of change in things like temperature um, and thermal to tolerances of the Lazar banks tell us that they can only really handle certain habitats at certain times of year. Um, we also see an influx of pregnant females earlier in the summer, so May and early June, which tend to leave following pupping. Um, so that kind of explains what we're seeing there. So we know that these communities vary spatially, but what species and environmental variables explain these differences? And the first thing I did is look at the species here. And this is an indicator species analysis for our two different gear types, the long line on top and the gill on the bottom. Uh, the first column, or second column here is telling us the indicator region. So Apalachicola Bay region or the St. George Sound region. We have relative frequency, which tells us out of all of the sets that we conducted in that given region, what percentage of those sets 
were this was the species captured in. So we caught gaff topsail catfish on 100% of our long line sets in Apalachicola Bay. The relative abundance tells us of all of the gaff topsail catfish we caught, what percentage of those were in their respective um, indicator region. So 78% of the gaff topsail catfish we caught were in Apalachicola Bay in that region. Um, I won't go through all of these, but these will help me kind of explain uh, a um, figure that I'm going to be showing you guys in a little bit here. Then the next thing I did was look at what environmental parameters were most responsible for the differences that we were seeing. And one of the ways that I went about doing this was with generalized additive models. And generalized additive models are um, essentially a non-parametric form of a generalized linear model. It allows to, to have non-linear relationships in that predictor variable. And we structure these models with the six environmental variables that you see in the columns here and then ran these models for eight different species. And you'll see that there are missing plots here, and that just means that for that species, that given environmental variable either didn't contribute to a lower AIC score or a higher deviance explained. So we left those out of the final model. The y-axis here, we have additive effect um, that basically tells us positive or negative responses by that species to the given variable. That red dotted line is at zero, so that's a neutral effect. Anything above that constitutes a positive effect and below a negative effect. So for example, we see that goth top tail catfish respond positively to salinities under about 25. Um, or conversely, we see black tip sharks most frequently in, in salinities over 25. Um, I'd love to cover this stuff more and I have a lot more work that I did specifically with the environmental side of things. Um, but for the sake of covering everything I want to cover with you guys, I will just tell you that, there it comes, there we go. Salinity, clarity, and a combination of depth or depth difference most strongly correlated with both changes in communities and species level variation. So I actually did a lot of ordinations and community analyses with non-metric multidimensional scaling. And it told us the same story here. I'm just showing you guys the generalized additive model, which kind of parses it out by species a little more. And another thing I did, and I was just interested in being able to visualize this information. So I ran the same sort of model, these generalized additive models, but I added a predictor variable in which I used essentially the catch coordinates for each species or each individual and then use the predict function in R to model this over a shape file of the Apalachicola Bay system. So what you're seeing on the, on the right-hand side are the eight different species that I ran the, those GAMs for I showed you in the previous slide um, with heat maps, essentially, where we see the highest densities, where we predict the highest densities for these species. Um, just note here that the scales vary pretty widely, um, especially like I was talking about earlier for gaff top sail catfish. They're a lot higher than the other ones that range anywhere from about one to um, 10. But going back to these indicator species, so the ones that I just highlighted there in blue were indicators for the Apalachicola Bay region, whereas the other two here in green were indicators for the St. George Sound region. And obviously there's a little bit of um, variation here, right? So we see like Atlantic sharp nose shark, we generally understand them to be higher or associated with higher clarities and salinities. We see this hot spot of them right around West Pass, which makes sense, right? That's that's a it's within the Apalachicola Bay region that we're talking about, but it's right next to this pass that opens up to the Gulf. There's a lot of exchange of, of uh, Gulf water, and then I have my percentages here, and those are just the deviants explained from those models. There, to, that's telling us how good of a or how much of the variation in the data is described by this this spatial interaction that we're seeing. Uh, I think this is just kind of cool because you've seen a lot of these heat maps today of the different sorts of things, whether it's the um, carbon or, or sulfur in the sediment or in the, the waters or anything like that. So it's interesting to see how these all line up. And hard-head catfish is the one in here that wasn't an indicator species for either region. And I'm gonna dive really quickly into my second chapter, multi-source feeding and migratory sharks. And my main question here was how important are prey from the high river influence portion of the system to these highly migratory sharks? And the way I went about answering this question was with stable isotope analyses. So I got carbon and sulfur stable isotopes from five species of sharks, those being the fine tooth shark, bull shark, black tip shark, Atlantic sharp nose shark, and bonnet head shark. 
And then I, I went through the literature and compiled all this published isotope information on potential prey species. So we're talking about um, smaller fishes like spot or croaker, um, crabs, the different catfish. And those are all available in these, these different papers down here. So a lot of uh, FSU affiliated people um, and work that's extended from Chanton's work in 1997 to more recent stuff in, in the mid 2010 or 20 teens. And combined all this together and then I delineated it essentially by uh, into three different regions that were isotopically distinct. And that's what you're seeing here with the, the points and the error bars. So one of these regions that included East Bay and Apalachicola Bay isotope values, I called the fluvial estuarine region um, because it's that area that's receiving more of that fluvial input. And for that reason, we see more depleted carbon values. Um, this other region, the pelagic marine region, is, in, is data from offshore limestone reefs where that the dominant form of primary production is more plankton. And then this benthic marine region and that's St. George Sound and St. Mark's in seagrass habitat. So they're dominated by seagrass production and epiphytic production. And you see kind of how these sharks fall out here. Um, so taking together this source information and then the mixture information, which are those sharks, I was able to run Bayesian mixing models. Uh, and here we're basically looking at these different nutrient source, the reliance on these different nutrient sources as a function of length. I added length in there because I was interested if there were any sort of ontogenetic shifts in the reliance of these sources. So are these individuals using any sources um, at different levels throughout their life history? And the first thing that we really see here is that this fluvial estuarine nutrient source, so prey from East Bay and Apalachicola Bay, are a really important source to sharks using the Apalachicola Bay system. And we see some pretty, we see significant shifts in energy channel importance with ontogeny for all but Atlantic shark nose shark. So for bull shark, fine tooth shark, and black tip shark, um, the models in which length was included as a covariate had a, a lower AIC, were, were a stronger predictor of uh, variation in isotope values, um, which kind of comes back to the idea I talked about earlier is this being a really important habitat for neonate and young sharks. Um, and it's really pretty cool to see some of the shifts here and, and one of the more extreme ones here in the bull shark, uh, but also in, in the black tip shark. We know that they mature around these areas where we see these changes starting to happen. So it's cool to see that as they're coming to the sexual maturity, they're, they're moving to these different habitats and relying on nutrients from these different habitats. Um, you know, so we are seeing that that interaction of length in the use of these different nutrient sources. So I'm going to try and pull this all together really quick with an example with clupeids, which are essentially like a, a little bait fish that's found all over the place, but in, in Apalachicola Bay in particular, this genus Brevortia, which includes the yellowfin and um, Gulf menhaden, are really abundant, and they were an indicator species in my analyses for that um, part of the system. Now we know that juvenile fine tooth and black tip sharks specialize on prey like these in the system, and that we know, and we know that cupids filter feed for plankton. And Chanton and Lewis in 2002 explained the importance of dissolved nutrients being tr transported by the river to the bay and fueling plankton production. It's also been shown that there's a positive correlation between oil content in Brevortia and the discharge from the Mississippi River. So that indicates that an increased transport of fluvial nutrients results in healthier and more nutrient-rich fish. And it's been shown with past uh, modeling studies that we were expecting to see lower overall flows in the river, as well as decreased flow variability, which would lead to less of that inundation of the floodplain that's been talked about quite a bit today. So bringing this all together, these projected alterations to the flow regime in the Apalachicola Chattahoochee Front watershed could result in lower prey density, um, quality, or both. And these changes might be reflected in altered shark distributions and interactions due to both the changes in habitat. So we talked about how salinity and clarity in particular are really important for, um, for driving changes in communities and habitat associations for these species. Um, and when, if we see a change in that river flow regime, that would affect the salinity and clarity because they're really tied to that river flow, but also the prey abundance and distribution. So it would have a, uh, a potential for altering a lot of the sorts of interactions that we're seeing in these different fish species. I should note that um, 
these changes that we may see may or may not negatively impact all of the sharks that I've been talking about today. Um, you know, for some that enjoy that higher salinity, higher clarity habitat, we might see an increase in their numbers in the system. Um, but it's safe to say either way that we'd see really drastic impacts to both the community and trophic ecology of the larger fishes in this system uh, with the changes that are projected. With that, I'd just like to acknowledge my advisor, Dr. Dean Grubbs, and the Grubbs Lab, especially my, my lab mates, Ashley Gotti and Justin Peterson for all their help. Um, and of course, all the support from the FSU CML staff and volunteers that have helped out with this work. And with that, I'll leave you with a quote from Aldo Leopold, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. I'll ask a question. So when you talk about clarity, do you mean particulate loading or do you mean like would brown tannic water that was clear be clear in your mind? Yeah, so I, I should have I should have uh, clarified that. So we're literally just using a secchi disc to measure clarity here. Um, so if you had really tannic water like we see maybe coming out of the Carabelle River more so than the Apachcola River, um, even though it's that really stained color, we'd still be getting a lot higher clarity values than we would when we go up next to the river mouth. But but in Apalachicola Bay, the clear clear water is towards the passes. Correct. Yeah. So obviously there's some variation here, and it depends what part of the tidal cycle we're sampling in these different areas. Um, you know, you can fish out by by Sykes cut on a on a you know, a low ebb and you're going to have that lot lower clarity water and fishing the same spot four hours later it, it could be almost fully gulf water so mm -hmm. there's some variation there but but yes that's that's exactly what we're seeing so the salinity probably controls the clarity right they are they are definitely correlated but not as correlated as you'd think so some of the so parts parts of kind of what I call like the heart of the Apalachicola Bay proper area, so kind of the middle of that area that's that's kind of just south of the bridge between Apalachicola and East Point, and directly to the west of the bridge from East Point St. George Island, is a really low clarity area that actually tends to have a lot higher salinity. So the change in clarity from the river mouth to that area is a lot lower, or a lot less intense than that change in salinity. So we see actually a big difference in the sharks between those areas. Um, with that change in clarity or with that change in salinity rather than the change in clarity. So like black tip sharks, for example, the adults who catch a lot more frequently in that higher salinity. Um, but we see the neonates for black tips pushed up in those areas that have lower salinity, but like a similar clarity. Nice job. Thank you. Do we have any more questions for Blake? Hey Blake, I got one for you. It's Matt sure. Ware here. Um, have you chatted with Barry Walton about some of your spatial stuff? Um, when he because his a lot of his work was using booster regression trees, looking at spatial distributions of your two catfish species. Have you chatted with him about how your findings compare to his, at least in terms of the overlap of the catfish? Yeah, so we haven't talked a lot about the catfish. I've actually worked quite a bit with with Barry, um, but have been kind of hunkered down writing and analyzing stuff for a while now so um, <laughs> that's good I should check in with him about that I remember him talking about using the BRTs for doing that and he actually shared the shape files that I made the, these visuals with so um, yeah I'll, I'll definitely get in touch and see if there's any sort of overlap there with what we're seeing mm -hmm. yeah I forget exactly where he's at right now whether or not his his manuscript has been published yet or if it's still just under review I think um, it's in review last I heard yeah be interesting to see how your uh you know additive models compared to what he was seeing because you guys used a lot of the same variables sure yeah yeah absolutely it would be really interesting yeah i forgot to mention that just today this whole first chapter that i walked through with you guys um was accepted just today for MEPS. so should see it Woo! in print pretty soon which i'm i'm happy with congrats thank you Um, something somebody asked a question with Jeff earlier that I wanted to comment on, but I figured I'd wait until I got to my presentation. They were basically talking about the impact of nutrients in the system and how that might affect like the macro scale and the fishes that um, are using this system. 
Um, I think I tried to touch on that in my second to last slide there, but um, it seems like some of these species really heavily rely on that low salinity, low clarity area and the, the prey that are associated with those areas. Um, and we generally don't catch a lot of the higher salinity, higher clarity associated species like black nose shark or shark nose shark or tiger sharks in the majority of that of the bay. I would suspect that we would continue to see really high densities of sharks in the bay with lower um, river input, but that the communities would be changing quite a bit. And I also should mention um, a part of that first chapter, I did a lot of comparisons with catch per unit efforts or density measurements for the sharks. And the Apalachicola Bay in particular had much higher densities of sharks overall, but especially young and young of year and juvenile sharks than adjacent areas. So like any of the bays around Panama City, St. Joe Bay, St. Mark's area. So it's a really, really densely populated area for sharks. Um, so Jeff's Jeff's comment there about don't go swimming in there is, is relatively accurate. Hey, Jenna, we have uh, Chad Hansen has his hand raised. Uh, Chad, are you there? I don't think it was. I am here. I'm here. Thank you. It took a second to get off mute there. Yeah, great stuff, Blake. And I was actually the one that asked that question on the macro level. So that was a really good tie in. So appreciate that. I guess I had a more like a, a just looking at the the prevalence of the gaff top, and I can attest that as an angler over there on occasion, um, that being the number one species you often catch. I was wondering is, do you have any historical context, or maybe you, you said you're, you did some CTUE looking at other areas? Is, that, is, is it abnormally high in the bay to have that many gaff top, or is that, is that something that's always occurred with the data in other places? Just looking for context, if that's, if that's an indication of a um, you know, a higher than usual density of gaff top, or if that's like a normal, in the normal kind of range of what you would expect to see. Right. Yeah. So I, I haven't right. gotten my hands on any historical data specific to gaff tops. Um, we, my lab fishes and I coordinate all of our fishery independent monitoring in the Big Bend area. So from St. Mark's River to Tampa Bay, and we do that each summer. Um, we caught, we catch a lot lower levels of gaff tops in that area than we do in Apalachicola Bay. Um, I think that's also just, there's a lot less intense river influence throughout that area. And there's no indication based off of those areas, at least the areas where we fish, like off the, the Steen Hatcher, or Fen Holloway and those in that part of Florida that we're seeing increased numbers in gaff tops. Um, I know people have talked about, you know, what if, if there's less sharks or sharks are being fished out, does that open up a niche for more of these gaff tops? And I couldn't really comment on that. Um, it is pretty incredible, the density that we see. There was one gillnet set where we caught 276 gaff tops. And it took me, and I had only mm. undergrads on the boat with me to help, and gaff tops have venomous spines. So I didn't really feel comfortable having people who weren't able to pick them out do that. So it took me like two and a half hours to get them all out of the net. Um, I joke about that being my purgatory now. So they have a special place in my heart, definitely. But <laughs> I would be really interested to hear more about that. Um, it's really interesting that there's not a fishery for them in the right. U.S. either, but there are artisanal fisheries for them in in um, Mexico. So, right, we need a campaign yeah. for eating more catfish soup. Yeah, and I mean, I've I've actually I've eaten them because we catch so many of them. I figured I ought to give it a try, and um, they're good. I mean, if you can get past the Part that they're really slimy catfish um, you know. right yeah they taste better than hardheads for sure yeah uh, there are some old I used to work in the for FWI I did some fim sampling back in the early 2000s and I would think that there might be some comparative data using the fim data set looking at the population structure and see if that matches up to what you're seeing in your different gear sets right yeah so I, could, I could talk to, to Dave about that and um, I mean, the, yeah, the main thing there being they don't really catch adult gaff tops and, and we don't really right. catch juveniles. So there's that discrepancy, but it, it still, yeah. I think, would be interesting because I mean, I'm sure the recruitment plays a big part in, um, you know, how well their their numbers are doing. But right. it yeah, seems and I like you know. if you've been dealing with this with, you know, every time you throw a line in the water, you're going to catch a catfish three times before you catch, you know, a redfish or a trout or something else that you're targeting. Right. 
Great, thanks. Yeah. Looking forward to reading your paper, by the way. Yeah, awesome, thank you. Good stuff. Any more questions for Blake? Before we cut him loose? Thank you so much, Blake. I appreciate you yeah, closing this out today. Yeah, no, it was great. I uh, learned a lot today. It was really cool to see all these presentations in the same area, kind of from all sorts of different perspectives. So um, yeah, it was awesome. Great, great. Um, so just a few reminders. We are starting back up tomorrow at 9 a.m. Uh, recordings of both today and tomorrow's sessions will be uploaded to uh, the reserve's website, apologicalreserve.com. And the last reminder is uh, we will be sending out um, an evaluation of the, um, the symposium uh, to all of the participants and presenters. So I uh, can encourage folks to visit that and provide us in, uh, in, input and feedback on how we've done. And, and uh, so if we do this again, when we do this again, we can continue and have a good, a good day. So thanks again for participating and uh, hopefully we'll see many of you tomorrow.